Part 4. A week had elapsed since the rendezvous of our two friends on the green bench in the park, when, one fine morning at about half past ten o'clock, Varvara Ardulianovna, otherwise Mrs. Titsin, who had been out to visit a friend, returned home in a state of considerable mental depression. There are certain people of whom it is difficult to say anything which will at once throw them into relief in other words, describe them graphically in their typical characteristics. These are they who are generally known as commonplace people, and this class comprises, of course, the immense majority of mankind. Authors, as a rule, attempt to select and portray types rarely met with in their entirety, but these types are nevertheless more real than real life itself. Podkolios in a character in Gogol's comedy, The Wedding, was perhaps an exaggeration, but he was by no means a non-existent character. On the contrary, how many intelligent people, after hearing of this Podkoliosin from Gogol, immediately began to find that scores of their friends were exactly like him. They knew, perhaps, before Gogol told them, that their friends were like Podkoliosin, but they did not know what name to give them. In real life, Young fellows seldom jump out of the window just before their weddings, because such a feat, not to speak of its other aspects, must be a decidedly unpleasant mode of escape. And yet there are plenty of bridegrooms, intelligent fellows too, who would be ready to confess themselves polcoliosins in the depths of their consciousness just before marriage. Nor does every husband feel bound to repeat at every step to Los Vulu, George's Dendon. Like another typical personage, and yet how many millions and billions of George's Dendons there are in real life who feel inclined to utter this soul-drawn cry after their honeymoon, if not the day after the wedding. Therefore, without entering into any more serious examination of the question, I will content myself with remarking that in real life typical characters are watered down, so to speak, and all these Dendons and Podkoliosins actually exist among us every day. But in a diluted form, I will just add, however, that George's Dendon might have existed exactly as Moliri presented him, and probably does exist now and then, though rarely, and so I will end this scientific examination, which is beginning to look like a newspaper criticism. But for all this, the question remains, what are the novelists to do with commonplace people, and how are they to be presented to the reader in such a form as to be in the least degree interesting? They cannot be left out altogether, for commonplace people meet one at every turn of life, and to leave them out would be to destroy the whole reality and probability of the story. To fill a novel with typical characters only, or with merely strange and uncommon people, would render the book unreal and improbable, and would very likely destroy the interest. In my opinion, the duty of the novelist is to seek out points of interest and instruction even in the characters of commonplace people. For instance, when the whole essence of an ordinary person's nature lies in his perpetual and unchangeable commonplaceness, and when in spite of all his endeavors to do something out of the common, this person ends, eventually, by remaining in his unbroken line of routine. I think such an individual really does become a type of his own, a type of commonplaceness which will not for the world, if it can help it, be contented, but strains and yearns to be something original and independent, without the slightest possibility of being so. To this class of commonplace people belong several characters in this novel, characters which he and Meaty have not drawn very vividly up to now for my reader's benefit. Such were, for instance, Varvara Ardolyanovna Titsin, her husband, and her brother, Gonia. There is nothing so annoying as to be fairly rich, of a fairly good family, pleasing presence, average education, to be not stupid, kind-hearted, and yet to have no talent at all, no originality, not a single idea of one's own to be, in fact, just like everyone else. Of such people there are countless numbers in this world far more even than appear. They can be divided into two classes, as all man can fit is, those of limited intellect, and those who are much cleverer. The former of these classes is the happier. To a commonplace man of limited intellect, for instance, nothing is simpler than to imagine himself an original character, and to revel in that belief without the slightest misgiving. Many of our young women have thought fit to cut their hair short, put on blue spectacles, and call themselves nihilists. 
By doing this they have been able to persuade themselves, without further trouble, that they have acquired new convictions of their own. Some man have but felt some little qualm of kindness towards their fellow men, and the fact has been quite enough to persuade them that they stand alone in the ven of enlightenment, and that no one has such humanitarian feelings as they. Others have but to read an idea of somebody else's, and they can immediately assimilate it and believe that it was a child of their own brain. The impudence of ignorance, if I may use the expression, is developed to a wonderful extent in such cases. Unlikely as it appears, it is met with at every turn. This confidence of a stupid man in his own talents has been wonderfully depicted by Gogol in the amazing character of Pirogov. Pirogov has not the slightest doubt of his own genius, nay, of his superiority of genius, so certain is he of it that he never questions it. How many Pirogovs have there not been among our writer-scholars, propagandists? I say have been, but indeed there are plenty of them at this very day. Our friend, Gonia, belonged to the other class though the much cleverer persons, though he was from head to foot permeated and saturated with the longing to be original. This class, as I have said above, is far less happy. For the clever commonplace person, though he may possibly imagine himself a man of genius and originality, nonetheless has within his heart the deathless worm of suspicion and doubt, and this doubt sometimes brings a clever man to despair. As a rule, however, nothing tragic happens, his liver becomes a little damaged in the course of time, nothing more serious. Such men do not give up their aspirations after originality without a severe struggle. And there have been men who, though good fellows in themselves, and even benefactors to humanity, have sunk to the level of base criminals for the sake of originality. Gonia was a beginner, as it were, upon this road. A deep and unchangeable consciousness of his own lack of talent, combined with a vast longing to be able to persuade himself that he was original, had rankled in his heart, even from childhood. He seemed to have been born with overwrought nerves, and in his passionate desire to excel, he was often led to the brink of some rash step, and yet, having resolved upon such a step, when the moment arrived, he invariably proved too sensible to take it. He was ready, in the same way, to do a base action in order to obtain his wished-for object, and yet, when the moment came to do it, he found that he was too honest for any great baseness. Not that he objected to acts of petty meanish was always ready for them. He looked with hate and loathing on the poverty and downfall of his family, and treated his mother with haughty contempt, although he knew that his whole future depended on her character and reputation. Aglaia had simply frightened him, yet he did not give up all thoughts of her though he never seriously hoped that she would condescend to him. At the time of his adventure with Nastasia Filipovna he had come to the conclusion that money was his only hope money should do all for him. At the moment when he lost Aglaia, and after the scene with Nastasia, he had felt so low in his own eyes that he actually brought the money back to the prince. Of this returning of the money given to him by a madwoman who had received it from a madman, he had often repented since it though he never ceased to be proud of his action. During the short time that Mushkin remained in Petersburg, Gonia had had time to come to hate him for his sympathy, though the prince told him that it was not everyone who would have acted so nobly as to return the money. He had long pondered, too, over his relations with Aglaia, and had persuaded himself that with such a strange, childish, innocent character as hers, things might have ended very differently. Remorse then seized him, he threw up his post, and buried himself in self-torment and reproach. He lived at Titsins, and openly showed contempt for the letter, though he always listened to his advice, and was sensible enough to ask for it when he wanted it. Gavrila Ardelianovich was angry with Titsin because the letter did not care to become a Rothschild. If you are to be a Jew, he said, do it properly squeeze people right and left, show some character, be the king of the Jews while you are about it. Titsin was quiet and not easily offended, only laughed. But on one occasion he explained seriously to Gonia that he was no Jew, that he did nothing dishonest, that he could not help the market price of money, that, thanks to his accurate habits, he had already a good footing and was respected, and that his business was flourishing. I shan't ever be a Rothschild, and there is no reason why I should, he added, 
smiling, but I shall have a house in the Latinaya, perhaps two, and that will be enough for me. Who knows but what I may have three. He concluded to himself, but this dream, cherished inwardly, he never confided to a soul. Nature loves and favors such people. Titson will certainly have his reward, not three houses, but four, precisely because from childhood up he had realized that he would never be a Rothschild. That will be the limit of Titson's fortune, and, come what may, he will never have more than four houses. Varvara Ardolyanovna was not like her brother. She too had passionate desires, but they were persistent rather than impetuous. Her plans were as wise as her methods of carrying them out. No doubt she also belonged to the category of ordinary people who dream of being original, but she soon discovered that she had not a grain of true originality, and she did not let it trouble her too much. Perhaps a certain kind of pride came to her help. She made her first concession to the demands of practical life with great resolution when she consented to marry Titson. However, when she married she did not say to herself, never mind a mean action if it leads to the end in view. As her brother would certainly have said in such a case, it is quite probable that he may have said it when he expressed his elder brotherly satisfaction at her decision. Far from this, Varvara Ardolyanovna did not marry until she felt convinced that her future husband was unassuming, agreeable, almost cultured, and that nothing on earth would tempt him to a really dishonorable deed. As to small meannesses, such trifles did not trouble her. Indeed, who is free from them? It is absurd to expect the ideal. Besides, she knew that her marriage would provide a refuge for all her family. Seeing Gonia unhappy, she was anxious to help him, in spite of their former disputes and misunderstandings. Titsin, in a friendly way, would press his brother-in-law to enter the army. You know, he said sometimes, jokingly, you despise generals and generaldom, but you will see that they will all end by being generals in their turn. You will see it if you live long enough. But why should they suppose that I despise generals? Gonia thought sarcastically to himself. To serve her brother's interests, Varvara Ardolyanovna was constantly at the Apanchin's house, helped by the fact that in childhood she and Gonia had played with General Ivan Fedorovich's daughters. It would have been inconsistent with her character if in these visits she had been pursuing a chimera. Her project was not chimerical at all. She was building on a firm basis in her knowledge of the character of the Apenkin family, especially Aglaia, whom she studied closely. All Varvara's efforts were directed towards bringing Aglaia and Gonia together. Perhaps she achieved some result. Perhaps, also, she made the mistake of depending too much upon her brother and expecting more from him than he would ever be capable of giving. However this may be, her maneuvers were skillful enough. For weeks at a time she would never mention Gonia. Her attitude was modest but dignified, and she was always extremely truthful and sincere. Examining the depths of her conscience, she found nothing to reproach herself with, and this still further strengthened her in her designs. But Vovara Ardolyanovna sometimes remarked that she felt spiteful, that there was a good deal of vanity in her, perhaps even of wounded vanity. She noticed this at certain times more than at others, and especially after her visits to the Apenchins. Today, as I have said, she returned from their house with a heavy feeling of dejection. There was a sensation of bitterness, a sort of mocking contempt, mingled with it. Arrived at her own house, Varia heard a considerable commotion going on in the upper story, and distinguished the voices of her father and brother. On entering the salon she found Gonia pacing up and down at frantic speed, pale with rage and almost tearing his hair. She frowned and subsided onto the sofa with a tired air, and without taking the trouble to remove her hat. She very well knew that if she kept quiet and asked her brother nothing about his reason for tearing up and down the room, his wrath would fall upon her head. So she hastened to put the question, the old story, at uh, old story. No, heaven knows what's up now, you don't. Father has simply gone mad, mother's in floods of tears. Upon my word, Varia, I must kick him out of the house, or else go myself, he added probably remembering that he could not well turn people out of a house which was not his own. You must make allowances, murmured Varia. Make allowances? For whom? Him the old black guard? No, no, Varia that won't do. It won't do, I tell you. And look at the swagger of the man. 
has all to blame himself, and yet he puts on so much side that Yao think me word. It's too much trouble to go through the gate, you must break the fence for me. That's the sort of air he puts on, but what's the matter with you, Varya? What a curious expression you have. I'm all right, said Varya, in a tone that sounded as though she were all wrong. Gonia looked more intently at her. You've been there, he asked, suddenly. Yes. Did you find out anything? Nothing unexpected. I discovered that it's all true. My husband was wiser than either of us, just as he suspected from the beginning, so it has fallen out. Where is he? Out. Well, what has happened? Go on. The prince is formally engaged to her that settled. The elder sisters told me about it. Aglaia has agreed. They don't attempt to conceal it any longer. You know how mysterious and secret they have all been up to now. Adelaide's wedding is put off again so that both can be married on one day. Isn't that delightfully romantic? Somebody ought to write a poem on it. Sit down and write an ode instead of tearing up and down like that. This evening Princess Bilikonsky is to arrive. She comes just in time to have a party tonight. He is to be presented to old Bilikonsky. Though I believe he knows her already, probably the engagement will be openly announced. They are only afraid that he may knock something down, or trip over something when he comes into the room. It would be just like him. Gonia listened attentively, but to his sister's astonishment he was by no means so impressed by this news, which should, she thought, have been so important to him as she had expected. Well, it was clear enough all along, he said, after a moment's reflection. So that's the end, he added, with a disagreeable smile, continuing to walk up and down the room, but much slower than before, and glancing slyly into his sister's face. It's a good thing that you take it philosophically, at all events, said Varya. I'm really very glad of it. Yes, it's off our hands off yours, I should say. I think I have served you faithfully. I never even asked you what happiness you expected to find with the glare. Did I ever expect to find happiness with the glare? Come, come, don't overdo your philosophy. Of course you did. Now it's all over, and a good thing, too, pair of fools that we have been. I confess I have never been able to look at it seriously. I busied myself in it for your sake thinking that there was no knowing what might happen with a funny girl like that to deal with. There were ninety to one chances against it. To this moment, I can't make out why you wished for it. Hmm? Now, I suppose, you and your husband will never weary of agging me on to work again. Yeah, I'll begin your lectures about perseverance and strength of will and all that. I know it all by heart, said Gonia, laughing. Has got some new idea in his head, thought Varya. Are they pleased over their parents? Asked Gonia suddenly. And no, I don't think they are. You can judge for yourself. I think the general is pleased enough. Her mother is a little uneasy. She always loathed the idea of the prince as a husband. Everybody knows that. Of course, naturally. The bridegroom is an impossible and ridiculous one. I mean, has she given her formal consent? She has not said no up to now, and that's all. It was sure to be so with her. You know what she is like. You know how absurdly shy she is. You remember how she used to hide in a cupboard as a child, so as to avoid seeing visitors for hours at a time. She is just the same now, but, do you know, I think there is something serious in the matter. Even from her side, I feel it, somehow. She laughs at the prince, they say, from morn to night in order to hide her real feelings but you may be sure she finds occasion to say something or other to him on the sly, for he himself is in a state of radiant happiness. He walks in the clouds. They say he is extremely funny just now. I heard it from themselves. They seem to be laughing at me in their sleevestos elder girls he don't know why. Gonia had begun to frown, and probably Varia added this last sentence in order to probe his thought. However, at this moment, the noise began again upstairs. I'll turn him out, shouted Gonia, glad of the opportunity of venting his vexation. I shall just turn him out where he can't have this. Yes, and then he'll go about the place and disgrace us as he did yesterday. How as he did yesterday? What do you mean? What did he do yesterday? Asked Gonia in alarm. Why, goodness me, don't you know? Varia stopped short. What? You don't mean to say that he went there yesterday? cried Gonia, flushing red with shame and anger. 
Good heavens, Varia, speak, you have just been there, was he there or not, quick, and Gonia rushed for the door. Varia followed and caught him by both hands. What are you doing? Where are you going to? You can't let him go now. If you do, he'll go and do something worse. What did he do there? What did he say? They couldn't tell me themselves. They couldn't make head or tail of it. But he frightened them all. He came to see the general, who was not at home. So he asked for Lazarbetha Prokofievna. First of all, he bagged her for some place or situation for work of some kind. And then he began to complain about us, about me and my husband, and you, especially you, he said a lot of things. Oh, couldn't you find out? muttered Gonia, trembling hysterically. None a thing more than that. Why, they couldn't understand him themselves, and very likely didn't tell me all. Gonia seized his head with both hands and tottered to the window. Varia sat down at the other window. Funny girl, Aglaia, she observed. After a pause, when she left me she said, Give my special and personal respects to your parents. I shall certainly find an opportunity to see your father one day, and so serious over it. Shas a strange creature. Wasn't she joking? She was speaking sarcastically. Not a bit of it. That's just the strange part of it. Does she know about father? Do you think or not? That they do not know about it in the house is quite certain. The rest of them. I mean, but you have given me an idea. Aglaia perhaps knows. She alone, though, if anyone, for the sisters were as astonished as I was to hear her speak so seriously. If she knows, the prince must have told her. Oh, it's not a great matter to guess who told her. A thief. A thief in our family, and the head of the family, too. Oh, nonsense, cried Varia, angrily. That was nothing but a drunkard's tale. Nonsense. Why, who invented the whole thing, Gulbadif and the princey a pretty pair? Both were probably drunk. Father is a drunkard and a thief. I am a beggar, and the husband of my sister is a usurer, continued Gonia, bitterly. There was a pretty list of advantages with which to enchant the heart of Aglaia. That same husband of your sister, the usurer feeds me. Go on, don't stand on ceremony, pray. Don't lose your temper. You are just like a schoolboy. You think that all this sort of thing would harm you in Aglaia's eyes, do you? You little know her character. She is capable of refusing the most brilliant party and running away and starving in a garret with some wretched student. That's the sort of girl she is. You never could or did understand how interesting you would have seen in her eyes if you had come firmly and proudly through our misfortunes. The prince has simply caught her with hook and line, firstly, because he never thought of fishing for her, and secondly, because he is an idiot in the eyes of most people. It's quite enough for her that by accepting him she puts her family out and annoys them all round that's what she likes. You don't understand these things. We shall see whether I understand or no, said Gonia enigmatically. But I shouldn't like her to know all about father. All the same, I thought the prince would manage to hold his tongue about this, at least. He prevented Labadif spreading the noosh wouldn't even tell me all when I asked him then you must see that he is not responsible. What does it matter to you now, in any case? What are you hoping for still? If you have a hope left, it is that your suffering air may soften her heart towards you. Oh, she would funk a scandal like anyone else. You are all tarred with one brush. What? Aglaia would have funked. You are a chicken-hearted fellow, Gonia, said Varia, looking at her brother with contempt. Not one of us is worth much. Aglaia may be a wild sort of a girl, but she is far nobler than any of us, a thousand times nobler. Welcome. There's nothing to get cross about, said Gonia. All am afraid of his mother. I'm afraid this scandal about father may come to her ears. Perhaps it has already. I am dreadfully afraid. It undoubtedly has already, observed Gonia. Varia had risen from her place and had started to go upstairs to her mother. But at this observation of Gania's she turned and gazed at him attentively. Who could have told her? Hippolyte, probably. He would think it the most delightful amusement in the world to tell her of it the instant he moved over here. I haven't a doubt of it. But how could he know anything of it? Tell me that. Labadif and the prince determined to tell no one even Collier knows nothing. What? Hippolyte. He found it out himself, of course. Why? You have no idea what a cunning little animal he is. Dirty little gossip. 
He has the most extraordinary nose for smelling out other people's secrets or anything approaching to scandal. Believe it or not, but I'm pretty sure he's got round a glare. If he hasn't, he soon will. Rogojin is intimate with him, too. How the prince doesn't notice it, I can't understand. The little wretch considers me his enemy now and does his best to catch me tripping. What on earth does it matter to him when he's dying? However, you'll see, I shall catch him tripping yet, and not he me. Why did you get him over here, if you hate him so? And is it really worth your while to try to score off him? Why, it was yourself who advised me to bring him over. I thought he might be useful. You know he is in love with Aglaia himself, now, and has written to her. He has even written to Lizabetha Prokofievna. Oh, has not dangerous there, cried Gonia, laughing angrily. However, I believe there is something of that sort in the air. He is very likely to be in love, for he is a mere boy. But he won't write anonymous letters to the old lady. That would be too audacious a thing for him to attempt. But I dare swear the very first thing he did was to show me up to Aglaia as a base deceiver and intriguer. I confess I was fool enough to attempt something through him at first. I thought he would throw himself into my service out of revengeful feelings towards the prince, the sly little beast. But I know him better now. As for the theft, he may have heard of it from the widow in Petersburg. For if the old man committed himself to such an act, he can have done it for no other object but to give the money to her. Hippolyte said to me, without any prelude, that the general had promised the widow four hundred rubles. Of course, I understood, and the little wretch looked at me with a nasty sort of satisfaction. I know him, you may depend upon it he went and told mother to, for the pleasure of wounding her. And why doesn't he die, I should like to know. He undertook to die within three weeks, and here he is getting fatter. His cough is better, too. It was only yesterday that he said that was the second day he hadn't coughed blood. Well, turn him out. I don't hate, I despise him, said Gonia, grandly. Well, I do hate him, if you like, he added, with a sudden access of rage, and I'll tell him so to his face, even when has dying. If you had but read his confession, good lord, what refinement of impudence. Oh, but it have liked to whip him then and there, like a schoolboy just to see how surprised he would have been. Now he hates everybody because he, oh, I say, what on earth are they doing there? Listen to that noise. I really can't stand this any longer. Titson, he cried, as the latter entered the room. What in the name of goodness are we coming to? Listen to that, but the noise came rapidly nearer. The door burst open, and old General Ivolgin, raging, furious, purple-faced, and trembling with anger, rushed in. He was followed by Nina Alexandrovna, Kolya, and behind the rest, Hippolyte. Hippolyte had now been five days at the Titsins. His flitting from the princes to these new quarters had been brought about quite naturally and without many words. He did not quarrel with the prince, in fact, they seemed to part as friends. Gonia, who had been hostile enough on that eventful evening, had himself come to see him a couple of days later probably in obedience to some sudden impulse. For some reason or other, Rogojinto had begun to visit the sick boy. The prince thought it might be better for him to move away from his, the prince's, house. Hippolyte informed him, as he took his leave, that Titsin had been kind enough to offer him a corner, and did not say a word about Gonia, though Gonia had procured his invitation, and himself came to fetch him away. Gonia noticed this at the time, and put it to Hippolyte's debit on account. Gonia was right when he told his sister that Hippolyte was getting better, that he was better was clear at the first glance. He entered the room now last of all, deliberately, and with a disagreeable smile on his lips. Nina Alexandrovna came in, looking frightened. She had changed much since we last saw her, half a year ago, and had grown thin and pale. Kolia looked worried and perplexed. He could not understand the vagaries of the general, and knew nothing of the last achievement of that worthy, which had caused so much commotion in the house. But he could see that his father had of late changed very much, and that he had begun to behave in so extraordinary a fashion both at home and abroad that he was not like the same man. What perplexed and disturbed him as much as anything was that his father had entirely given up drinking during the last few days. 
Colia knew that he had quarreled with both Labadif and the prince and had just bought a small bottle of vodka and brought it home for his father. Really, mother, he had assured Nina Alexandrovna upstairs, really you had better let him drink. He has not had a drop for three days. He must be suffering agonies. The general now entered the room, threw the door wide open, and stood on the threshold trembling with indignation. Look here, my dear sir, he began, addressing Titsin in a very loud tone of voice. If you have really made up your mind to sacrifice an old man your father to or at all events father of your wife an old man who has served his emperor to a wretched little atheist like this, all I can say is, sir, my foot shall cease to tread your floors. Make your choice, sir. Make your choice quickly, if you please. Me or this screw? Yes, screw, sir. I said it accidentally, but let the word stand this screw, for he screws and drills himself into my soul. Hadn't you better say corkscrew? Said Hippolyte. No, sir, not corkscrew. I am a general, not a bottle, sir. Make your choice, sir, or him. Here Collier handed him a chair, and he subsided into it, breathless with rage. Hadn't you better better to take a nap? Murmured the stupefied Titson. A nap, shrieked the general. I am not drunk, sir. You insult me. I see, he continued, rising. I see that all are against me here. Enough he go, but no, sirsk now that he was not allowed to finish his sentence. Somebody pushed him back into his chair and begged him to be calm. Nina Alexandrovna trembled and cried quietly. Gonia retired to the window in disgust. But what have I done? What is his grievance? Asked Hippolyte, grinning. What have you done, indeed? Put in Nina Alexandrovna. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, teasing an old man like that and in your position, too. And pray what is my position, madam? I have the greatest respect for you, personally, but has a little screw, cried the general. He drills holes in my heart and soul. He wishes me to be a pervert to a thysome. No, you young greenhorn, that I was covered with honors before ever you were born, and you are nothing better than a wretched little worm, torn into with coughing, and dying slowly of your own malice and unbelief. What did Gavrila bring you over here for? They're all against me, even to my own sonal against me. Oh, come and sense, cried Gonia. If you did not go shaming us all over the town, things might be better for all parties. What shame you? I, what do you mean, you young calf? I shame you. I can only do you honor, sir. I cannot shame you. He jumped up from his chair in a fit of uncontrollable rage. Gonia was very angry too. Honor, indeed, said the latter with contempt. What do you say, sir? Growled the general, taking a step towards him. I say that I have but to open my mouth. And Eugonia began, but did not finish. The Torfather and Son stood before one another, both unspeakably agitated, especially Gonia. Gonia, Gonia, reflect, cried his mother, hurriedly. It's all nonsense on both sides, snapped out Varya. Let them alone, mother. It's only for mother's sake that I spare him, said Gonia, tragically. Speak, said the general beside himself with rage and excitement, speak into the penalty of a father's curse. Oh, father's curse be handed you, don't frighten me that way, said Gonia. Whose fault is it that you have been as mad as a March hare all this week? It is just a week, you see. I count the days. Take care now. Don't provoke me too much, or I'll tell all. Why did you go to the Appenchins yesterday tell me that? And you call yourself an old man, too, with gray hair and father of a family, a nice sort of a father. Be quiet, Gonia, cried Kolya. Shut up, you fool. Yes, but how have I offended him? Repeated Hippolyte, still in the same jeering voice. Why does he call me a screw? You all heard it. He came to me himself and began telling me about some Captain Oropagov. I don't wish for your company, General. I always avoided you, you know that. What have I to do with Captain Oropagov? All I did was to express my opinion that probably Captain Oropagov never existed at all. Of course he never existed, Gonia interrupted, but the general only stood stupefied and gazed around in a dazed way. Gania's speech had impressed him with its terrible candor. For the first moment or two he could find no words to answer him, and it was only when Hippolyte burst out laughing and said, 
There, you see, even your own son supports my statement that there never was such a person as Captain Oropagov, that the old fellow muttered confusedly, Captain Oropagov, not Captain Oropagov, Captain Major Retaredorogov Kapovkad, Captain didn't exist either, persisted Gonia, maliciously, what, didn't exist, cried the poor general, and a deep blush suffused his face, that'll do, Gonia, cried Varya and Titsin, shut up, Gonia, said Kolya, but this intercession seemed to rekindle the general, what did you mean, sir, that he didn't exist, explain yourself, he repeated, angrily, because he didn't exist never could and never did there, Yao'd better drop the subject, I warn you, and this is my son me own sonwam I owe, gracious heaven, Oropagov Roshka Oropagov didn't exist, ha, ha, it's a Roshka now, laughed Hippolyte, no, sir, Kapitishkina to Roshka, I mean, Captain Alexeyevich had major married Maria Petrovna Lulu was my friend and companion Lutugo from our earliest beginnings, I closed his eyes for him he was killed, Captain Oropagov never existed, Foo, the general shouted in his fury, but it was to be concluded that his wrath was not kindled by the expressed doubt as to Capitan's existence. This was his scapegoat, but his excitement was caused by something quite different. As a rule he would have merely shouted down the doubt as to Capitan, told a long yarn about his friend, and eventually retired upstairs to his room. But today, in the strange uncertainty of human nature, it seemed to require but so small an offense as this to make his cup to overflow. The old man grew purple in the face. He raised his hands. Enough of this, he yelled. My curse way out of the house I go. Collier, bring my bag away. He left the room hastily and in a paroxysm of rage. His wife, Collier, and Titsin ran out after him. What have you done now? said Varya to Gonia. He'll probably be making off there again. What a disgrace it all is. Well, he shouldn't steal, cried Gonia, panting with fury. And just at this moment his I'm at Hippolytes. As for you, sir, he cried, you should at least remember that you are in a strange house and receiving hospitality. You should not take the opportunity of tormenting an old man, sir, who is too evidently out of his mind. Hippolyte looked furious, but he restrained himself. I don't quite agree with you that your father is out of his mind, he observed, quietly. On the contrary, I cannot help thinking he has been less demented of late. Don't you think so? He has grown so cunning and careful, and weighs his words so deliberately. He spoke to me about that Capitan fellow with an object. You know, just fancy he wanted me to owe. Devil take what he wanted you to do. Don't try to be too cunning with me, young man, shouted Gonia. If you are aware of the real reason for my father's present condition, and you have kept such an excellent spying watch during these last few days that you are sure to be aware of it, you had no right whatever to torment the unfortunate man, and to worry my mother by your exaggerations of the affair, because the whole business is nonsense simply a drunken freak, and nothing more, quite unproved by any evidence, and I don't believe that much of it. He snapped his fingers, but you must need spy and watch over us all, because you are a screw, laughed Tiplite, because you are a humbug, sir, and thought fit to worry people for half an hour and tried to frighten them into believing that you would shoot yourself with your little empty pistol, pirouetting about and playing at suicide. I gave you hospitality, you have fattened on it, your cough has left you, and you repay all this excuse matwo words. I am Vavara Ardelianovna's guest, not yours, you have extended no hospitality to me. On the contrary, if I am not mistaken, I believe you are yourself indebted to Mr. Titsin's hospitality. For days ago I begged my mother to come down here and find lodgings, because I certainly do feel better here, though I am not fat, nor have I ceased to cough. I am today informed that my room is ready for me, therefore, having thanked your sister and mother for their kindness to me, I intend to leave the house this evening. I beg your pardon he interrupted you he think you were about to add something. Oh if that is the state of affairs began Gonia. Excuse me, we'll take a seat, interrupted Hippolyte once more, sitting down deliberately, for I am not strong yet. Now then, I am ready to hear you, especially as this is the last chance we shall have of a talk, and very likely the last meeting we shall ever have at all. 
Gonia felt a little guilty. I assure you I did not mean to reckon up debits and credits, he began, and if you I don't understand your condescension, said Hippolyte. As for me, I promised myself, on the first day of my arrival in this house, that I would have the satisfaction of settling accounts with you in a very thorough manner before I said goodbye to you. I intend to perform this operation now, if you like, after you, though, of course. May I ask you to be so good as to leave this room? Yao'd better speak out. Yao'll be sorry afterwards if you don't. Hippolyte, stop, please. It's so dreadfully undignified, said Varia. Well, only for the sake of a lady, said Hippolyte, laughing. I am ready to put off the reckoning, but only put it off, Varvara Ardolyanovna, because an explanation between your brother and myself has become an absolute necessity, and I could not think of leaving the house without clearing up all misunderstandings first. In a word, you are a wretched little scandalmonger, cried Gonia, and you cannot go away without a scandal. You see, said Hippolyte, coolly, you can't restrain yourself. Yao'll be dreadfully sorry afterwards if you don't speak out now. Come, you shall have the first say. Ill wait. Gonia was silent and merely looked contemptuously at him. You won't. Very well. I shall be as short as possible, for my part. Two or three times today I have had the word hospitality pushed down my throat. This is not fair. In inviting me here you yourself entrapped me for your own use. You thought I wished to revenge myself upon the prince. You heard that Aglaya Ivanovna had been kind to me and read my confession. Making sure that I should give myself up to your interests, you hoped that you might get some assistance out of me. I will not go into details. I don't ask either admission or confirmation of this from yourself. I'm quite content to leave you to your conscience and to feel that we understand one another capitally. What a history you are weaving out of the most ordinary circumstances, cried Varia. I told you the fellow was nothing but a scandalmonger, said Gonia. Excuse me, Varya Ardolyanovna, I will proceed. I can, of course, neither love nor respect the prince, though he is a good-hearted fellow, if a little queer. But there is no need whatever for me to hate him. I quite understood your brother when he first offered me aid against the prince, though I did not show it. I knew well that your brother was making a ridiculous mistake in me. I am ready to spare him, however, even now but solely out of respect for yourself, Varvara Ardolyanovna. Having now shown you that I am not quite such a fool as I look, and that I have to be fished for with a rod and line for a good long while before I am caught, I will proceed to explain why I specially wished to make your brother look a fool. That my motive power is hate, I do not attempt to conceal. I have felt that before dying, and I am dying, however much fatter I may appear to you. I must absolutely make a fool of, at least, one of that class of man which has dogged me all my life, which I hate so cordially, and which is so prominently represented by your much esteemed brother. I should not enjoy paradise nearly so much without having done this first. I hate you, Gavrila Ardelianovich, solely, this may seem curious to you, but I repeat, solely because you are the type, and incarnation, and head, and crown of the most impudent the most self-satisfied, the most vulgar and detestable form of commonplaceness. You are ordinary of the ordinary. You have no chance of ever fathering the pattiest idea of your own. And yet you are as jealous and conceited as you can possibly be. You consider yourself a great genius. Of this you are persuaded, although there are dark moments of doubt and rage, when even this fact seems uncertain. There are spots of darkness on your horizon, though they will disappear when you become completely stupid. But a long and checkered path lies before you, and of this I am glad. In the first place you will never gain a certain person. Come, come, this is intolerable. You had better stop, you little mischief-making wretch, cried Varia. Gonia had grown very pale, he trembled, but said nothing. Hippolyte paused and looked at him intently and with great gratification. He then turned his gaze upon Varia, bowed, and went out, without adding another word. Gonia might justly complain of the hardness with which fate treated him. Varia dared not speak to him for a long while, as he strode past her, backwards and forwards. At last he went and stood at the window, looking out, with his back turned towards her. There was a fearful row going on upstairs again. Are you off? 
said Gonia, suddenly, remarking that she had risen and was about to leave the room. Wait a moment, look at this. He approached the table and laid a small sheet of paper before her. It looked like a little note. Good heavens, cried Varya, raising her hands. This was the note. Gavrila Ardolianovich, persuaded of your kindness of heart, I have determined to ask your advice on a matter of great importance to myself. I should like to meet you tomorrow morning at seven o'clock by the green bench in the park. It is not far from our house. Varvara Ardolianovna, who must accompany you, knows the place well. Ah, uh, he. What on earth is one to make of a girl like that? Said Varya. Gone here. Little as he felt inclined for Swagger at this moment, could not avoid showing his triumph, especially just after such humiliating remarks as those of Hippolyte. A smile of self-satisfaction beamed on his face, and Varya too was brimming over with delight. And this is the very day that they were to announce the engagement. What will she do next? What do you suppose she wants to talk about tomorrow? Asked Gonya. Oh, that's all the same. The chief thing is that she wants to see you after six months' absence. Look here, Gonia, this is a serious business. Don't swag her again and lose the gameplay carefully, but don't funk. Do you understand? As if she could possibly avoid seeing what I have been working for all this last six months. And just imagine, I was there this morning and not a word of this. I was there, you know, on the sly. The old lady did not know or she would have kicked me out. I ran some risk for you, you see. I did so want to find out, at all hazards. Here there was a frantic noise upstairs once more. Several people seemed to be rushing downstairs at once. Now, Gonia, cried Varia, frightened, we can't let him go out. We can't afford to have a breath of scandal about the town at this moment. Run after him and bag his pardon quick. But the father of the family was out in the road already. Kolya was carrying his bag for him. Nina Alexandrovna stood and cried on the doorstep. She wanted to run after the general, but Titsin capped her back. You will only excite him more, he said. He has nowhere else to go to. He'll be back here in half an hour. I've talked it all over with Kolya. Let him play the fool a bit. It will do him good. What are you up to? Where are you off to? You've nowhere to go to, you know? Cried Gonia out of the window. Come back, father, the neighbors will hear, cried Varya. The general stopped, turned round, raised his hands and remarked, My curse be upon this house. Which observation should always be made in as theatrical a tone as possible, muttered Gonia, shutting the window with a bang. The neighbors undoubtedly did hear. Varya rushed out of the room. No sooner had his sister left him alone than Gonia took the note out of his pocket, kissed it, and peered at it around. As a general rule, old General Ivolgin's paroxysms ended in smoke. He had before this experienced fits of sudden fury, but not very often, because he was really a man of peaceful and kindly disposition. He had tried hundreds of times to overcome the dissolute habits which he had contracted of late years. He would suddenly remember that he was a father, would be reconciled with his wife, and shed genuine tears. His feeling for Nina Alexandrovna amounted almost to adoration. She had pardoned so much in silence, and loved him still in spite of the state of degradation into which he had fallen. But the general struggles with his own weakness never lasted very long. He was, in his way, an impetuous man, and a quiet life of repentance in the bosom of his family soon became insupportable to him. In the end he rebelled, and flew into rages which he regretted, perhaps even as he gave way to them, but which were beyond his control. He picked quarrels with everyone, began to hold forth eloquently, exacted unlimited respect, and at last disappeared from the house, and sometimes did not return for a long time. He had given up interfering in the affairs of his family for two years now, and knew nothing about them but what he gathered from hearsay. But on this occasion there was something more serious than usual. Everyone seemed to know something, but to be afraid to talk about it. The general had turned up in the bosom of his family two or three days before, but not, as usual, with the olive branch of peace in his hand, not in the garb of penitence in which he was usually clad on such occasions, but, on the contrary, in an uncommonly bad temper. He had arrived in a quarrelsome mood, 
pitching into everyone he came across and talking about all sorts and kinds of subjects in the most unexpected manner, so that it was impossible to discover what it was that was really putting him out. At moments he would be apparently quite bright and happy, but as a rule he would sit moody and thoughtful. He would abruptly commence to hold forth about the Appenchins, about Labadif, or the prince, and equally abruptly would stop short and refuse to speak another word answering all further questions with a stupid smile, unconscious that he was smiling, or that he had been asked a question. The whole of the previous night he had spent tossing about and groaning, and poor Nina Alexandrovna had been busy making cold compresses and warm fomentations and so on, without being very clear how to apply them. He had fallen asleep after a while, but not for long, and had awaked in a state of violent hypochondria which had ended in his quarrel with Hippolyte and the solemn cursing of Titson's establishment generally. It was also observed during those two or three days that he was in a state of morbid self-esteem and was specially touchy on all points of honor. Collier insisted, in discussing the matter with his mother, that all this was but the outcome of abstinence from drink, or perhaps of pining after Labadoff with whom up to this time the general had been upon terms of the greatest friendship, but with whom, for some reason or other, he had quarreled a few days since, parting from him in great wrath. There had also been a scene with the prince. Collier had asked an explanation of the latter, but had been forced to conclude that he was not told the whole truth. If Hippolyte and Nina Alexandrovna had, as Gonia suspected, had some special conversation about the general's actions, it was strange that the malicious youth, whom Gonia had called a scandalmonger to his face, had not allowed himself a similar satisfaction with Collier. The fact is that probably Hippolyte was not quite so black as Gonia painted him, and it was hardly likely that he had informed Nina Alexandrovna of certain events, of which we know for the mere pleasure of giving her pain. We must never forget that human motives are generally far more complicated than we are apt to suppose and that we can very rarely accurately describe the motives of another. It is much better for the writer, as a rule, to content himself with the bare statement of events, and we shall take this line with regard to the catastrophe recorded above, and shall state the remaining events connected with the general's trouble shortly, because we feel that we have already given to this secondary character in our story more attention than we originally intended. The course of events had marched in the following order, when Labadiff returned, in company with the general, after their expedition to town a few days since, for the purpose of investigation, he brought the prince no information whatever. If the letter had not himself been occupied with other thoughts and impressions at the time, he must have observed that Labadiff not only was very uncommunicative, but even appeared anxious to avoid him. When the prince did give the matter a little attention, he recalled the fact that during these days he had always found Labadiff to be in radiantly good spirits when they happened to meet, and further, that the general and Labadiff were always together. The two friends did not seem ever to be parted for a moment. Occasionally the prince heard loud talking and laughing upstairs, and once he detected the sound of a jolly soldier's song going on above, and recognized the unmistakable bass of the general's voice. But the sudden outbreak of song did not last, and for an hour afterwards the animated sound of apparently drunken conversation continued to be heard from above. At length there was the clearest evidence of a grand mutual embracing, and someone burst into tears. Shortly after this, however, there was a violent but short-lived quarrel, with loud talking on both sides. All these days Collier had been in a state of great mental preoccupation. Mushkin was usually out all day and only came home late at night. On his return he was invariably informed that Collier had been looking for him. However, when they did meet, Collier never had anything particular to tell him, accepting that he was highly dissatisfied with the general and his present condition of mind and behavior. They drag each other about the place, he said, and get drunk together at the pub close by here, and quarrel in the street on the way home, and embrace one another after it and don't seem to part for a moment. When the prince pointed out that there was nothing new about that, for that they had always behaved in this manner together, Collier did not know what to say. In fact, he could not explain what it was that specially worried him, just now, about his father. On the morning following the Bacchanalian songs and quarrels recorded above, 
As the prince stepped out of the house at about eleven o'clock, the general suddenly appeared before him, much agitated. I have long sought the honor and opportunity of meeting you, my esteemed Lef Nikolaevich, he murmured, pressing the prince's hand very hard, almost painfully so, long very long. The prince begged him to step in and sit down. No, he will not sit down. I'm keeping you, I see, another time. I think I may be permitted to congratulate you upon the realization of your heart's best wishes. Is it not so? What best wishes? The prince blushed. He thought, as so many in his position do, that nobody had seen, heard, noticed, or understood anything. Oh, be easy, sir, be easy. I shall not wound your tenderest feelings. I've been through it all myself, and I know well how unpleasant it is when an outsider sticks his nose in where he is not wanted. I experience this every morning. I came to speak to you about another matter, though, an important matter. A very important matter, Prince. The letter requested him to take a seat once more and sat down himself. Well, just for one second, then. The fact is, I came for advice. Of course, I live now without any very practical objects in life. But, being full of self-respect, in which quality the ordinary Russian is so deficient as a rule, and of activity, I am desirous, in a word, Prince, of placing myself and my wife and children in a position of in fact, I want advice. The Prince commanded his aspirations with warmth, quite to keep so, but this is all mere nonsense. I came here to speak of something quite different, something very important, Prince, and I have determined to come to you as to a man in whose sincerity and nobility of feeling I can trust like Lakia you surprised at my words. Prince. The prince was watching his guest, if not with much surprise, at all events with great attention and curiosity. The old man was very pale, every now and then his lips trembled, and his hands seemed unable to rest quietly, but continually moved from place to place. He had twice already jumped up from his chair and sat down again without being in the least aware of it. He would take up a book from the table and open it talking all the while, look at the heading of a chapter shut it and put it back again, seizing another immediately, but holding it unopened in his hand, and waving it in the air as he spoke. But enough, he cried, suddenly, I see I have been boring you with my not in the least not in the least, I assure you, on the contrary, I am listening most attentively, and am anxious to guess Prince, I wish to place myself in a respectable position he wish to esteem myself and to my dear sir. A man of such noble aspirations is worthy of all esteem by virtue of those aspirations alone. The prince brought out his copybook sentence in the firm belief that it would produce a good effect. He felt instinctively that some such well-sounding humbug, brought out at the proper moment, would soothe the old man's feelings, and would be specially acceptable to such a man in such a position. At all hazards, his guest must be dispatched with heart relieved and spirit comforted. That was the problem before the prince at this moment. The phrase flattered the general, touched him, and pleased him mightily. He immediately changed his tone, and started off on a long and solemn explanation. But listen as he would, the prince could make neither head nor tail of it. The general spoke hotly and quickly for ten minutes. He spoke as though his words could not keep pace with his crowding thoughts. Tears stood in his eyes, and yet his speech was nothing but a collection of disconnected sentences, without beginning and without end a string of unexpected words and unexpected sentiments colliding with one another and jumping over one another as they burst from his lips. Enough. He concluded at last. You understand me, and that is the great thing. A heart like yours cannot help understanding the sufferings of another. Prince, you are the ideal of generosity. What are other men beside yourself? But you are young except my blasting. My principal object is to beg you to fix an hour for a most important conversation that is my great hope, Prince. My heart needs but a little friendship and sympathy, and yet I cannot always find means to satisfy it. But why not now? I am ready to listen, and no, no Prince, not now. Now is a dream, and it is too, too important. It is to be the hour of fate to Memi own hour. Our interview is not to be broken in upon by every chance comer, every impertinent guest and there are plenty of such stupid, impertinent fellows. He bent over and whispered mysteriously, with a funny, 
frightened look on his face, who are unworthy to tie your shoe, Prince. I don't say mine, mind you will understand me, Prince. Only you understand me, Prince and no one else. He doesn't understand me. He is absolutely, absolutely unable to sympathize. The first qualification for understanding another is heart. The prince was rather alarmed at all this and was obliged to end by appointing the same hour of the following day for the interview desired. The general left him much comforted and far less agitated than when he had arrived. At seven in the evening, the prince sent to request Labadif to pay him a visit. Labadif came at once and esteemed it an honor, as he observed. The instant he entered the room, he acted as though there had never been the slightest suspicion of the fact that he had systematically avoided the prince for the last three days. He sat down on the edge of his chair, smiling and making faces, and rubbing his hands, and looking as though he were in delighted expectation of hearing some important communication which had been long guessed by all. The prince was instantly covered with confusion, for it appeared to be plain that everyone expected something of him that everyone looked at him as though anxious to congratulate him, and greeted him with hints, and smiles, and knowing looks. Keller, for instance, had run into the house three times of late, just for a moment, and each time with the air of desiring to offer his congratulations. Collier, too, in spite of his melancholy, had once or twice begun sentences in much the same strain of suggestion or insinuation. The prince, however, immediately began, with some show of annoyance, to question Labadif categorically as to the general's present condition and his opinion thereon. He described the morning's interview in a few words. Everyone has his worries, prince, especially in these strange and troublous times of ours. Labadif replied, dryly, and with the air of a man disappointed of his reasonable expectations. Dear me, what a philosopher you are, laughed the prince. Philosophy is necessary, servery necessary in our day. It is too much neglected. As for me, much esteemed prince, I am sensible of having experienced the honor of your confidence in a certain matter up to a certain point, but never beyond that point. I do not for a moment complain, Labadif. You seem to be angry for some reason said the prince, not the least bit in the world, esteemed and revered prince, not the least bit in the world, cried Labadif solemnly, with his hand upon his heart. On the contrary, I am too painfully aware that neither by my position in the world, nor by my gifts of intellect and heart, nor by my riches, nor by any former conduct of mine, have I in any way deserved your confidence which is far above my highest aspirations and hopes. Oh no, prince, I may serve you, but only as your humble slave. I am not angry. Oh no, not angry, pain perhaps, but nothing more. My dear Labadif, I owe nothing more, nothing more. I was saying to myself, but now, I am quite unworthy of friendly relations with him, say I, but perhaps as landlord of this house I may, at some future date, in his good time, Receive information as to certain imminent and much to be desired changes so saying Labadif fixed the prince with his sharp little eyes, still in hope that he would get his curiosity satisfied. The prince looked back at him in amazement. I don't understand what you are driving at. He cried, almost angrily, and, and what an intriguer you are, Labadif. He added, bursting into a fit of genuine laughter. Labadev followed suit at once, and it was clear from his radiant face that he considered his prospects of satisfaction immensely improved. And do you know, the prince continued, I am amazed at your naive ways, Labadev. Don't be angry with Manet, only yours, everybody else's also. You are waiting to hear something from me at this very moment with such simplicity that I declare I feel quite ashamed of myself for having nothing whatever to tell you. I swear to you solemnly that there is nothing to tell. There, can you take that in? The prince laughed again. Labadif assumed an air of dignity. It was true enough that he was sometimes naive to a degree in his curiosity, but he was also an excessively cunning gentleman, and the prince was almost converting him into an enemy by his repeated rebuffs. The prince did not snub Labadif's curiosity, however, because he felt any contempt for him but simply because the subject was too delicate to talk about. Only a few days before he had looked upon his own dreams almost as crimes, but Labadif considered the refusal as caused by personal dislike to himself, 
and was hurt accordingly. Indeed, there was at this moment a piece of news most interesting to the prince, which Labadif knew and even had wished to tell him, but which he now capped obstinately to himself. And what can I do for you, esteemed prince? Since I am told you sent for me just now, he said, after a few moments' silence. Oh, it was about the general, began the prince, waking abruptly from the fit of musing which he too had indulged in and and about the theft you told me of. That is about what theft. Oh, come, just as if you didn't understand, Lukian Timofeyevich. What are you up to? I can't make you out. The money, the money, sir. The four hundred roubles that you lost that day. You came and told me about it one morning, and then went off to Petersburg. There, now do you understand? Oh, you mean the four hundred roubles, said Labadif, dragging the words out, just as though it had only just dawned upon him what the prince was talking about. Thanks very much, prince, for your kind interest you do me to much honor. I found the money, long ago. You found it. Thank God for that. Your exclamation proves the generous sympathy of your nature, prince, for four hundred roubles to a struggling family man like myself is no small matter. I didn't mean that, at least, of course, I'm glad for your sake, too, added the prince, correcting himself. But oh, did you find it? Very simply indeed. I found it under the chair upon which my coat had hung, so that it is clear the purse simply fell out of the pocket and onto the floor. Under the chair. Impossible. Why, you told me yourself that you had searched every corner of the room. How could you not have looked in the most likely place of all? Of course I looked there, of course I did. Very much so. I looked and scrambled about, and felt for it, and wouldn't believe it was not there, and looked again and again. It is always so in such cases. One longs and expects to find a lost article. One sees it is not there, and the place is as bare as one's palm and yet one returns and looks again and again, fifteen or twenty times, likely enough. Oh, quite so, of course. But how was it in your case? I don't quite understand, said the bewildered prince. You say it wasn't there at first, and that you searched the place thoroughly, and yet it turned up on that very spot. Yes, sir, in that very spot. The prince gazed strangely at Labadif. And the general, he asked, abruptly, that general. How do you mean, the general? said Labadif, dubiously, as though he had not taken in the drift of the prince's remark. Oh, good heavens, I mean, what did the general say when the purse turned up under the chair? You and he had searched for it together there, hadn't you? Quite so together, but the second time I thought better to say nothing about finding it. I found it alone, but we in the world and the money. Was it all there? I opened the purse and counted it myself right to a single rouble. I think you might have come and told me, said the prince, thoughtfully. Oh, I didn't like to disturb you, prince, in the midst of your private and doubtless most interesting personal reflections. Besides, I wanted to appear, myself, to have found nothing. I took the purse, and opened it, and counted the money, and shut it and put it down again under the chair. What in the world for? Oh, just out of curiosity, said Labadif rubbing his hands and sniggering. What, it's still there then, is it? Ever since the day before yesterday. Oh no, you see, I was half in hopes the general might find it. Because if I found it, why should not he to observe an object lying before his very eyes? I moved the chair several times so as to expose the purse to view, but the general never saw it. He is very absent just now, evidently. He talks and laughs and tells stories, and suddenly flies into a rage with me. Goodness knows why. Well, both have you taken the purse away now? No, it disappeared from under the chair in the night. Where is it now, then? Here, laughed Labadif, at last, rising to his full height and looking pleasantly at the prince, here, in the lining of my coat. Look, you can feel it for yourself, if you like. Sure enough there was something sticking out of the front of the coat so mathing large. It certainly felt as though it might well be the purse fallen through a hole in the pocket into the lining. I took it out and had a look at it. It's all right. I've let it slip back into the lining now, as you see, and so I have been walking about ever since yesterday morning. It knocks against my legs when I walk along. Hum, and you take no notice of it. Quite so, I take no notice of it. Ha, ha, and think of this. 
Prince, my pockets are always strong and whole, and yet, here in one night, is a huge hole. I know the phenomenon is unworthy of your notice, but such is the case. I examine the hole, and I declare it actually looks as though it had been made with a penknife, a most improbable contingency. And and general, are very angry all day, sir, all yesterday, and all today. He shows decided bacchanalian predilections at one time, and at another is tearful and sensitive, but at any moment he is liable to paroxysms of such rage that I assure you, Prince, I am quite alarmed. I am not a military man, you know. Yesterday we were sitting together in the tavern, and the lining of my coat was keyed accidentally, of course sticking out right in front. The general squinted at it and flew into a rage. He never looks me quite in the face now, unless he's very drunk or maudlin, but yesterday he looked at me in such a way that a shiver went all down my back. I intend to find the purse tomorrow, but till then I am going to have another night of it with him. What's the good of tormenting him like this? Cried the prince. I don't torment him, prince, I don't indeed. Cried Labadiff, hotly. I love him, my dear sir. I esteem him, and believe it or not, I love him all the better for this business, yes and value him more. Labadiff said this so seriously that the prince quite lost his temper with him. Nonsense. Love him and torment him so. Why? By the very fact that he put the purse prominently before you, first under the chair and then in your lining. He shows that he does not wish to deceive you, but is anxious to bag your forgiveness in this artless way. Do you hear? He is asking your pardon. He confides in the delicacy of your feelings, and in your friendship for him. And you can allow yourself to humiliate so thoroughly honest a man. Thoroughly honest. Quite so, Prince. Thoroughly honest. Said Labadiff with flashing eyes. And only you, Prince, could have found so very appropriate an expression. I honor you for it, Prince. Very well. That's settled. I shall find the purse now and not tomorrow. Here, I find it and take it out before your eyes. And the money is all right. Take it, Prince, and keep it till tomorrow, will you? Tomorrow or next day you'll take it back again. I think, Prince, that the night after its disappearance it was buried under a bush in the garden. So I believe what do you think of that? Well, take care you don't tell him to his face that you have found the purse. Simply let him see that it is no longer in the lining of your coat and form his own conclusions. Do you think so? Had I not just better tell him I have found it and pretend I never guessed where it was? No, I don't think so, said the prince, thoughtfully. It's too late for theft. it would be dangerous now. No, no, better say nothing about it. Be nice with him. You know, but don't show him, oh, you know well enough, I know, prince, of course, I know, but I'm afraid I shall not carry it out, for to do so one needs a heart like your own. He is so very irritable just now, and so proud. At one moment he will embrace me, and the next he flies out at me and sneers at me, and then I stick the lining forward on purpose. Well, au revoir, prince, I see I'm keeping you, and boring you. 2. Interfering with your most interesting private reflections. Now, do be careful. Secrecy, as before. Oh, silence isn't the word. Softly, softly. But in spite of this conclusion to the episode, the prince remained as puzzled as ever, if not more so. He awaited next morning's interview with the general most impatiently. The time appointed was twelve o'clock, and the prince, returning home unexpectedly late, found the general waiting for him. At the first glance, he saw that the letter was displeased, perhaps because he had been kept waiting. The prince apologized and quickly took a seat. He seemed strangely timid before the general this morning, for some reason, and felt as though his visitor was some piece of china which he was afraid of breaking. On scrutinizing him, the prince soon saw that the general was quite a different man from what he had been the day before. He looked like one who had come to some momentous resolve. His calmness, however, was more apparent than real. He was courteous, but there was a suggestion of injured innocence in his manner. I've brought your book back, he began, indicating a book lying on the table. Much obliged to you for landing it to me. Ah, oh, yes. Well, did you read it, General? It's curious, isn't it? said the prince, delighted to be able to open up conversation upon an outside subject. Curious enough, yes, but crude, 
and of course dreadful nonsense, probably the man lies in every other sentence. The general spoke with considerable confidence, and dragged his words out with a conceited drawl. Oh, but it's only the simple tale of an old soldier who saw the French enter Moscow. Some of his remarks were wonderfully interesting. Remarks of an eyewitness are always valuable, whoever he be. Don't you think so? Had I been the publisher I should not have printed it. As to the evidence of eyewitnesses, in these days people prefer impudent lies to the stories of man of worth and long service. I know of some notes of the year 1812, which ye have determined, Prince, to leave this house, Mr. Labadiff's house. The general looked significantly at his host. Of course you have your own lodging at Pavlovsk Atot, your daughter's house, began the prince, quite at a loss what to say. He suddenly recollected that the general had come for advice on a most important matter, affecting his destiny. At my wife's, in other words, at my own place, my daughter's house. I beg your pardon, I leave Labadiff's house. My dear prince, because I have quarreled with this person, I broke with him last night, and am very sorry that I did not do so before. I expect respect, prince, even from those to whom I give my heart, so to speak. Prince, I have often given away my heart, and am nearly always deceived. This person was quite unworthy of the gift. There is much that might be improved in him, said the prince, moderately but he has some qualities which a power amid them one cannot but discern a cunning nature reveal what is often a diverting intellect. The prince's tone was so natural and respectful that the general could not possibly suspect him of any insincerity. Oh, that he possesses good traits, I was the first to show when I very nearly made him a present of my friendship. I am not dependent upon his hospitality and upon his house, I have my own family. I do not attempt to justify my own weakness. I have drunk with this man, and perhaps I deplore the fact now, but I did not take him up for the sake of drink alone. Excuse the crudeness of the expression, Prince, I did not make friends with him for that alone. I was attracted by his good qualities, but when the fellow declares that he was a child in 1812, and had his left leg cut off, and buried in the Vagokov Cemetery, in Moscow, such a cock and bull story amounts to disrespect. My dear sir, Toto impudent exaggeration. Oh, he was very likely joking. He said it for fun. I quite understand you. You mean that an innocent lie for the sake of a good joke is harmless and does not offend the human heart. Some people lie, if you like to put it so, out of pure friendship, in order to amuse their fellows. But when a man makes use of extravagance in order to show his disrespect and to make clear how the intimacy bores him, it is time for a man of honor to break off the said intimacy and to teach the offender his place. The general flushed with indignation as he spoke. Oh, but Labadiff cannot have been in Moscow in 1812. He is much too young. It is all nonsense. Very well. But even if we admit that he was alive in 1812, can one believe that a French chasseur pointed a cannon at him for a lark and shot his left leg off? He says he picked his own leg up and took it away and buried it in the cemetery. He swore he had a stone put up over it with the inscription, Here lies the leg of collegiate secretary Labadiff. And on the other side, rest, beloved ashes, till the morn of joy and that he has a service read over it every year, which is simply sacrilege, and goes to Moscow once a year on purpose. He invites me to Moscow in order to prove his assertion, and show me his leg's tomb, and the very cannon that shot him. He says it's the eleventh from the gate of the Kremlin, an old-fashioned falconet taken from the French afterwards. And, meanwhile, both his legs are still on his body, said the prince, laughing. I assure you, it is only an innocent joke and you need not be angry about it. Excuse me wait a minute, he says that the leg we see is a wooden one, made by Chernosvitov. They do say one can dance with those. Quite so, quite so, and he swears that his wife never found out that one of his legs was wooden all the while they were married. When I showed him the ridiculousness of all this, he said, well, if you were one of Napoleon's pages in 1812, you might let me bury my leg in the Moscow cemetery. Why, did you say, began the prince, and paused in confusion. The general gazed at his host disdainfully. Oh, go on, he said. Finish your sentence, by all means. 
Say how odd it appears to you that a man fallen to such a depth of humiliation as I can ever have been the actual eyewitness of great events. Go on, I don't mind. Has he found time to tell you scandal about me? No, I've heard nothing of this from Labadev. If you mean Labadev, him, I thought differently. You see, we were talking over this period of history. I was criticizing a current report of something which then happened, and having been myself an eyewitness of the occurrence you are smiling, Prince you are looking at my face as if oh no, not at Ellie I am rather young looking, I know, but I am actually older than I appear to be. I was 10 or 11 in the year 1812. I don't know my age exactly, but it has always been a weakness of mine to make it out less than it really is. I assure you, General, I do not in the least doubt your statement. One of our living autobiographers states that when he was a small baby in Moscow in 1812 the French soldiers fed him with bread. Well, there you see, said the General, condescendingly. There is nothing whatever unusual about my tale. Truth very often appears to be impossible. I was a Paget sounds strange, I dare say. Had I been fifteen years old I should probably have been terribly frightened when the French arrived, as my mother was, who had been too slow about clearing out of Moscow. But as I was only just ten I was not in the least alarmed, and rushed through the crowd to the very door of the palace when Napoleon alighted from his horse. Undoubtedly, at ten years old you would not have felt the sense of fear, as you say, blurted out the prince, horribly uncomfortable in the sensation that he was just about to blush. Of course, and it all happened so easily and naturally, and yet, were a novelist to describe the episode, he would put in all kinds of impossible and incredible details. Oh, cried the prince, I have often thought that. Why, I know of a murder, for the sake of a watch. It's in all the papers now. But if some writer had invented it, all the critics would have jumped down his throat and said the thing was too improbable for anything. And yet you read it in the paper, and you can't help thinking that out of these strange disclosures is to be gained the full knowledge of Russian life and character. You said that well, General, it is so true, concluded the prince, warmly, delighted to have found a refuge from the fiery blushes which had covered his face. Yes, it's quite true, isn't it? cried the general, his eyes sparkling with gratification. A small boy, a child, would naturally realize no danger. He would shove his way through the crowds to see the shine and glitter of the uniforms, and especially the great man of whom everyone was speaking. For at that time all the world had been talking of no one but this man for some years past. The world was full of his name, Eso to speak drew it in with my mother's milk. Napoleon, passing a couple of paces from me, caught sight of me accidentally. I was very well dressed, and being all alone, in that crowd, as you will easily imagine. Oh, of course. Naturally the sight impressed him, and proved to him that not all the aristocracy had left Moscow, that at least some nobles and their children had remained behind. Just so, just so, he wanted to win over the aristocracy. When his eagle eye fell on me, mine probably flashed back in response. Voil ungaron being veil, he asked Tan Pri. I immediately replied, almost panting with excitement, a general, who died on the battlefields of his country. Le Fils d'un boyard at d'un brave pardesis la marche. Jaime las boyards, mames to, patty. To this keen question I replied, as keenly, the Russian heart can recognize a great man even in the bitter enemy of his country. At least, I don't remember the exact words, you know, but the idea was as I say. Napoleon was struck, he thought a minute and then said to his suite, I like that boy's pride, if all Russians think like this child, then he didn't finish, but went on and entered the palace. I instantly mixed with his suite and followed him. I was already in high favor. I remember when he came into the first hall, the Empress stopped before a portrait of the Empress Catherine, and after a thoughtful glance remarked, that was a great woman, and passed on. Well, in a couple of days I was known all over the palace and the Kremlin as Le Petit Boyard. I only went home to sleep. They were nearly out of their minds about me at home. A couple of days after this, Napoleon's page, de Bezencourt, died, he had not been able to stand the trials of the campaign. Napoleon remembered me, I was taken away without explanation. 
the dead page's uniform was tried on me, and when I was taken before the emperor, dressed in it, he nodded his head to me, and I was told that I was appointed to the vacant post of page. Well, I was glad enough, for I had long felt the greatest sympathy for this man, and then the pretty uniform, and all fattenly a child, you know and so on. It was a dark green dress coat with gold buttons, red facings, white trousers, and a white silk waistcoat, silk stockings, shoes with buckles, and top boots if I were riding out with his majesty or with a suite. Though the position of all of us at that time was not particularly brilliant, and the poverty was dreadful all round, yet the etiquette at court was strictly preserved, and the more strictly in proportion to the growth of the forebodings of disaster, quite so, quite so, of course, murmured the poor prince, who didn't know where to look. Your memoirs would be most interesting. The general was, of course, repeating what he had told Labadif the night before, and thus brought it out glibly enough, but here he looked suspiciously at the prince out of the corners of his eyes. My memoirs, he began with redoubled pride and dignity. Write my memoirs, the idea has not tempted me, and yet, if you please, my memoirs have long been written, but they shall not see the light until dust returns to dust. Then, I doubt not, they will be translated into all languages, not of course on account of their actual literary merit, but because of the great events of which I was the actual witness, though but a child at the time. As a child, I was able to penetrate into the secrecy of the great man's private room. At nights I have heard the groans and wailings of this giant in distress. He could feel no shame in weeping before such a mere child as I was, though I understood even then that the reason for his suffering was the silence of the Emperor Alexander. Yes, of course, he had written letters to the latter with proposals of peace, had he not put in the prince. We did not know the details of his proposals, but he wrote letter after letter, all day and every day. He was dreadfully agitated. Sometimes at night I would throw myself upon his breast with tears. Oh, how I loved that man. Ask forgiveness. Oh, ask forgiveness of the Emperor Alexander. I would cry. I should have said, of course, make peace with Alexander. But as a child I expressed my idea in the naive way recorded. Oh, my child. He would say, he loved to talk to me and seemed to forget my tender years. Oh, my child, I am ready to kiss Alexander's feet, but I hate and abominate the King of Prussia and the Austrian Emperor, and then but you know nothing of politics, my child. He would pull up, remembering whom he was speaking to, but his eyes would sparkle for a long while after this. Well now, if I were to describe all this, and I have seen greater events than these, all these critical gentlemen of the press and political party so, no thanks. Im their very humble servant, but no thanks. Quite so, party as you are very right, said the prince. I was reading a book about Napoleon and the Waterloo campaign only the other day, by Cheris, in which the author does not attempt to conceal his joy at Napoleon's discomfiture at every page. Well now, I don't like that, it smells of party, you know. You are quite right. And were you much occupied with your service under Napoleon? The general was in ecstasies, for the prince's remarks, made, as they evidently were, in all seriousness and simplicity, quite dissipated the last relics of his suspicion. I know Charesse's book. Oh, I was so angry with his work. I wrote to him and sighed he forget what, at this moment, you ask whether I was very busy under the emperor. Oh no, I was called page, but hardly took my duty seriously. Besides, Napoleon very soon lost hope of conciliating the Russians, and he would have forgotten all about me had he not loved me for personal reasons he don't mind saying so now. My heart was greatly drawn to him, too. My duties were light. I merely had to be at the palace occasionally to escort the emperor out riding, and that was about all. I rode very fairly well. He used to have a ride before dinner, and his suite on those occasions were generally devoused, myself, and Rustan. Constant, said the prince suddenly, and quite involuntarily. No, Constant was away then, taking a letter to the Empress Josephine. Instead of him there were always a couple of orderlies and that was all, accepting, of course, the generals and marshals whom Napoleon always took with him for the inspection of various localities, and for the sake of consultation generally. I remember there was on Edivaus nearly always with him a big man with spectacles. 
They used to argue and quarrel sometimes. Once they were in the Emperor's study together just those two and Miss Elfie was unobserved and they argued, and the Emperor seemed to be agreeing to something under protest. Suddenly his eye fell on me and an idea seemed to flash across him. Child, he said, abruptly, if I were to recognize the Russian Orthodox religion and emancipate the serfs, do you think Russia would come over to me? Never, I cried indignantly. The emperor was much struck. In the flashing eyes of this patriotic child I read and accept the fiat of the Russian people. Enough, devoust. It is mere fantasy on our part. Come, let's hear your other project. Yes, but that was a great idea, said the prince, clearly interested. You ascribe it to devoust, do you? Well, at all events, they were consulting together at the time. Of course it was the idea of an eagle, and must have originated with Napoleon, but the other project was good to it was the Conseil du Lion, as Napoleon called it. This project consisted in a proposal to occupy the Kremlin with the whole army, to arm and fortify it scientifically, to kill as many horses as could be got, and salt their flesh, and spend the winter there, and in spring to fight their way out. Napoleon liked the idea to attracted him. We rode round the Kremlin walls every day, and Napoleon used to give orders where they were to be patched, where built up, where pulled down and so on. All was decided at last. They were alone together those two and myself. Napoleon was walking up and down with folded arms. I could not take my eyes off his face me heart beat loudly and painfully. Im off, said Devoust. Where to? Asked Napoleon. To salt horse flesh, said Devoust. Napoleon shuddered fate was being decided. Child, he addressed me suddenly, what do you think of our plan? Of course he only applied to me as a sort of toss-up, you know. I turned to Devoust and addressed my reply to him. I said, as though inspired, escape, general, go home. The project was abandoned. Devoust shrugged his shoulders and went out, whispering to himself the ill deviant superstitious to you. Next morning the order to retreat was given. All this is most interesting, said the prince, very softly. If it really was soft it is, I mean he hastened to correct himself. Oh, my dear prince, cried the general, who was now so intoxicated with his own narrative that he probably could not have pulled up at the most patent indiscretion. You say, if it really was so, there was more and more, I assure you. These are merely a few little political acts. I tell you I was the eyewitness of the nightly sorrow and groanings of the great man, and of that no one can speak but myself. Towards the end he wept no more, though he continued to emit an occasional groan, but his face grew more overcast day by day, as though eternity were wrapping its gloomy mantle about him. Occasionally we passed whole hours of silence together at night, Rustan snoring in the next room that fellow slapped like a pig, but as loyal to me and my dynasty, said Napoleon of him. Sometimes it was very painful to me, and once he caught me with tears in my eyes. He looked at me kindly. You are sorry for me, he said. You, my child, and perhaps one other child me son, the king of Roma may grieve for me. All the rest hate me, and my brothers are the first to betray me in misfortune. I sobbed and threw myself into his arms. He could not resist me burst into tears, and our tears mingled as we folded each other in a close embrace. Write, oh, write a letter to the Empress Josephine. I cried, sobbing. Napoleon started, reflected and said, you remind me of a third heart which loves me. Thank you, my friend. And then and there he sat down and wrote that letter to Josephine, with which Constant was sent off next day. You did a good action, said the prince, for in the midst of his angry feelings you insinuated a kind thought into his heart. Just so, prince, just so. How well you bring out that fact, because your own heart is good cried the ecstatic old gentleman, and, strangely enough, real tears glistened in his eyes. Yes, prince, it was a wonderful spectacle, and, do you know, I all but went off to Paris, and should assuredly have shared his solitary exile with him, but, alas, our destinies were otherwise ordered. We parted, he to his island, where I am sure he thought of the weeping child who had embraced him so affectionately at parting in Moscow, and I was sent off to the cadet corps, where I found nothing but roughness and harsh discipline. Alas, my happy days were done. I do not wish to deprive your mother of you, and, therefore, I will not ask you to go with me, he said, 
the morning of his departure, but I should like to do something for you. He was mounting his horse as he spoke. Write something in my sister's album for me, I said rather timidly, for he was in a state of great dejection at the moment. He turned, called for a pen, took the album. How old is your sister? He asked, holding the pen in his hand. Three years old, I said. Ah, petite Phil Ellers. And he wrote in the album, Nimentes Jame. Napoleon, Vata Omi Sinker, such advice, and at such a moment, you must allow. Prince, was yes, quite so, very remarkable. This page of the album, framed in gold, hung on the wall of my sister's drawing room all her life, in the most conspicuous place till the day of her death. Where it is now, I really don't know. Heavens, it's to o'clock. How I have kept you, Prince. It is really most unpardonable of me. The general rose. Oh, not in the least, said the prince. On the contrary, I have been so much interested, am really very much obliged to you. Prince, said the general, pressing his hand and looking at him with flashing eyes and an expression as though he were under the influence of a sudden thought which had come upon him with stunning force. Prince, you are so kind, so simple-minded, that sometimes I really feel sorry for you. I gaze at you with a feeling of real affection. Oh, heaven bless you. May your life blossom and fructify in love. Mine is over. Forgive me, forgive me. He left the room quickly, covering his face with his hands. The prince could not doubt the sincerity of his agitation. He understood, too, that the old man had left the room intoxicated with his own success. The general belonged to that class of liars, who, in spite of their transports of lying, invariably suspect that they are not believed. On this occasion, when he recovered from his exaltation, he would probably suspect Mushkin of pitying him, and feel insulted. Have I been acting rightly in allowing him to develop such vast resources of imagination? The prince asked himself, but his answer was a fit of violent laughter which lasted ten whole minutes. He tried to reproach himself for the laughing fit, but eventually concluded that he needn't do so, since in spite of it he was truly sorry for the old man. The same evening he received a strange letter, short but decided. The general informed him that they must part forever, that he was grateful, but that even from him he could not accept signs of sympathy which were humiliating to the dignity of a man already miserable enough. When the prince heard that the old man had gone to Nina Alexandrovna, though, he felt almost easy on his account. We have seen, however, that the general paid a visit to Lizabetha Prokofievna and caused trouble there, the final upshot being that he frightened Mrs. Appenkin and angered her by bitter hints as to his son Gonia. He had been turned out in disgrace, eventually, and this was the cause of his bad night and quarrelsome day which ended in his sudden departure into the street in a condition approaching insanity, as recorded before. Collier did not understand the position. He tried severity with his father, as they stood in the street after the letter had cursed the household, hoping to bring him round that way. Well, where are we to go to now, father? He asked. You don't want to go to the princes. You have quarreled with Labadef. You have no money. I never have any. And here we are in the middle of the road, in a nice sort of mass. Better to be of a mass than in a mass. I remember making a joke something like that at the mass in 1840 forget. Where is my youth? Where is my golden youth? Who was it said that? Collier. It was Gogol, in dead souls. Father, cried Collier, glancing at him in some alarm. Dead souls. Yes, of course, dead. When I die, Collier, you must engrave on my tomb. Here lies a dead soul, shame pursues me. Who said that, Collier? I don't know, father. There was no Oropogov. Oroshka Oropogov. He cried, suddenly, stopping in the road in a frenzy. No Oropogov. And my own son to say it. Oropogov was in the place of a brother to me for eleven months. I fought a duel for him. He was married afterwards, and then killed on the field of battle. The bullet struck the cross on my breast and glanced off straight into his temple. I'll never forget you, he cried, and expired. I served my country well and honestly, Collier, but shame, shame has pursued me. You and Nina will come to my grave, Collier. Poor Nina, I always used to call her Nina in the old days, and how she loved. Nina, Nina, oh, Nina.
What have I ever done to deserve your forgiveness and long-suffering? Oh, Kolya, your mother has an angelic spirit, an angelic spirit, Kolya. I know that, father. Look here, dear old father, come back home. Let's go back to mother. Look, she ran after us when we came out. What have you stopped her for? Just as though you didn't take in what I said. Why are you crying, father? Poor Kolya cried himself and kissed the old man's hands. You kiss my hands, mine. Yes, yes, yours, yours. What is there to surprise anyone in that? Come, come, you mustn't go on like this, crying in the middle of the road. And you a general too, a military man. Come, let's go back. God bless you, dear boy, for being respectful to a disgraced man. Yes, to a poor disgraced old fellow, your father. You shall have such a son yourself, Leroy de Rome. Oh, curses on this house. Come, come, what does all this mean? Cried Collier beside himself at last. What is it? What has happened to you? Why don't you wish to come back home? Why have you gone out of your mind, like this? I'll explain it, I'll explain all to you. Don't shout, you shall hear. Leroy de Rome. Oh, I am sad, I am melancholy. Nurse, where is your tomb? Who said that, Collier? I don't know, I don't know who said it. Come home at once, come on. I'll punch Ganias had myself, if you lickingly come. Oh, where are you off to again? The general was dragging him away towards the door of a house nearby. He sat down on the step, still holding Collier by the hand. Band down, band down your ear. I'll tell you all disgrace, band down. I'll tell you in your ear. What are you dreaming of? Said poor, frightened Collier, stooping down towards the old man. All the same, Leroy de Rome, whispered the general, trembling all over. What? What do you mean? What Roy de Rome? He, the general continued to whisper, clinging more and more tightly to the boy's shoulder. If I show tell you Maria Maria Petrovna su 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 the old man had grown livid, his lips were shaking, convulsions were passing over his features. Suddenly he leaned over and began to sink slowly into Collier's arms. Has got a stroke, cried Collier, loudly, realizing what was the matter at last. In point of fact, Varia had rather exaggerated the certainty of her news as to the prince's betrothal to Aglaia. Very likely, with the perspicacity of her sex, she gave out as an accomplished fact what she felt was pretty sure to become a fact in a few days. Perhaps she could not resist the satisfaction of pouring one last drop of bitterness into her brother Gania's cup, in spite of her love for him. At all events, she had been unable to obtain any definite news from the Appenkin girls the most she could get out of them being hints and surmises and so on. Perhaps Aglaia's sisters had merely been pumping Varia for news while pretending to impart information. Or perhaps, again, they had been unable to resist the famine and gratification of teasing a friend for, after all this time, they could scarcely have helped divining the aim of her frequent visits. On the other hand, the prince, although he had told Labadif, as we know, that nothing had happened, and that he had nothing to impart, the prince may have been in error. Something strange seemed to have happened, without anything definite having actually happened. Varia had guessed that with her true feminine instinct. How or why it came about that everyone at the Appenchins became imbued with one conviction that something very important had happened to Aglaia, and that her fate was in process of settlement it would be very difficult to explain. But no sooner had this idea taken root, then all at once declared that they had seen and observed it long ago, that they had remarked it at the time of the poor night joke, and even before, though they had been unwilling to believe in such nonsense. So said the sisters. Of course, Lizabetha Prokofievna had foreseen it long before the rest. Her heart had been sore for a long while, she declared, and it was now so sore that she appeared to be quite overwhelmed, and the very thought of the prince became distasteful to her. There was a question to be decided most important, but most difficult, so much so, that Mrs. Appenkin did not even see how to put it into words. Would the prince do or not? Was all this good or bad? 
If good, which might be the case, of course, why good? If bad, which was hardly doubtful, were in, especially, bad. Even the general, the paterfamilias, though astonished at first, suddenly declared that, upon his honour, he really believed he had fancied something of the kind, after all. At first, it seemed a new idea, and then, somehow, it looked as familiar as possible. His wife frowned him down there. This was in the morning, but in the evening, alone with his wife, he had given tongue again. Well, really, you know, silence, of course, you know all this is very strange, if true, which I cannot deny, but, silence, but, on the other hand, if one looks things in the face, you know upon my honor. The prince is a rare good fellow wonderful. His name, you know your family Namil, this looks well, and perpetuates the name and title and all that which at this moment is not standing so high as it might from one point of view didn't you know. The world, the world is the world, of course seen people will talk and the prince as property, you know if it is not very large and then he continued silence and collapse of the general. Hearing these words from her husband, Lizabetha Prokofievna was driven beside herself. According to her opinion, the whole thing had been one huge, fantastical, absurd, unpardonable mistake. First of all, this prince is an idiot, and, secondly, he is a fool knows nothing of the world, and has no place in it. Whom can he be shown to? Where can you take him to? What will old Bilikonsky say? We never thought of such a husband as that for our Aglaia. Of course, the last argument was the chief one. The maternal heart trembled with indignation to think of such an absurdity, although in that heart there rose another voice, which said, And why is not the prince such a husband as you would have desired for Aglaia? It was this voice which annoyed Lizabetha Prokofievna more than anything else. For some reason or other, the sisters liked the idea of the prince. They did not even consider it very strange. In a word, they might be expected at any moment to range themselves strongly on his side, but both of them decided to say nothing either way. It had always been noticed in the family that the stronger Mrs. Appenchin's opposition was to any project, the nearer she was, in reality, to giving in. Alexandra, however, found it difficult to keep absolute silence on the subject. Long since holding, as she did, the post of confidential adviser to Mama, she was now perpetually called in council and asked her opinion, and especially her assistance, in order to recollect how on earth all this happened. Why did no one see it? Why did no one say anything about it? What did all that wretched poor night joke mean? Why was she, Lizabetha Prokofievna, driven to think and foresee and worry for everybody while they all suck their thumbs? and counted the crows in the garden, and did nothing. At first, Alexandra had been very careful, and had merely replied that perhaps her father's remark was not so far out, that, in the eyes of the world, probably the choice of the prince as a husband for one of the Appenkin girls would be considered a very wise one. Warming up, however, she added that the prince was by no means a fool, and never had been, and that as to place in the world, no one knew what the position of a respectable person in Russia would imply in a few years whether it would depend on successes in the government service, on the old system, or what. To all this her mother replied that Alexandra was a free thinker, and that all this was due to that cursed woman's rights question. Half an hour after this conversation, she went off to town, and thence to the Kamini Ostrov, Stone Island, a suburb and park of Ste. Petersburg to see Princess Bilikonsky, who had just arrived from Moscow on a short visit. The princess was Aglaia's godmother. Old Bilikonsky listened to all the fevered and despairing lamentations of Lizabetha Prokofievna without the least emotion. The tears of this sorrowful mother did not evoke answering sighs. In fact, she laughed at her. She was a dreadful old despot. This princess, she could not allow equality in anything, not even in friendship of the oldest standing, and she insisted on treating Mrs. Appenkin as her proch, as she had been thirty-five years ago. She could never put up with the independence and energy of Lizabetha's character. She observed that, as usual, the whole family had gone much too far ahead, and had converted a fly into an elephant. That, so far as she had heard their story, she was persuaded that nothing of any seriousness had occurred. 
that it would surely be better to wait until something did happen, that the prince, in her opinion, was a very decent young fellow, though perhaps a little eccentric, through illness, and not quite as weighty in the world as one could wish. The worst feature was, she said, Nastasia Filipovna. Lizabatha Prokofievna well understood that the old lady was angry at the failure of Evgeny Pavlovich her own recommendation. She returned home to Pavlovsk in a worse humor than when she laughed, and of course everybody in the house suffered. She pitched into everyone, because, she declared, they had gone mad. Why were things always mismanaged in her house? Why had everybody been in such a frantic hurry in this matter? So far as she could see, nothing whatever had happened. Surely they had better wait and see what was to happen, instead of making mountains out of molehills. And so the conclusion of the matter was that it would be far better to take it quietly and wait coolly to see what would turn up. But, alas, peace did not reign for more than ten minutes. The first blow dealt to its power was in certain news communicated to Lizabetha Prokofievna as to events which had happened during her trip to see the princess. This trip had taken place the day after that on which the prince had turned up at the Apanchins at nearly one o'clock at night, thinking it was nine. The sisters replied candidly and fully enough to their mother's impatient questions on her return. They said, in the first place, that nothing particular had happened since her departure, that the prince had been, and that Aglaia had kept him waiting a long while before she appeared half an hour, at least, that she had then come in and immediately asked the prince to have a game of chess. That the prince did not know the game, and Aglaia had beaten him easily, that she had been in a wonderfully merry mood, and had laughed at the prince, and chaffed him so unmercifully that one was quite sorry to see his wretched expression. She had then asked him to play cards the game called Little Fools. At this game the tables were turned completely, for the prince had shown himself a master at it. Aglaia had cheated and changed cards and stolen others in the most barefaced way, but in spite of everything the prince had beaten her hopelessly five times running, and she had been left little fool each time. Aglaia then lost her temper and began to say such awful things to the prince that he left no more, but grew dreadfully pale, especially when she said that she should not remain in the house with him, and that he ought to be ashamed of coming to their house at all, especially at night after all that had happened. So saying, she had left the room, banging the door after her, and the prince went off, looking as though he were on his way to a funeral, in spite of all their attempts at consolation. Suddenly, a quarter of an hour after the prince's departure, Aglaia had rushed out of her room in such a hurry that she had not even wiped her eyes, which were full of tears. She came back because Kolya had brought a hedgehog, Everybody came in to see the hedgehog. In answer to their questions, Kolya explained that the hedgehog was not his and that he had left another boy, Kostya Labadev, waiting for him outside. Kostya was too shy to come in because he was carrying a hatchet. They had bought the hedgehog and the hatchet from a peasant whom they had met on the road. He had offered to sell them the hedgehog and they had paid 50 kopecks for it, and the hatchet had so taken their fancy that they had made up their minds to buy it of their own accord. On hearing this, Aglaia urged Kolya to sell her the hedgehog. She even called him dear Kolya, in trying to coax him. He refused for a long time, but at last he could hold out no more, and went to fetch Kostya Labadev. The latter appeared, carrying his hatchet, and covered with confusion. Then it came out that the hedgehog was not theirs, but the property of a schoolmate, one Petrov, who had given them some money to buy Schlosser's history for him, from another schoolfellow who at that moment was driven to raising money by the sale of his books. Kolya and Kostya were about to make this purchase for their friend when chance brought the hedgehog to their notice, and they had succumbed to the temptation of buying it. They were now taking Petrov the hedgehog and hatchet which they had bought with his money instead of Schlosser's history. But Aglaia so entreated them that at last they consented to sell her the hedgehog. As soon as she had got possession of it, she put it in a wicker basket with Kolya's help and covered it with a napkin. Then she said to Kolya, go and take this hedgehog to the prince from me and ask him to accept it as a token of my profound respect. Kolya joyfully promised to do the errand, but he demanded explanations. What does the hedgehog mean? What is the meaning of such a present? 
Aglaia replied that it was none of his business. I am sure that there is some allegory about it. Colia persisted. Aglaia grew angry and called him a silly boy. If I did not respect all women in your person, replied Colia, and if my own principles would permit it, I would soon prove to you that I know how to answer such an insult. But, in the end, Colia went off with the hedgehog in great delight, followed by Kostia Labadev. Aglaia's annoyance was soon over, and seeing that Colia was swinging the hedgehog's basket violently to and fro, she called out to him from the veranda, as if they had never quarreled. Colia, dear, please take care not to drop him. Colia appeared to have no grudge against her, either, for he stopped and answered most cordially, No, I will not drop him. Don't be afraid, Aglaia Ivanovna. After which he went on his way. Aglaia burst out laughing and ran up to her room, highly delighted. Her good spirits lasted the whole day. All this filled poor Elizabeth's mind with chaotic confusion. What on earth did it all mean? The most disturbing feature was the hedgehog. What was the symbolic signification of a hedgehog? What did they understand by it? What underlay it? Was it a cryptic message? Poor General Appenkin put his foot in it by answering the above questions in his own way. He said there was no cryptic message at all. As for the hedgehog, it was just a hedgehog, which meant nothing unless, indeed, it was a pledge of friendship, the sign of forgetting of offenses and so on. At all events, it was a joke, and, of course, a most pardonable and innocent one. We may as well remark that the general had guessed perfectly accurately. The prince, returning home from the interview with Aglaia, had sat gloomy and depressed for half an hour. He was almost in despair when Colia arrived with the hedgehog. Then the sky cleared in a moment. The prince seemed to arise from the dead. He asked Colia all about it, made him repeat the story over and over again, and laughed and shook hands with the boys in his delight. It seemed clear to the prince that Aglaia forgave him, and that he might go there again this very evening, and in his eyes that was not only the main thing, but everything in the world. What children we are still, Colia. He cried at last, enthusiastically, and how delightful it is that we can be children still. Simply me, dear prince, simply she is in love with you. That's the whole of the secret, replied Colia, with authority. The prince blushed, but this time he said nothing. Colia burst out laughing and clapped his hands. A minute later the prince left too, and from this moment until the evening he looked at his watch every other minute to see how much time he had to wait before evening came. But the situation was becoming rapidly critical. Mrs. Appenkin could bear her suspense no longer, and in spite of the opposition of husband and daughters, she sent for Aglaia, determined to get a straightforward answer out of her once for all. Otherwise, she observed hysterically, I shall die before evening. It was only now that everyone realized to what a ridiculous deadlock the whole matter had been brought. Accepting feigned surprise, indignation, laughter, and jeering both at the prince and at everyone who asked her questions, nothing could be got out of Aglaia. Lizabatha Prokofievna went to bed and only rose again in time for tea, when the prince might be expected. She awaited him in trembling agitation, and when he at last arrived she nearly went off into hysterics. Mushkin himself came in very timidly. He seemed to feel his way, and looked in each person's eyes in a questioning way, for Aglaia was absent, which fact alarmed him at once. This evening there were no strangers present no one but the immediate members of the family. Prince Ass was still in town, occupied with the affairs of Evgeny Pavlovich's uncle. I wish at least he would come and say something, complained poor Lizabetha Prokofievna. The general sat still with the most preoccupied air. The sisters were looking very serious and did not speak a word, and Lizabetha Prokofievna did not know how to commence the conversation. At length she plunged into an energetic and hostile criticism of railways and glared at the prince defiantly. Alas, Aglaia still did not come in, the prince was quite lost. He had the greatest difficulty in expressing his opinion that railways were most useful institutions, and in the middle of his speech Adelaida laughed, which threw him into a still worse state of confusion. At this moment in March to Aglaia, as calm and collected as could be, she gave the prince a ceremonious bow and solemnly took up a prominent position near the big round table. She looked at the prince questioningly, 
All present realized that the moment for the settlement of perplexities had arrived. Did you get my hedgehog? She inquired, firmly and almost angrily. Yes, I got it, said the prince, blushing. Tell us now, at once, what you made of the present. I must have you answer this question for mother's sake. She needs pacifying, and so do all the rest of the family. Look here, Aglaia began the general. This this is going beyond all limits, said Lizabetha Prokofievna, suddenly alarmed. It is not in the least beyond all limits, Mama, said her daughter, firmly. I sent the prince a hedgehog this morning, and I wish to hear his opinion of it. Go on, prince. What what sort of opinion, Aglaia Ivanovna, about the hedgehog? That easy suppose you wish to know how I received the hedgehog, Aglaia Ivanovna, or, I should say, how I regarded your sending him to me. In that case, I may tell you in a word that I in fact he paused, breathless. Come I you haven't told us much, said Aglaia, after waiting some five seconds. Very well, I am ready to drop the hedgehog, if you like but I'm anxious to be able to clear up this accumulation of misunderstandings. Allow me to ask you, Prince, I wish to hear from you, personally are you making me an offer, or not? Gracious heavens, exclaimed Lizabetha Prokofievna. The prince started. The general stiffened in his chair. The sisters frowned. Don't deceive me now, Prince tell the truth. All these people persecute me with astounding questions about you. Is there any ground for all these questions, or not? Come, I have not asked you to marry me yet, Aglaia Ivanovna, said the prince, becoming suddenly animated, but you know yourself how much I love you and trust you. Noi asked you the sense of this. Do you intend to ask for my hand, or not? Yes, he do ask for it, said the prince, more dead than alive now. There was a general stir in the room. None of me, dear girl, began the general. You cannot proceed like this, Aglaia, if that's how the matter stands. It's impossible. Prince, forgive it, my dear fellow, boot Elizabetha Prokofievna. He appealed to his spouse for help. You must really not in it, I. I retire from all responsibility, said Elizabetha Prokofievna, with a wave of the hand. Allow me to speak. Please, Mama, said Aglaia. I think I ought to have something to say in the matter. An important moment of my destiny is about to be decided. This is how Aglaia expressed herself and I wish to find out how the matter stands, for my own sake, though I am glad you are all here. Allow me to ask you, Prince, since you cherish those intentions, how you consider that you will provide for my happiness. You don't quite know how to answer your question, Aglaia Ivanovna. What is there to say to such a question, and and must I answer? I think you are rather overwhelmed and out of breath. Have a little rest, and try to recover yourself. Take a glass of water, or but they'll give you some tea directly. I love you, Aglaia Ivanovna. I love you very much. I love only you and please don't jest about it, for I do love you very much. Well, this matter is important. We are not children when must look into it thoroughly. Now then, kindly tell me you had does your fortune consist of. No, Glaicom, enough of this. You mustn't behave like this, said her father in dismay. It's disgraceful, said Lizabetha Prokofievna in a loud whisper. Shas mad quite, said Alexandra. For too many do you mean? Asked the prince in some surprise. Just so, I have now let's see have a hundred and thirty-five thousand roubles, said the prince, blushing violently. Is that all, really? Said Aglaia, candidly, without the slightest show of confusion. However, it's not so bad, especially if managed with economy. Do you intend to serve? He intended to try for a certificate as private tutor. Very good. That would increase our income nicely. Have you any intention of being a Kamajunka? A Kamajunka? I had not thought of it, but but here the two sisters could restrain themselves no longer, and both of them burst into irrepressible laughter. Adelaida had long since detected in Aglaia's features the gathering signs of an approaching storm of laughter which she restrained with amazing self-control. Aglaia looked menacingly at her laughing sisters, but could not contain herself any longer, and the next minute she too had burst into an irrepressible and almost hysterical fit of mirth. At length she jumped up and ran out of the room. I knew it was all a joke, cried Adelaida. I felt it ever since since the hedgehog. No, no, 
I cannot allow this, this is a little too much, cried Lizabetha Prokofievna, exploding with rage, and she rose from her seat and followed Aglaya out of the room as quickly as she could. The two sisters hurriedly went after her. The prince and the general were the only two persons left in the room. It's its real, no, could you have imagined anything like it? Laugh Nikolaevich, cried the general. He was evidently so much agitated that he hardly knew what he wished to say. Seriously now, seriously, I mean I only see that Aglaya Ivanovna is laughing at me, said the poor prince, sadly. Wait a bit, my boy, I'll just go you stay here, you know. But do just explain, if you can, Lev Nikolaevich, how in the world has all this come about? And what does it all mean? You must understand, my dear fellow, I am a father, you see, and I ought to be allowed to understand the Martero explain. I bag you. I love Aglaya Ivanosh knows it, and I think she must have long known it. The general shrugged his shoulders. Strange, I it's strange, he said, and you love her very much. Yes, very much. Well, it's almost strange to me. That is me, dear fellow. It is such a surprise as a blow that. You see, it is not your financial position, though I should not object if you were a bit richer. I am thinking of my daughter's happiness, of course. And the thing is, are you able to give her the happiness she deserves? And then is all this a joke on her part, or is she in earnest? I don't mean on your side, but on hers. At this moment, Alexandra's voice was heard outside the door, calling out Papa. Wait for me here, my boy, will you? Just wait and think it all over, and I'll come back directly, he said hurriedly, and made off with what looked like the rapidity of alarm in response to Alexandra's call. He found the mother and daughter locked in one another's arms, mingling their tears. These were the tears of joy and peace and reconciliation. Aglaya was kissing her mother's lips and cheeks and hands. They were hugging each other in the most ardent way. There, look at her now, Ivan Fedorovich. Here she eyes all of her. This is our real Aglaya at last, said Lizabetha Prokofievna. Aglaya raised her happy, tearful face from her mother's breast glanced at her father and burst out laughing. She sprang at him and hugged him too and kissed him over and over again. She then rushed back to her mother and hid her face in the maternal bosom and there indulged in more tears. Her mother covered her with a corner of her shawl. Oh, you cruel little girl, how will you treat us all next? I wonder, she said, but she spoke with a ring of joy in her voice and as though she breathed at last without the oppression which she had felt so long. Cruel, sobbed Aglaya. Yes, I'm cruel, and worthless, and spoiler tell father so. Oh, here he easy forgot father. Listen, she laughed through her tears. My darling, my little idol, cried the general, kissing and fondling her hands. Aglaya did not draw them away. So you love this young man, do you? No, 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 can't bear him. I can't bear your young man, cried Aglaya, raising her head. And if you dare say that once more, Papa'm serious, you know, him, do you hear mime serious? She certainly did seem to be serious enough. She had flushed up all over and her eyes were blazing. The general felt troubled and remained silent, while Elizabeth Prokofievna telegraphed to him from behind Aglaya to ask no questions. If that's the case, Darlington, of course, you shall do exactly as you like. He is waiting alone downstairs. Hadn't I better hint to him gently that he can go? The general telegraphed to Lizabetha Prokofievna in his turn. No, no, you needn't do anything of the sort. You mustn't hint gently at all. I'll go down myself directly. I wish to apologize to this young man because I hurt his feelings. Yes, seriously, said the general, gravely. Well, you'd better stay here, all of you, for a little, and I'll go down to him alone to begin with. I'll just go in and then you can follow me almost at once. That's the best way. She had almost reached the door when she turned round again. I shall allow no, I shall. I shall die of laughing, she said lugubriously. However, she turned and ran down to the prince as fast as her feet could carry her. Well, what does it all mean? What do you make of it? Asked the general of his spouse hurriedly. I hardly dare say, said Lizabetha, as hurriedly but I think it's as plain as anything can be. I think so too, as clear as day. She loves him, loves him. She is head over ears in love. 
that's what she is, put in Alexandra. Well, God bless her, God bless her, if such is her destiny, said Lizabetha, crossing herself devoutly. Hm, destiny it is, said the general, and there's no getting out of destiny. With these words they all moved off towards the drawing room, where another surprise awaited them. Aglaia had not only not laughed, as she had feared, but had gone to the prince rather timidly, and said to him, Forgive a silly, horrid, spoilt girl. She took his hand here, and be quite assured that we all of us esteem you beyond all words. And if I dare to turn your beautiful, admirable simplicity to ridicule, forgive me as you would a little child its mischief. Forgive me all my absurdity of just now, which, of course, meant nothing, and could not have the slightest consequence. She spoke these words with great emphasis. Her father, mother, and sisters came into the room and were much struck with the last words, which they just caught as they entered absurdity, which of course meant nothing and still more so with the emphasis with which Aglaia had spoken. They exchanged glances questioningly, but the prince did not seem to have understood the meaning of Aglaia's words. He was in the highest heaven of delight. Why do you speak so? He murmured. Why do you ask my forgiveness? He wished to add that he was unworthy of being asked for forgiveness by her but paused. Perhaps he did understand Aglaia's sentence about absurdity which meant nothing, and like the strange fellow that he was, rejoiced in the words. Undoubtedly the fact that he might now come and see Aglaia as much as he pleased again was quite enough to make him perfectly happy. That he might come and speak to her, and see her, and sit by her, and walk with her one knows. But that all this was quite enough to satisfy him for the whole of his life and that he would desire no more to the end of time. Lizabetha Prokofievna felt that this might be the case, and she didn't like it, though very probably she could not have put the idea into words. It would be difficult to describe the animation and high spirits which distinguished the prince for the rest of the evening. He was so happy that it made one feel happy to look at him, as Aglaia's sisters expressed it afterwards. He talked and told stories just as he had done once before and never since, namely on the very first morning of his acquaintance with the Apanchins, six months ago. Since his return to Petersburg from Moscow, he had been remarkably silent, and had told Prince Ars, on one occasion, before everyone, that he did not think himself justified in degrading any thought by his unworthy words. But this evening he did nearly all the talking himself, and told stories by the dozen, while he answered all questions put to him clearly gladly, and with any amount of detail. There was nothing, however, of love-making in his talk. His ideas were all of the most serious kind, some were even mystical and profound. He had his own views on various matters, some of his most private opinions and observations, many of which would have seemed rather funny, so his hearers agreed afterwards, had they not been so well expressed. The general liked serious subjects of conversation, but both he and Lizabetha Prokofievna felt that they were having a little too much of a good thing tonight, and as the evening advanced, they both grew more or less melancholy. But towards night, the prince fell to telling funny stories, and was always the first to burst out laughing himself, which he invariably did so joyously and simply that the rest laughed just as much at him as at his stories. As for Aglaia, she hardly said a word all the evening, but she listened with all her ears to Lev Nikolaevich's talk, and scarcely took her eyes off him. She looked at him, and stared and stared, and hung on every word he said, said Lizabetha afterwards, to her husband, and yet, tell her that she loves him, and she is furious. What's to be done? It's fate, said the general, shrugging his shoulders, and, for a long while after, he continued to repeat, it's fate, it's fate. We may add that to a businessman like General Appenkin the present position of affairs was most unsatisfactory. He hated the uncertainty in which they had been, perforce, laughed. However, he decided to say no more about it, and merely to look on, and take his time and tune from Lizabetha Prokofievna. The happy state in which the family had spent the evening, as just recorded, was not of very long duration. Next day Aglaia quarreled with the prince again, and so she continued to behave for the next few days. For whole hours at a time she ridiculed and chaffed the wretched man, and made him almost a laughing stock. 
It is true that they used to sit in the little summer house together for an hour or two at a time, very often, but it was observed that on these occasions the prince would read the paper, or some book, aloud to Aglaia. Do you know, Aglaia said to him once, interrupting the reading, I've remarked that you are dreadfully badly educated. You never know anything thoroughly. If one asks you, neither anyone's name, nor dates, nor about treaties and so on, it's a great pity, you know. I told you I had not had much of an education, replied the prince. How am I to respect you, if that's the case? Read on now, not and stop reading. And once more, that same evening, Aglaia mystified them all. Prince Ass had returned, and Aglaia was particularly amiable to him, and asked a great deal after Evgeny Pavlovich. Mushkin had not come in as yet. Suddenly Prince Ass hinted something about a new and approaching change in the family. He was led to this remark by a communication inadvertently made to him by Lizabetha Prokofievna that Adelaide's marriage must be postponed a little longer in order that the two weddings might come off together. It is impossible to describe Aglaia's irritation. She flared up and said some indignant words about all these silly insinuations. She added that she had no intentions as yet of replacing anybody's mistress. These words painfully impressed the whole party, but especially her parents. Lizabatha Prokofievna summoned a secret council of two and insisted upon the generals demanding from the prince a full explanation of his relations with Nastasia Filipovna. The general argued that it was only a whim of Aglaia's, and that, had not Prince Ass, unfortunately made that remark, which had confused the child and made her blush. She never would have said what she did, and that he was sure Aglaia knew well that anything she might have heard of the prince and Nastasia Filipovna was merely the fabrication of malicious tongues and that the woman was going to marry Rogojin. He insisted that the prince had nothing whatever to do with Nastasia Filipovna, so far as any liaison was concerned, and, if the truth were to be told about it, he added, never had had. Meanwhile nothing put the prince out, and he continued to be in the seventh heaven of bliss. Of course he could not fail to observe some impatience and ill-temper in Aglaia now and then, but he believed in something else, and nothing could now shake his conviction. Besides, Aglaia's frowns never lasted long, they disappeared of themselves. Perhaps he was too easy in his mind. So thought Hippolyte, at all events, who met him in the park one day. Didn't I tell you the truth now, when I said you were in love? He said, coming up to Mushkin of his own accord, and stopping him. The prince gave him his hand, and congratulated him upon looking so well. Hippolyte himself seemed to be hopeful about his state of health as is often the case with consumptives. He had approached the prince with the intention of talking sarcastically about his happy expression of face, but very soon forgot his intention and began to talk about himself. He began complaining about everything, disconnectedly and endlessly, as was his wont. You wouldn't believe, he concluded, how irritating they all are there. They're such wretchedly small, vain, egotistical, commonplace people. Would you believe it, they invited me there under the express condition that I should die quickly, and they are all as wild as possible with me for not having died yet, and for being, on the contrary, a good deal better. Isn't it a comedy? I don't mind betting that you don't believe me. The prince said nothing. I sometimes think of coming over to you again, said Hippolyte, carelessly. So you don't think them capable of inviting a man on the condition that he is to look sharp and die? I certainly thought they invited you with quite other views. Ho, ho, you are not nearly so simple as they try to make you out. This is not the time for it, or I would tell you a thing or two about that beauty, Gonia, and his hopes. You are being undermined, pitilessly undermined, and and it is really melancholy to see you so calm about it. But alas, it's your nature, I can't help it. My word. What a thing to be melancholy about. Why do you think I should be any happier if I were to feel disturbed about the excavations you tell me of? It is better to be unhappy and know the worst than to be happy in a fool's paradise. I suppose you don't believe that you have a rival in that quarter. Your insinuations as to rivalry are rather cynical, Hippolyte. I'm sorry to say I have no right to answer you. As for Gonia, I put it to you, can any man have a happy mind after passing through what he has had to suffer? I think that is the best way to look at it. He will change yet. He has lots of time before him, 
and life is rich, besides, besides. The prince hesitated. As to being undermined, I don't know what in the world you are driving at, Hippolyte. I think we had better drop the subject. Very well, we'll drop it for a while. You can't look at anything but in your exalted, generous way. You must put out your finger and touch a thing before you'll believe it. Eh? Ha, ha, ha. I suppose you despise me dreadfully, Prince. Eh? What do you think? Why? Because you have suffered more than we have. No, because I am unworthy of my sufferings, if you like. Whoever can suffer is worthy to suffer, I should think. Aglaya Ivanovna wished to see you after she had read your confession, but she postponed the pleasure I see quite understand, said Hippolyte, hurriedly, as though he wished to banish the subject. A hearty tell method you read her all that nonsense aloud. Stupid bosh it was written in delirium, and I can't understand how anyone can be so he won't say cruel, because the word would be humiliating to myself, but well say childishly vain and revengeful as to reproach me with this confession and use it as a weapon against me. Don't be afraid, I'm not referring to yourself. Oh, but I'm sorry you repudiate the confession. Hippolyte is sincere, and, do you know, even the absurd parts of it and these are many. Here Hippolyte frowned savagely. Ah, as it were, redeemed by suffering for it must have cost you something to admit what you there say griot torture, perhaps, for all I know. Your motive must have been a very noble one all through. Whatever may have appeared to the contrary, I give you my word. I see this more plainly every day. I do not judge you. I merely say this to have it off my mind. And I am only sorry that I did not say it all. Then Hippolyte flushed hotly. He had thought at first that the prince was humbugging him. But on looking at his face he saw that he was absolutely serious and had no thought of any deception. Hippolyte beamed with gratification. And yet I must die, he said, and almost added, a man like me. And imagine how that gonia annoys me. He has developed the idea pretends to believe that in all probability three or four others who heard my confession will die before I do. There's an idea for you and all this by way of consoling me. Ha, ha, ha. In the first place they haven't died yet. And in the second, if they did die of them what would be the satisfaction to me in that? He judges me by himself, but he goes further. He actually pitches into me because, as he declares, any decent fellow would die quietly, and that all this is mere egotism on my part. He doesn't see what refinement of egotism it is on his own part and at the same time, what arcs like coarseness. Have you ever read of the death of one Stapin Glabov in the 18th century? I read of it yesterday by chance. Who was he? He was impaled on a stake in the time of Peter. I know, I know. He lay there fifteen hours in the hard frost, and died with the most extraordinary fortitude he know what of him. Only that God gives that sort of dying to some, and not to others. Perhaps you think, though, that I could not die like Glabov. Not at all, said the prince, blushing. I was only going to say that Yaunit, that you could not be like Glabov, but that you would have been more like I guess what you mean he should be an Osterman, not a Glabov. Is that what you meant? What Osterman? Asked the prince in some surprise. Why, Ostermanth diplomatist? Peter's Osterman, muttered Hippolyte, confused. There was a moment's pause of mutual confusion. Oh, no, no, said the prince at last. That was not what I was going to say, oh no. I don't think you would ever have been like Osterman. Hippolyte frowned gloomily. I'll tell you why I draw the conclusion, explained the prince, evidently desirous of clearing up the matter a little. Because... Though I often think over the man of those times, I cannot for the life of me imagine them to be like ourselves. It really appears to me that they were of another race altogether than ourselves of today. At that time people seemed to stick so to one idea. Now, they are more nervous, more sensitive, more enlightened people of two or three ideas at uncease it were. The man of today is a broader man, so to speak, and I declare I believe that is what prevents him from being so self-contained and independent a being as his brother of those earlier days. Of course, my remark was only made under this impression, and not in the least I quite understand. You are trying to comfort me for the naiveness with which you disagreed with me. Ha, ha. Ha, huh. you are a regular child, prince. However, I cannot help seeing that you always treat me like like a fragile china cup. Never mind, never mind, I'm not a bit angry. 
At all events, we have had a very funny talk. Do you know, all things considered, I should like to be something better than Osterman. I wouldn't take the trouble to rise from the dead to be an Osterman. However, I see I must make arrangements to die soon, or I myself. Well, leave me now. Au revoir. Look here before you go. Just give me your opinion. How do you think I ought to die now? I mean the best, the most virtuous way. Tell me. You should pass us by and forgive us our happiness, said the prince in a low voice. Ha, ha, ha. I thought so. I thought I should hear something like that. Well, you air you really Rio dear me. Eloquence, eloquence. Goodbye. As to the evening party at the Apenchins at which Princess Bilikonsky was to be present, Varya had reported with accuracy, though she had perhaps expressed herself too strongly. The thing was decided in a hurry and with a certain amount of quite unnecessary excitement, doubtless because nothing could be done in this house like anywhere else. The impatience of Lizabetha Prokofievna to get things settled explained a good deal, as well as the anxiety of both parents for the happiness of their beloved daughter. Besides, Princess Bilikonsky was going away soon, and they hoped that she would take an interest in the prince. They were anxious that he should enter society under the auspices of this lady, whose patronage was the best of recommendations for any young man. Even if there seemed something strange about the match, the general and his wife said to each other, the world will accept Aglaia's fiancé without any question if he is under the patronage of the princess. In any case, the prince would have to be shown sooner or later, that is, introduced into society, of which he had so far, not the least idea. Moreover, it was only a question of a small gathering of a few intimate friends. Besides Princess Bilikonsky, only one other lady was expected, the wife of a high dignitary. Evgeny Pavlovich, who was to escort the princess, was the only young man. Mushkin was told of the princess' visit three days beforehand, but nothing was said to him about the party until the night before it was to take place. He could not help observing the excited and agitated condition of all members of the family, and from certain hints dropped in conversation he gathered that they were all anxious as to the impression he should make upon the princess. But the Apenchins, one and all, believed that Mushkin, in his simplicity of mind, was quite incapable of realizing that they could be feeling any anxiety on his account, and for this reason they all looked at him with dread and uneasiness. In point of fact, he did attach marvelously little importance to the approaching event. He was occupied with altogether different thoughts. Aglaia was growing hourly more capricious and gloomy, and this distressed him. When they told him that Evgeny Pavlovich was expected, he evinced great delight, and said that he had long wished to see Hyman somehow these words did not please anyone. Aglaia left the room in a fit of irritation, and it was not until late in the evening, past eleven, when the prince was taking his departure, that she said a word or two to him, privately, as she accompanied him as far as the front door. I should like you, she said, not to come here tomorrow until evening, when the guests are all assembled. You know there are to be guests, don't you? She spoke impatiently and with severity. This was the first allusion she had made to the party of tomorrow. She hated the idea of it, everyone saw that, and she would probably have liked to quarrel about it with her parents, but pride and modesty prevented her from broaching the subject. The prince jumped to the conclusion that Aglaia, too, was nervous about him and the impression he would make, and that she did not like to admit her anxiety, and this thought alarmed him. Yes, I am invited, he replied. She was evidently in difficulties as to how best to go on. May I speak of something serious to you for once in my life? She asked, angrily. She was irritated at she knew not what, and could not restrain her wrath. Of course you may. I am very glad to listen, replied Mushkin. Aglaia was silent a moment, and then began again with evident dislike of her subject. I do not wish to quarrel with them about this. In some things they won't be reasonable. I always did feel a loathing for the laws which seem to guide Mama's conduct at times. I don't speak of father, for he cannot be expected to be anything but what he is. Mother is a noble-minded woman. I know, you try to suggest anything mean to her, and you'll see. But she is such a slave to these miserable creatures. I don't mean old Bilikonsky alone. She is a contemptible old thing, but she is able to twist people round her little finger. 
and I admire that in her, at all events, how mean it all is, and how foolish. We were always middle class, thoroughly middle class, people. Why should we attempt to climb into the giddy heights of the fashionable world? My sisters are all for it. It's Prince Ass. They have to thank for poisoning their minds. Why are you so glad that Evgeny Pavlovich is coming? Listen to me, Aglaya, said the prince. I do believe you are nervous lust. I shall make a fool of myself tomorrow at your party. Nervous about you? Aglaya blushed. Why should I be nervous about you? What would it matter to me if you were to make ever such a fool of yourself? How can you say such a thing? What do you mean by making a fool of yourself? What a vulgar expression. I suppose you intend to talk in that sort of way tomorrow evening. Look up a few more such expressions in your dictionary. Do. Yell make a grand effect. I'm sorry that you seem to be able to come into a room as gracefully as you do. Where did you learn the art? Do you think you can drink a cup of tea decently when you know everybody is looking at you on purpose to see how you do it? Yes, I think I can. Can you? I'm sorry for it then, for I should have had a good laugh at you otherwise. Do break something at least in the drawing room. Upset the Chinese face, won't you? It's a valuable one. Do break it. Mama values it, and she'll go out of her mind it was a present. She'll cry before everyone. You'll see. Wave your hand about, you know, as you always do, and just smash it. Sit down near it on purpose. On the contrary, I shall sit as far from it as I can. Thanks for the hint. Ha, ha. Then you are afraid you will wave your arms about. I wouldn't mind betting that you'll talk about some lofty subject, something serious and learned. How delightful, how tactful that will be. I should think it would be very foolish indeed, unless it happened to come inappropriately. Look here, once for all, cried Aglaia, boiling over. If I hear you talking about capital punishment, or the economical condition of Russia, or about beauty redeeming the world, or anything of that sort, ill well, of course I shall laugh and seem very pleased. But I warn you beforehand, don't look me in the face again. I'm serious now, mind, this time I am really serious. She certainly did say this very seriously, so much so that she looked quite different from what she usually was, and the prince could not help noticing the fact. She did not seem to be joking in the slightest degree. Well, you've put me into such a fright that I shall certainly make a fool of myself, and very likely break something too. I wasn't a bit alarmed before, but now I'm as nervous as can be. Then don't speak at all. Sit still and don't talk. Oh, I can't do that, you know. I shall say something foolish out of pure funk, and break something for the same excellent reason. I know I shall. Perhaps I shall slip and fall on the slippery floor. I've done that before now, you know. I shall dream of it all night now. Why did you say anything about it? Aglaia looked blackly at him. Do you know what? I had better not come at all tomorrow. I'll plead sick list and stay away, said the prince with decision. Aglaia stamped her foot and grew quite pale with anger. Oh, my goodness, just listen to that. Better not come when the party is on purpose for him. Good Lord, what a delightful thing it is to have to do with such a such a stupid as you are. Well, I'll come, I'll come, interrupted the prince hastily, and I'll give you my word of honor that I will sit the whole evening and not say a word. I believe that's the best thing you can do. You said you'd plead sick list just now. Where in the world do you get hold of such expressions? Why do you talk to me like this? Are you trying to irritate me, or what? Forgive me, it's a schoolboy expression. I won't do it again. I know quite well. I see it, that you are anxious on my account. Now, don't be angry, and it makes me very happy to see it. You wouldn't believe how frightened I am of misbehaving somehow, and how glad I am of your instructions. But all this panic is simply nonsense, you know, Aglaia. I give you my word it is. I am so pleased that you are such a child, such a dear good child. How charming you can be if you like, Aglaia. Aglaia wanted to be angry, of course, but suddenly some quite unexpected feeling seized upon her heart, all in a moment. And you won't reproach me for all these rude words of mine some day afterwards. She asked, of a sudden, what an idea. Of course not. And what are you blushing for again? And there comes that frown once more. You've taken to looking to gloomy sometimes, Aglaia, much more than you used to. 
I know why it is. Be quiet, do be quiet. No, no, I had much better speak out. I have long wished to say it, and have said it, but that's not enough, for you didn't believe me. Between us to there stands a being who be quiet, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Aglaeus struck in, suddenly, seizing his hand in hers, and gazing at him almost in terror. At this moment she was called by someone. She broke loose from him with an air of relief and ran away. The prince was in a fever all night. It was strange, but he had suffered from fever for several nights in succession. On this particular night, while in semi-delirium, he had an idea. What if on the morrow he were to have a fit before everybody? The thought seemed to freeze his blood within him. All night he fancied himself in some extraordinary society of strange persons. The worst of it was that he was talking nonsense. He knew that he ought not to speak at all, and yet he talked the whole time. He seemed to be trying to persuade them all to something. Evgeny and Hippolyte were among the guests and appeared to be great friends. He awoke towards nine o'clock with a headache, full of confused ideas and strange impressions. For some reason or other he felt most anxious to see Rogojin, to see and talk to him, but what he wished to say he could not tell. Next, he determined to go and see Hippolyte. His mind was in a confused state, so much so that the incidents of the morning seemed to be imperfectly realized, though acutely felt. One of these incidents was a visit from Labadev. Labadev came rather early before ten but he was tipsy already. Though the prince was not in an observant condition, yet he could not avoid seeing that for at least three days ever since General Ivolgin had left the house Labadev had been behaving very badly. He looked untidy and dirty at all times of the day, and it was said that he had begun to rage about in his own house, and that his temper was very bad. As soon as he arrived this morning, he began to hold forth, beating his breast and apparently blaming himself for something. Ivive had a reward for my menacive had a slap in the face, he concluded, tragically. A slap in the face? From whom? And so early in the morning. Early, said Labadev, sarcastically. Time counts for nothing, even in physical chastisement, but my slap in the face was not physical, it was moral. He suddenly took a seat, very unceremoniously, and began his story. It was very disconnected. The prince frowned and wished he could get away, but suddenly a few words struck him. He sat stiff with wonder Labadev said some extraordinary things. In the first place he began about some letter. The name of Aglaya Ivanovna came in. Then suddenly he broke off and began to accuse the prince of something. He was apparently offended with him. At first he declared that the prince had trusted him with his confidences as to a certain person, Nastasia Filipovna, but that of late his friendship had been thrust back into his bosom, and his innocent question as to approaching family changes had been curtly put aside, which Labadev declared, with tipsy tears, he could not bear, especially as he knew so much already both from Rogojin and Nastasia Filipovna and her friend, and from Varvara Adolyanovna and even from Aglaya Ivanovna, through his daughter Vera, and who told Lizabetha Prokofievna something in secret, by latter, who told her all about the movements of a certain person called Nastasia Filipovna, who was the anonymous person, ah, tell me, surely not you, cried the prince, just so, said Labadev, with dignity, and only this very morning I have sent up a letter to the noble lady, stating that I have a matter of great importance to communicate. She received the letter. I know she got it, and she received me, too. Have you just seen Lizabetha Prokofievna? Asked the prince, scarcely believing his ears. Yes, I saw her, and got the said slap in the face, as mentioned. She chucked the letter back to me unopened, and kicked me out of the house, morally, not physically, although not far off it. What letter do you mean she returned unopened? What? Didn't I tell you? Ha, ha, ha. I thought I had. Why, I received a letter, you know, to be handed over from whom, to whom, but it was difficult, if not impossible, to extract anything from Labadev. All the prince could gather was that the letter had been received very early, and had a request written on the outside that it might be sent on to the address given. Just as before, sir, just as before, to a certain person, and from a certain hand. The individual's name who wrote the letter is to be represented by the letter. What? Impossible, to Nastasia Filipovna. Nonsense, cried the prince. 
It was, I assure you, and if not to her then to Rogojin, which is the same thing. Mr. Hippolyte has had letters, too, and all from the individual whose name begins with an A, smirked Labadev with a hideous grin, as he kept jumping from subject to subject and forgetting what he had begun to talk about. The prince said nothing, but waited to give him time. It was all very vague. Who had taken the letters, if letters there were? Probably Verant, how could Labadif have got them? In all probability, he had managed to steal the present letter from Vera, and had himself gone over to Lizabetha Prokofievna with some idea in his head. So the prince concluded at last, You are mad, he cried indignantly. Not quite, esteemed prince, replied Labadif with some acerbity. I confess I thought of doing you the service of handing the letter over to yourself, but I decided that it would pay me better to deliver it up to the noble lady aforesaid, as I had informed her of everything hitherto by anonymous letters. So when I sent her up a note from myself, with the letter, you know, in order to fix a meeting for eight o'clock this morning, I signed it your secret correspondent. They let me in at once every quickly by the back door, and the noble lady received me. Well, go on. Oh, well, when I saw her she almost punched my head, as I say, in fact so nearly that one might almost say she did punch my head. She threw the letter in my face. She seemed to reflect first, as if she would have liked to keep it, but thought better of it and threw it in my face instead. If anybody can have been such a fool as to trust a man like you to deliver the letter, says she, take it and deliver it. Hey, she was grandly indignant. A fierce, fiery lady that, sir, where's the letter now? Oh, I've still got it, here. And he handed the prince the very letter from Aglaia to Gonia, which the letter showed with so much triumph to his sister at a later hour. This letter cannot be allowed to remain in your hands. It's for you, for you. I've brought it you on purpose, cried Labadev excitedly. Why, I'm yours again now, heart and hand, your slave. There was but a momentary pause in the flow of my love and esteem for you. Me culpa, me culpa. As the Pope of Rome says, this letter should be sent on at once, said the prince, disturbed. I'll hand it over myself. Wouldn't it be better, esteemed prince, wouldn't it be better to don't you know Labadev made a strange and very expressive grimace, he twisted about in his chair, and did something, apparently symbolical, with his hands. What do you mean, said the prince, why open it for the time being, don't you know, he said, most confidentially and mysteriously. The prince jumped up so furiously that Labadev ran towards the door, having gained which strategic position. However, he stopped and looked back to see if he might hope for pardon. Oh, Labadev, Labadev, can a man really sink to such depths of meanness? said the prince sadly. Labadev's face brightened. Oh, I'm a mean wretch, a mean wretch, he said, approaching the prince once more and beating his breast with tears in his eyes. It's abominable dishonesty, you know. Dishonesty it is, it is. That's the very word. What in the world induces you to act so? You are nothing but a spy. Why did you write anonymously to worry so noble and generous a lady? Why should not Aglaia Ivanovna write a note to whomever she pleases? What did you mean to complain of today? What did you expect to get by it? What made you go at all? Pure amiable curiosity, I assure you decide to do a service. That's all. Now I'm entirely yours again, your slave. Hang me if you like. Did you go before Lizabetha Prokofievna in your present condition? Inquired the prince. You know, fresh from all the correct card. I only became this like after the humiliation I suffered there. Well thought'll do, now leave me. This injunction had to be repeated several times before the man could be persuaded to move. Even then he turned back at the door, came as far as the middle of the room and there went through his mysterious motions designed to convey the suggestion that the prince should open the letter. He did not dare put his suggestion into words again. After this performance, he smiled sweetly and left the room on tiptoe. All this had been very painful to listen to. One fact stood out certain and clear, and that was that poor Aglaia must be in a state of great distress and indecision and mental torment from jealousy, the prince whispered to himself. Undoubtedly in this inexperienced, but hot and proud little head, there were all sorts of plans forming, wild and impossible plans, maybe, 
and the idea of this so frightened the prince that he could not make up his mind what to do. Something must be done, that was clear. He looked at the address on the letter once more. Oh, he was not in the least degree alarmed about Aglaia writing such a letter. He could trust her. What he did not like about it was that he could not trust Gonia. However, he made up his mind that he would himself take the note and deliver it. Indeed, he went so far as to leave the house and walk up the road, but changed his mind when he had nearly reached Titsin's door. However, he there luckily met Collier and commissioned him to deliver the letter to his brother as if direct from Aglaia. Collier asked no questions but simply delivered it, and Gonia consequently had no suspicion that it had passed through so many hands. Arrived home again, the prince sent for Vera Labadif and told her as much as was necessary in order to relieve her mind, for she had been in a dreadful state of anxiety since she had missed the letter. She heard with horror that her father had taken it. Mushkin learned from her that she had on several occasions performed secret missions both for Aglaia and for Rogojin without, however, having had the slightest idea that in so doing she might injure the prince in any way. The latter, with one thing and another, was now so disturbed and confused that when, a couple of hours or so later, a message came from Collier that the general was ill, he could hardly take the news in. However, when he did master the fact, it acted upon him as a tonic by completely distracting his attention. He went at once to Nina Alexandrovna's, whither the general had been carried, and stayed there until the evening. He could do no good, but there are people whom to have near one is a blasting at such times. Collier was in an almost hysterical state. He cried continuously, but was running about all day, all the same, fetching doctors, of whom he collected three, going to the chemists, and so on. The general was brought round to some extent, but the doctors declared that he could not be said to be out of danger. Varia and Nina Alexandrovna never left the sick man's bad side. Gonia was excited and distrust, but would not go upstairs, and seemed afraid to look at the patient. He wrung his hands when the prince spoke to him, and said that such a misfortune at such a moment was terrible. The prince thought he knew what Gonia meant by such a moment. Hippolyte was not in the house. Labadif turned up late in the afternoon. He had been asleep ever since his interview with the prince in the morning. He was quite sober now and cried with real sincerity over the sick general mourning for him as though he were his own brother. He blamed himself aloud, but did not explain why. He repeated over and over again to Nina Alexandrovna that he alone was to Blamino one else but that he had acted out of pure amiable curiosity and that the deceased as he insisted upon calling the still-living general, had been the greatest of geniuses. He laid much stress on the genius of the sufferer, as if this idea must be one of immense solace in the present crisis. Nina Alexandrovna, seeing his sincerity of feeling said at last, and without the faintest suspicion of reproach in her voice, come, come, don't cry, God will forgive you. Labadif was so impressed by these words, and the tone in which they were spoken, that he could not leave Nina Alexandrovna all the evening in fact, for several days. Till the general's death, indeed, he spent almost all his time at his side. Twice during the day a messenger came to Nina Alexandrovna from the Apenchins to inquire after the invalid. When late in the evening the prince made his appearance in Lizabetha Prokofievna's drawing room, he found it full of guests. Mrs. Appenkin questioned him very fully about the general as soon as he appeared, and when old Princess Bilikonsky wished to know who this general was, and who was Nina Alexandrovna, she proceeded to explain in a manner which pleased the prince very much. He himself, when relating the circumstances of the general's illness to Lizabetha Prokofievna, spoke beautifully, as Aglaia's sisters declared afterwards modestly, quietly, without gestures or to many words, and with great dignity. He had entered the room with propriety and grace, and he was perfectly dressed. He not only did not fall down on the slippery floor, as he had expressed it, but evidently made a very favorable impression upon the assembled guests. As for his own impression on entering the room and taking his seat, he instantly remarked that the company was not in the least such as Aglaia's words had led him to fear, and as he had dreamed over nightmare formal night. This was the first time in his life that he had seen a little corner of what was generally known by the terrible name of society. 
he had long thirsted, for reasons of his own, to penetrate the mysteries of the magic circle, and, therefore, this assemblage was of the greatest possible interest to him. His first impression was one of fascination. Somehow or other he felt that all these people must have been born on purpose to be together. It seemed to him that the Appenchins were not having a party at all, that these people must have been here always, and that he himself was one of them returned among them after a long absence, but one of them, naturally and indisputably. It never struck him that all this refined simplicity and nobility and wit and personal dignity might possibly be no more than an exquisite artistic polish. The majority of the guests were, were somewhat imtiaded. After all, in spite of their aristocratic bearing neither guessed, in their self-satisfied composure, that much of their superiority was mere veneer, which indeed they had adopted unconsciously and by inheritance. The prince would never so much as suspect such a thing in the delight of his first impression. He saw, for instance, that one important dignitary, old enough to be his grandfather, broke off his own conversation in order to listen to him a young and inexperienced man, and not only listened, but seemed to attach value to his opinion, and was kind and amiable, and yet they were strangers and had never seen each other before. Perhaps what most appealed to the prince's impressionability was the refinement of the old man's courtesy towards him. Perhaps the soil of his susceptible nature was really predisposed to receive a pleasant impression. Meanwhile all these pupils are friends of the family and of each other to a certain extent were very far from being such intimate friends of the family and of each other as the prince concluded. There were some present who never would think of considering the Appenchins their equals. There were even some who hated one another cordially. For instance, old Princess Bilikonsky had all her life despised the wife of the dignitary, while the latter was very far from loving Lizabetha Prokofievna. The dignitary himself had been General Appenchin's protector from his youth up, and the general considered him so majestic a personage that he would have felt a hearty contempt for himself if he had even for one moment allowed himself to pose as the great man's equal or to think of him in his fear and reverence sees anything less than an Olympic god. There were others present who had not met for years, and who had no feeling whatever for each other, unless it were dislike, and yet they met tonight as though they had seen each other but yesterday in some friendly and intimate assembly of kindred spirits. It was not a large party, however. Besides Princess Bilikonsky and the old dignitary, who was really a great man, and his wife, there was an old military general a count or baron with a German name, a man reputed to possess great knowledge and administrative ability. He was one of those Olympian administrators who know everything except Russia, pronounce a word of extraordinary wisdom, admired by all, about once in five years, and, after being an eternity in the service, generally die full of honor and riches. Though they have never done anything great, and have even been hostile to all greatness, this general was Ivan Fedorovich's immediate superior in the service, and it pleased the latter to look upon him also as a patron. On the other hand, the great man did not at all consider himself Appenchin's patron. He was always very cool to him, while taking advantage of his ready services, and would instantly have put another in his place if there had been the slightest reason for the change. Another guest was an elderly, important-looking gentleman, a distant relative of Lizabetha Prokofievna's. This gentleman was rich, held a good position, was a great talker, and had the reputation of being one of the dissatisfied, though not belonging to the dangerous sections of that class. He had the manners, to some extent, of the English aristocracy, and some of their tastes, especially in the matter of underdone roast beef, harness, manservants, etc. He was a great friend of the dignitaries, and Lizabetha Prokofievna, for some reason or other, had got hold of the idea that this worthy intended at no distant date to offer the advantages of his hand and heart to Alexandra. Besides the elevated and more solid individuals enumerated, there were present a few younger though not less elegant guests. Besides Prince Ass and Evgeny Pavlovich, we must name the eminent and fascinating Prince Anne. Once the vanquisher of female hearts all over Europe, this gentleman was no longer in the first bloom of youth. He was forty-five, but still very handsome. He was well off, and lived, as a rule, abroad, 
and was noted as a good teller of stories. Then came a few guests belonging to a lower stratum of societal who, like the Apanchins themselves, moved only occasionally in this exalted sphere. The Apanchins liked to draft among their more elevated guests a few picked representatives of this lower stratum, and Lizabatha Prokofievna received much praise for this practice, which proved, her friends said, that she was a woman of tact. The Apanchins prided themselves upon the good opinion people held of them. One of the representatives of the middle class present today was a colonel of engineers, a very serious man and a great friend of Prince Ass, who had introduced him to the Apanchins. He was extremely silent in society and displayed on the forefinger of his right hand a large ring, probably bestowed upon him for services of some sort. There was also a poet, German by name, but a Russian poet, very presentable, and even handsomest sort of man one could bring into society with impunity. This gentleman belonged to a German family of decidedly bourgeois origin, but he had a knack of acquiring the patronage of bigwigs and of retaining their favor. He had translated some great German poem into Russian verse and claimed to have been a friend of a famous Russian poet since dead. It is strange how great a multitude of literary people there are who have had the advantages of friendship with some great man of their own profession who is, unfortunately, dead. The dignitary's wife had introduced this worthy to the Apanchins. This lady posed as the patroness of literary people, and she certainly had succeeded in obtaining pensions for a few of them, thanks to her influence with those in authority on such matters. She was a lady of weight in her own way. Her age was about forty-five, so that she was a very young wife for such an elderly husband as the dignitary. She had been a beauty in her day and still loved, as many ladies of forty-five do love, to dress a little too smartly. Her intellect was nothing to boast of and her literary knowledge very doubtful. Literary patronage was, however, with her as much a mania as was the love of gorgeous clothes. Many books and translations were dedicated to her by her protégés, and a few of these talented individuals had published some of their own letters to her, upon very weighty subjects. This, then, was the society that the prince accepted at once as true coin, as pure gold, without alloy. It so happened, however, that on this particular evening all these good people were in excellent humor and highly pleased with themselves. Every one of them felt that they were doing the Apanchins the greatest possible honor by their presence. But alas, the prince never suspected any such subtleties. For instance, he had no suspicion of the fact that the Apanchins, having in their mind so important a step as the marriage of their daughter, would never think of presuming to take it without having previously shown off the proposed husband to the dignitary the recognized patron of the family. The latter, too, though he would probably have received news of a great disaster to the Appenkin family with perfect composure, would nevertheless have considered it a personal offense if they had dared to marry their daughter without his advice, or we might almost say, his leave. The amiable and undoubtedly witty Prince Anne could not but feel that he was as a sun, risen for one night only to shine upon the Appenkin drawing room. He accounted them immeasurably his inferiors, and it was this feeling which caused his special amiability and delightful ease and grace towards them. He knew very well that he must tell some story this evening for the edification of the company and led up to it with the inspiration of anticipatory triumph. The prince, when he heard the story afterwards, felt that he had never yet come across so wonderful a humorist or such remarkable brilliancy as was shown by this man. And yet if he had only known it, this story was the oldest, stalest, and most worn-out yarn, and every drawing-room in town was sick to death of it. It was only in the innocent Appenkin household that it passed for a new and brilliant telly as a sudden and striking reminiscence of a splendid and talented man. Even the German poet, though as amiable as possible, felt that he was doing the house the greatest of honors by his presence in it. But the prince only looked at the bright side. He did not turn the coat and see the shabby lining. Aglaia had not foreseen that particular calamity. She herself looked wonderfully beautiful this evening. All three sisters were dressed very tastefully, and their hair was done with special care. Aglaia sat next to Evgeny Pavlovich and laughed and talked to him with an unusual display of friendliness. 
Evgeny himself behaved rather more sedately than usual, probably out of respect to the dignitary. Evgeny had been known in society for a long while. He had appeared at the Appenchins today with crepe on his hat, and Princess Bilikonsky had commanded this action on his part. Not every society man would have worn crepe for such an uncle. Lizabatha Prokofievna had liked it also, but was too preoccupied to take much notice. The prince remarked that Aglaya looked attentively at him two or three times and seemed to be satisfied with his behavior. Little by little he became very happy indeed. All his late anxieties and apprehensions, after his conversation with Labadev, now appeared like so many bad dreams impossible and even laughable. He did not speak much, only answering such questions as were put to him, and gradually settled down into unbroken silence, listening to what went on and steeped in perfect satisfaction and contentment. Little by little a sort of inspiration, however, began to stir within him, ready to spring into life at the right moment. When he did begin to speak, it was accidentally, in response to a question, and apparently without any special object. While he feasted his eyes upon Aglaya, as she talked merrily with Evgeny and Prince Anne, suddenly the old Anglomaniac, who was talking to the dignitary in another corner of the room, apparently telling him a story about something or other, suddenly this gentleman pronounced the name of Nikolai Andreevich Pavlahov aloud. The prince quickly turned towards him and listened. The conversation had been on the subject of land and the present disorders, and there must have been something amusing said, for the old man had begun to laugh at his companion's heated expressions. The latter was describing in eloquent words how, in consequence of recent legislation, he was obliged to sell a beautiful estate in the An province, not because he wanted ready money in fact, he was obliged to sell it at half its value. To avoid another lawsuit about the Pevlehof estate, I ran away, he said. With a few more inheritances of that kind I should soon be ruined. At this point General Appenkin, noticing how interested Mushkin had become in the conversation, said to him, in a low tone, that gentleman Ivan Patrovich is a relation of your late friend, Mr. Pavlehov. You wanted to find some of his relations, did you not? The general, who had been talking to his chief up to this moment, had observed the prince's solitude and silence and was anxious to draw him into the conversation and so introduce him again to the notice of some of the important personages. Lov Nikolaevich was a ward of Nikolai Andreevich Pavlehev. After the death of his own parents, he remarked, meeting Ivan Petrovich's eye. Very happy to meet him, I'm sure, remarked the latter. I remember Lov Nikolaevich well. When General Appenkin introduced us just now, I recognized you at once, Prince. You are very little changed, though I saw you last as a child of some ten or eleven years old. There was something in your features, I suppose, that you saw me as a child, exclaimed the Prince with surprise. Oh, yes, long ago, continued Ivan Petrovich, while you were living with my cousin at Zlatovov. You don't remember me. No, I dare say you don't. You had some melody at the time, I remember. It was so serious that I was surprised. No, I remember nothing, said the prince. A few more words of explanation followed, words which were spoken without the smallest excitement by his companion, but which evoked the greatest agitation in the prince, and it was discovered that to old ladies to whose care the prince had been left by Pevlehev, and who lived at Zlatoverhof, were also relations of Ivan Petrovich. The latter had no idea and could give no information as to why Pevlehev had taken so great an interest in the little prince, his ward. In point of fact, I don't think I thought much about it, said the old fellow. He seemed to have a wonderfully good memory. However, for he told the prince all about the two old ladies, Pevlehev's cousins, who had taken care of him, and whom, he declared, he had taken to task for being too severe with the prince as a small sickly boy the elder sister. At least, the younger had been kind, he recollected. They both now lived in another province on a small estate left to them by Pavlehev. The prince listened to all this with eyes sparkling with emotion and delight. He declared with unusual warmth that he would never forgive himself for having travelled about in the central provinces during these last six months without having hunted up his two old friends. He declared, further, that he had intended to go every day, 
but had always been prevented by circumstances, but that now he would promise himself the pleasure however far it was, he would find them out. And so Ivan Petrovich really knew Natalia Nikitishna. What a saintly nature was hers. And Martha Nikitishna. Ivan Petrovich must excuse him, but really he was not quite fair on dear old Martha. She was severe, perhaps, but then what else could she be with such a little idiot as he was then? Ha, ha, he really was an idiot then. Ivan Petrovich must know, though he might not believe it. Ha, ha, so he had really seen him there. Good heavens, and was he really and truly and actually a cousin of Pavlashev's? I assure you of it, laughed Ivan Petrovich, gazing amusedly at the prince. Oh, I didn't say it because I doubt the fact, you know. Ha, ha, how could I doubt such a thing? Ha, ha, ha. I made the remark because because Nikolai Andreevich Pavlahev was such a splendid man, don't you see? Such a high-souled man, he really was, I assure you. The prince did not exactly pend for breath, but he seemed almost to choke out of pure simplicity and goodness of heart, as Adelaide expressed it, on talking the party over with her fiancé, the prince asked. Next morning, but, my goodness me, laughed Ivan Petrovich, why can't I be cousin to even a splendid man? Oh, dear, cried the prince, confused, trying to hurry his words out and growing more and more eager every moment, I've gone and said another stupid thing. I don't know what to say. He didn't mean that. You know I really was such a splendid man, wasn't he? The prince trembled all over. Why was he so agitated? Why had he flown into such transports of delight without any apparent reason? He had far outshot the measure of joy and emotion consistent with the occasion. Why this was it would be difficult to say. He seemed to feel warmly and deeply grateful to someone for something or other perhaps to Ivan Petrovich, but likely enough to all the guests, individually and collectively. He was much too happy. Ivan Petrovich began to stare at him with some surprise. The dignitary, too, looked at him with considerable attention. Princess Bilikonsky glared at him angrily and compressed her lips. Prince N. Evgeny, Prince Ass, and the girls, all broke off their own conversations and listened. Aglaya seemed a little startled, as for Lizabetha Prokofievna, her heart sank within her. This was odd of Lizabetha Prokofievna and her daughters. They had themselves decided that it would be better if the prince did not talk all the evening. Yet seeing him sitting silent and alone, but perfectly happy, they had been on the point of exerting themselves to draw him into one of the groups of talkers around the room. Now that he was in the midst of a talk they became more than ever anxious and perturbed. That he was a splendid man is perfectly true. You are quite right, repeated Ivan Petrovich, but seriously this time. He was a fine and worthy fellow worthy, one may say, of the highest respect. He added, more and more seriously at each pause, and it is agreeable to see, on your part, such wasn't it this same Pavlahev about whom there was a strange story in connection with some abbot. I don't remember who the abbot was, but I remember at one time everybody was talking about it, remarked the old dignitary. He said it, a Jesuit, said Ivan Petrovich. Yes, that's the sort of thing our best men are apt to do. A man of rank, too, and richer man who, if he had continued to serve, might have done anything, and then to throw up the service and everything else in order to go over to Roman Catholicism and turn Jesuit penly almost triumphantly. By Jove, it was positively a mercy that he died when he did it was indeed a very own sad so at the time. The prince was beside himself. Pavlehav. Pavlehav turned Roman Catholic. Impossible, he cried in horror. Hm? Impossible is rather a strong word, said Ivan Petrovich. You must allow, my dear prince. However, of course you value the memory of the deceased so very highly, and he certainly was the kindest of men. To which fact, by the way, I ascribe, more than to anything else, the success of the abbot in influencing his religious convictions. But you may ask me, if you please, how much trouble and worry I, personally, had over the business, and especially with this same Gurit. Would you believe it? He continued, addressing the dignitary. They actually tried to put in a claim under the deceased's will and I had to resort to the very strongest measures in order to bring them to their senses. I assure you they knew their cue. 
did these gentlemen defile. Thank goodness all this was in Moscow, and I got the court, you know, to help me, and we soon brought them to their senses. You wouldn't believe how you have pained and astonished me, cried the prince. Very sorry, but in point of fact, you know, it was all nonsense and would have ended in smoke, as usual I'm sure of that. Last year, he turned to the old man again, Countess K. Join some Roman convent abroad. Our people never seem to be able to offer any resistance so soon as they get into the hands of their St. abroad. That is all thanks to our lassitude, I think, replied the old man, with authority. And then their way of preaching, they have a skillful manner of doing it. And they know how to startle one, too. I got quite a fright myself in 32 in Vienna, I assure you, but I didn't cave into them. I ran away instead. Ha, ha. Come, come, I've always heard that you ran away with the beautiful Countess Levitsky that time throwing up everything in order to do it and not from the Jesuits at all, said Princess Bilikonsky suddenly. Well, yes, but we call it from the Jesuits. You know, it comes to the same thing, left the old fellow, delighted with the pleasant recollection. You seem to be very religious, he continued kindly addressing the prince, which is a thing one meets so seldom nowadays among young people. The prince was listening open-mouthed, and still in a condition of excited agitation. The old man was evidently interested in him, and anxious to study him more closely. Pevlehaf was a man of bright intellect and a good Christian, a sincere Christian, said the prince, suddenly. How could he possibly embrace a faith which is unchristian? Roman Catholicism is, so to speak, Simply the same thing as in Christianity, he added with flashing eyes, which seemed to take in everybody in the room. Come, that's a little too strong, isn't it? murmured the old man, glancing at General Appenkin in surprise. How do you make out that the Roman Catholic religion is in Christian? What is it, then? asked Ivan Patrovich, turning to the prince. It is not a Christian religion, in the first place, said the latter, in extreme agitation quite out of proportion to the necessity of the moment. And in the second place, Roman Catholicism is, in my opinion, worse than atheism itself. Yes, that is my opinion. Atheism only preaches a negation, but Romanism goes further. It preaches a disfigured, distorted Christ. It preaches antichristi, assure you, I swear it. This is my own personal conviction, and it has long distressed me. The Roman Catholic believes that the church on earth cannot stand without universal temporal power. He cries non posumus. In my opinion, the Roman Catholic religion is not a faith at all, but simply a continuation of the Roman Empire, and everything is subordinated to this idea beginning with faith. The Pope has seized territories and an earthly throne, and has held them with the sword. And so the thing has gone on, only that to the sword they have added lying, intrigue, Deceit, fanaticism, superstition, swindling, they have played fast and loose with the most sacred and sincere feelings of man. They have exchanged everything every for money, for base earthly power. And is this not the teaching of Antichrist? How could the upshot of all this be other than atheism? Atheism is the child of Roman Catholicism that proceeded from these Romans themselves, though perhaps they would not believe it. It grew and fattened on hatred of its parents. It is the progeny of their lies and spiritual feebleness. Atheism. In our country it is only among the upper classes that you find unbelievers. Men who have lost the root or spirit of their faith. But abroad whole masses of the people are beginning to profess unbelief at first because of the darkness and lies by which they were surrounded. But now out of fanaticism, out of loathing for the church and Christianity. The prince paused to get breath. He had spoken with extraordinary rapidity and was very pale. All present interchanged glances, but at last the old dignitary burst out laughing frankly. Prince N took out his eyeglass to have a good look at the speaker. The German poet came out of his corner and crept nearer to the table with a spiteful smile. You exaggerate the matter very much, said Ivan Patrovich with rather a bored air. There are, in the foreign churches, many representatives of their faith who are worthy of respect and esteem. Oh, but I did not speak of individual representatives. I was merely talking about Roman Catholicism and its essence of Rome itself. A church can never entirely disappear, 
I never hinted at that. Agreed that all this may be true, but we need not discuss a subject which belongs to the domain of theology. Oh, no, oh, no. Not to theology alone, I assure you. Why? Socialism is the progeny of Romanism and of the Romanistic spirit. It and its brother Athysum proceed from despair in opposition to Catholicism. It seeks to replace in itself the moral power of religion in order to appease the spiritual thirst of parched humanity and save it, not by Christ, but by force. Don't dare to believe in God, don't dare to possess any individuality, any property. Fraternity to la mort, to million hads, by their works ye shall know them we are told. And we must not suppose that all this is harmless and without danger to ourselves. Oh, no, we must resist, and quickly, quickly, we must let our Christ shine forth upon the Western nations, our Christ whom we have preserved intact, and whom they have never known. Not as slaves, allowing ourselves to be caught by the hooks of the Jesuits, but carrying our Russian civilization to them. We must stand before them, not letting it be said among us that their preaching is skillful, as someone expressed it just now. But excuse me, excuse me, cried Ivan Petrovich considerably disturbed, and looking around uneasily. Your ideas are, of course, most praiseworthy, and in the highest degree patriotic, but you exaggerate the matter terribly. It would be better if we dropped the subject. No, sir. I do not exaggerate, I understate the matter, if anything, undoubtedly understate it, simply because I cannot express myself as I should like, but allow me. The prince was silent, he sat straight up in his chair and gazed fervently at Ivan Petrovich. It seems to me that you have been too painfully impressed by the news of what happened to your good benefactor, said the old dignitary, kindly, and with the utmost calmness of demeanor. You are excitable perhaps as the result of your solitary life. If you would make up your mind to live more among your fellows in society, I trust, I'm sure, that the world would be glad to welcome you as a remarkable young man, and you would soon find yourself able to look at things more calmly. You would see that all these things are much simpler than you think, and, besides, these rare cases come about, in my opinion, from ennui and from satiety. Exactly, exactly. That is a true thought, cried the prince, from Anui, from our Anui, but not from satiety. Oh, no, you are wrong there. Say from thirst if you like, the thirst of fever. And please do not suppose that this is so small a matter that we may have a laugh at it and dismiss it. We must be able to foresee our disasters and arm against them. We Russians no sooner arrive at the brink of the water and realize that we are really at the brink then we are so delighted with the outlook that in we plunge and swim to the farthest point we can see. Why is this? You say you are surprised at Pavlishev's action. You ascribe it to madness, to kindness of heart, and what not, but it is not so. Our Russian intensity not only astonishes ourselves, all Europe wonders at our conduct in such cases. For, if one of us goes over to Roman Catholicism, he is sure to become a Jesuit at once, and a rabid one into the bargain. If one of us becomes an atheist, he must needs begin to insist on the prohibition of faith in God by force, that is, by the sword. Why is this? Why does he then exceed all bounds at once? Because he has found land at last, the fatherland that he sought in vain before, and, because his soul is rejoiced to find it, he throws himself upon it and kisses it. Oh, it is not from vanity alone, it is not from feelings of vanity that Russians become atheists and Jesuits, but from spiritual thirst, from anguish of longing for higher things, for dry firm land, for foothold on a fatherland which they never believed in because they never knew it. It is easier for a Russian to become an atheist than for any other nationality in the world. And not only does a Russian become an atheist, but he actually believes in atheism just as though he had found a new faith, not perceiving that he has pinned his faith to a negation. Such is our anguish of thirst. Hosu has no country, has no God. That is not my own expression, it is the expression of a merchant, one of the old believers, whom I once met while traveling. He did not say exactly these words. I think his expression was, Hosu forsakes his country, forsakes his God. But let these thirsty Russian souls find, like Columbus discoverers, a new world. Let them find the Russian world, 
let them search and discover all the gold and treasure that lies hid in the bosom of their own land. Show them the restitution of lost humanity in the future by Russian thought alone and by means of the God and of the Christ of our Russian faith. And you will see how mighty and just and wise and good a giant will rise up before the eyes of the astonished and frightened world. Astonished because they expect nothing but the sword from us, because they think they will get nothing out of us but barbarism. This has been the case up to now, and the longer matters go on as they are now proceeding, the more clear will be the truth of what I say, and I but at this moment something happened which put a most unexpected end to the orator's speech. All this heated tirade, this outflow of passionate words and ecstatic ideas which seemed to hustle and tumble over each other as they fell from his lips, bore evidence of some unusually disturbed mental condition in the young fellow who had boiled over in such a remarkable manner, without any apparent reason, of those who were present, such as knew the prince listened to his outburst in a state of alarm, some with a feeling of mortification. It was so unlike his usual timid self-constraint, so inconsistent with his usual taste and tact, and with his instinctive feeling for the higher proprieties. They could not understand the origin of the outburst. It could not be simply the news of Pavlyshev's perversion. By the ladies the prince was regarded as little better than a lunatic, and Princess Bilikonsky admitted afterwards that in another minute she would have bolted. The two old gentlemen looked quite alarmed. The old general, Apanchin's chief, sat and glared at the prince in severe displeasure. The colonel said immovable. Even the German poet grew a little pale, though he wore his usual artificial smile as he looked around to see what the others would do. In point of fact, it is quite possible that the matter would have ended in a very commonplace and natural way in a few minutes. The undoubtedly astonished, but now more collected, General Appenkin had several times endeavored to interrupt the prince, and not having succeeded, he was now preparing to take firmer and more vigorous measures to attain his end. In another minute or two he would probably have made up his mind to lay the prince quietly out of the room, on the plea of his being ill, and it was more than likely that the general was right in his belief that the prince was actually ill, but it so happened that destiny had something different in store. At the beginning of the evening, when the prince first came into the room, he had set down as far as possible from the Chinese vase which Aglaia had spoken of the day before. Will it be believed that, after Aglaia's alarming words, an ineradicable conviction had taken possession of his mind that, however he might try to avoid this face next day, he must certainly break it. But so it was. During the evening other impressions began to awaken in his mind, as we have seen, and he forgot his presentiment. But when Pavlohev was mentioned and the general introduced him to Ivan Patrovich, he had changed his place and went over nearer to the table. When? It so happened, he took the chair nearest to the beautiful vase, which stood on a pedestal behind him, just about on a level with his elbow. As he spoke his last words he had risen suddenly from his seat with a wave of his arm, and there was a general cry of horror. The huge vase swayed backwards and forwards, it seemed to be uncertain whether or no to topple over onto the head of one of the old men, but eventually determined to go the other way, and came crashing over towards the German poet who darted out of the way in terror. The crash, the cry, the sight of the fragments of valuable china covering the carpet, the alarm of the company were at all this meant to the poor prince it would be difficult to convey to the mind of the reader, or for him to imagine. But one very curious fact was that all the shame and vexation and mortification which he felt over the accident were less powerful than the deep impression of the almost supernatural truth of his premonition. He stood still in alarm and almost superstitious alarm for a moment, then all mists seemed to clear away from his eyes. He was conscious of nothing but light and joy and ecstasy. His breath came and went, but the moment passed. Thank God it was not that. He drew a long breath and looked around. For some minutes he did not seem to comprehend the excitement around him. That is, he comprehended it and saw everything, but he stood aside, as it were like someone invisible in a fairy tale, as though he had nothing to do with what was going on, though it pleased him to take an interest in it. He saw them gather up the broken bits of china, he heard the loud talking of the guests and observed how pale Aglaia looked, and how very strangely she was gazing at him. There was no hatred in her expression, and no anger whatever. 
It was full of alarm for him and sympathy and affection while she looked around at the others with flashing, angry eyes. His heart filled with a sweet pain as he gazed at her. At length he observed, to his amazement, that all had taken their seats again and were laughing and talking as though nothing had happened. Another minute and the laughter grew louder they were laughing at him, at his dumb stupor loin kindly and merrily. Several of them spoke to him and spoke so kindly and cordially, especially Lizabetha Prokofievnosh was saying the kindest possible things to him. Suddenly he became aware that General Apenkin was tapping him on the shoulder. Ivan Petrovich was laughing too, but still more kind and sympathizing was the old dignitary. He took the prince by the hand and pressed it warmly. Then he patted it and quietly urged him to recollect himself speaking to him exactly as he would have spoken to a little frightened child, which pleased the prince wonderfully, and next seated him beside himself. The prince gazed into his face with pleasure, but still seemed to have no power to speak. His breath failed him. The old man's face pleased him greatly. Do you really forgive me? He said at last. And and Elizabeth Prokofievna too. The laugh increased tears came into the prince's eyes, he could not believe in all this kindness was enchanted. The vase certainly was a very beautiful one. I remember it here for fifteen years, he's quite that, remarked Ivan Petrovich. Oh, what a dreadful calamity, a wretched vase smashed, and a man half dead with remorse about it, said Lizabetha Prokofievna, loudly. What made you so dreadfully startled, Lev Nikolaevich? She added, a little timidly. Come, my dear boy, cheer up. You really alarm me, taking the accident so to heart. Do you forgive me a lol? Besides the vase, I mean, said the prince, rising from his seat once more. But the old gentleman caught his hand and drew him down again. He seemed unwilling to let him go. Ses trs curio at ses trs sru, he whispered across the table to Ivan Petrovich rather loudly. Probably the prince heard him, so that I have not offended any of you. You will not believe how happy I am to be able to think so. It is as it should be, as if I could offend anyone here. I should offend you again by even suggesting such a thing. Calm yourself, my dear fellow. You are exaggerating again. You really have no occasion to be so grateful to us. It is a feeling which does you great credit, but an exaggeration for all that. I am not exactly thanking you. I am only feeling a growing admiration for you. It makes me happy to look at you. I dare say I am speaking very foolishly, but I must speak he must explain, if it be out of nothing better than self-respect. All he said and did was abrupt, confused, feverish free lightly the words he spoke, as often as not, were not those he wished to say. He seemed to inquire whether he might speak. His eyes lighted on Princess Bilikonsky. All right, my friend, talk away, talk away, she remarked. Only don't lose your breath, you were in such a hurry when you began, and look what you've come to now. Don't be afraid of speaking all these ladies, and gentlemen have seen far stranger people than yourself, you don't astonish them. You are nothing out of the way remarkable, you know. You've done nothing but break a vase and give us all a fright. The prince listened, smiling. Wasn't it you, he said, suddenly turning to the old gentleman who saved the student Porkinov and a clerk called Shobrin from being sent to Siberia two or three months since. The old dignitary blushed a little and murmured that the prince had better not excite himself further. And I have heard of you, continued the prince, addressing Ivan Petrovich, that when some of your villagers were burned out you gave them wood to build up their houses again, though they were no longer your serfs and had behaved badly towards you. Oh, come, come. You are exaggerating, said Ivan Petrovich, beaming with satisfaction, all the same. He was right, however, in this instance, for the report had reached the prince's ears in an incorrect form. And you, princess, he went on, addressing Princess Bilikonsky, was it not you who received me in Moscow, six months since, as kindly as though I had been your own son, in response to a letter from Lizabetha Prokofievna, and gave me one piece of advice? Again as to your own son, which I shall never forget. Do you remember? What are you making such a fuss about? Said the old lady, with annoyance. You are a good fellow, but very silly. One gives you a halfpenny, and you are as grateful as though one had saved your life. You think this is praiseworthy on your part, 
but it is noted is not, indeed. She seemed to be very angry, but suddenly burst out laughing, quite good-humouredly. Lizabetha Prokofievna's face brightened up, too, so did that of General Apenkin. I told you Lef Nikolaevich was a monomanif only he would not be in such a hurry, as the princess remarked, said the latter, with delight. Aglaya alone seemed sad and depressed. Her face was flushed, perhaps with indignation. He really is very charming, whispered the old dignitary to Ivan Patrovich. I came into this room with anguish in my heart, continued the prince, with ever-growing agitation, speaking quicker and quicker, and with increasing strangeness. He was afraid of you all, and afraid of myself. I was most afraid of myself. When I returned to Petersburg, I promised myself to make a point of seeing our greatest man and members of our oldest familias, the old families like my own. I am now among princes like myself, am I not? I wished to know you, and it was necessary, very, very necessary. I had always heard so much that was evil said of you all more evil than good, as to how small and petty were your interests, how absurd your habits, how shallow your education, and so on. There is so much written and said about you. I came here today with anxious curiosity. I wish to see for myself and form my own convictions as to whether it were true that the whole of this upper stratum of Russian society is worthless, has outlived its time, has existed too long, and is only fit to die and yet is dying with patty, spiteful warring against that which is destined to supersede it and take its place hindering the coming man, and knowing not that itself is in a dying condition. I did not fully believe in this view even before, for there never was such a class among you excepting perhaps at court, by accident or by uniform, but now there is not even that, is there? It has vanished, has it not? No, not a bit of it, said Ivan Patrovich, with a sarcastic laugh. Good Lord, has off again, said Princess Bilikonsky, impatiently. Lazay la dire, he is trembling all over, said the old man, in a warning whisper. The prince certainly was beside himself. Well, what have I seen? He continued. I have seen man of graceful simplicity of intellect. I have seen an old man who is not above speaking kindly and even listening to a boy like myself. I see before me persons who can understand, who can forgive a kind, good Russian hearts hearts almost as kind and cordial as I met abroad. Imagine how delighted I must have been and how surprised. Oh, let me express this feeling. I have so often heard, and I have even believed, that in society there was nothing but empty forms, and that reality had vanished. But I now see for myself that this can never be the case here. Among you it may be the order elsewhere, but not in Russia. Surely you are not all Jesuits and deceivers. I heard Prince An ask story just now. Was it not simple-minded, spontaneous humor? Could such words come from the lips of a man who is dead, a man whose heart and talents are dried up? Could dead man and women have treated me so kindly as you have all been treating me today? Is there not material for the future in all this for hope? Can such people fail to understand? Can such man fall away from reality? Once more let us beg you to be calm, my dear boy. Well talk of all this another to me shall do so with the greatest pleasure. For one, said the old dignitary, with a smile. Ivan Petrovich grunted and twisted round in his chair. General Apenkin moved nervously. The latter's chief had started a conversation with the wife of the dignitary, and took no notice whatever of the prince, but the old lady very often glanced at him, and listened to what he was saying. No, I had better speak, continued the prince, with a new outburst of feverish emotion, and turning towards the old man with an air of confidential trustfulness. Yesterday, Aglaya Ivanovna forbade me to talk, and even specified the particular subjects I must not touch upon she knows well enough that I am odd when I get upon these matters. I am nearly twenty-seven years old, and yet I know I am little better than a child. I have no right to express my ideas, and said so long ago. Only in Moscow, with Rogojin, did I ever speak absolutely freely. He and I read Pushkin together all his works. Rogojin knew nothing of Pushkin, had not even heard his name. I am always afraid of spoiling a great thought or idea by my absurd manner. I have no eloquence, I know. I always make the wrong gesture as an appropriate gesture and therefore I degrade the thought 
and raise a luff instead of doing my subject justice. I have no sense of proportion either, and that is the chief thing. I know it would be much better if I were always to sit still and say nothing. When I do so, I appear to be quite a sensible sort of a person, and what's more, I think about things. But now I must speak, it is better that I should. I began to speak because you looked so kindly at me, you have such a beautiful face. I promised Aglaya Ivanovna yesterday that I would not speak all the evening. Really, said the old man, smiling. But, at times, I can't help thinking that I'm wrong in feeling so about it, you know. Sincerity is more important than allocution, isn't it? Sometimes, I want to explain all to you everything in givery. I know you think me utopian, don't you an idealist? Oh, no, I'm not. Indeed me ideas are all so simple. You don't believe me. You are smiling. Do you know, I am sometimes very wicked for I lose my faith. This evening as I came here, I thought to myself, what shall I talk about? How am I to begin, so that they may be able to understand partially, at all events? How afraid I was dreadfully afraid. And yet, how could I be afraid was it not shameful of me? Was I afraid of finding a bottomless abyss of empty selfishness? Oh, that's why I am so happy at this moment. Because I find there is no bottomless abyss at all but good, healthy material, full of life. It is not such a very dreadful circumstance that we are people, is it? For we really are odd, you know careless, reckless, easily wearied of anything. We don't look thoroughly into matters don't care to understand things. We are all like the see you and I, and all of them. Why, here are you, no you are not a bit angry with me for calling you odd, are you? And, if so, surely there is good material in you. Do you know, I sometimes think it is a good thing to be odd. We can forgive one another more easily, and be more humble. No one can begin by being perfecter as much one cannot understand in life at first. In order to attain to perfection, one must begin by failing to understand much. And if we take in knowledge too quickly, we very likely are not taking it in at all. I say all this to you, you who by this time understand so much and doubtless have failed to understand so much. Also, I am not afraid of you any longer. You are not angry that a mere boy should say such words to you, are you? Of course not. You know how to forget and to forgive. You are laughing, Ivan Petrovich. You think I am a champion of other classes of people that I am their advocate, a democrat, and an orator of equality. The prince laughed hysterically. He had several times burst into these little, short nervous laughs. Oh, no it is for you, for myself, and for all of us together, that I am alarmed. I am a prince of an old family myself, and I am sitting among my peers, and I am talking like this in the hope of saving us all, in the hope that our class will not disappear altogether into the darkness and guessing its danger blaming everything around it, and losing ground every day. Why should we disappear and give place to others, when we may still, if we choose, remain in the front rank and let the battle? Let us be servants, that we may become lords in due season. He tried to get upon his feet again, but the old man still restrained him, gazing at him with increasing perturbation as he went on. Listini, no, it is best not to speak. It is best simply to give a good example, simply to begin the work. I have done, Thesi have begun, and endo. Can anyone be unhappy? Really? Oh, what does grief matter? What does misfortune matter? If one knows how to be happy. Do you know? I cannot understand how anyone can pass by a green tree and not feel happy only to look at it. How anyone can talk to a man and not feel happy in loving him. Oh, it is my own fault that I cannot express myself well enough. But there are lovely things at every step I take things which even the most miserable man must recognize as beautiful. Look at a little child, look at God's day, don't look at the grass growing, look at the eyes that love you as they gaze back into your eyes. He had risen and was speaking standing up. The old gentleman was looking at him now in unconcealed alarm. Lizabetha Prokofievna wrung her hands. Oh, my God, she cried. She had guessed the state of the case before anyone else. Aglaya rushed quickly up to him and was just in time to receive him in her arms and to hear with dread and horror that awful, wild cry as he fell writhing to the ground. There he lay on the carpet, and someone quickly placed a cushion under his head. No one had expected this. In a quarter of an hour or so Prince Anne, 
and Evgeny Pavlovich and the old dignitary were hard at work endeavouring to restore the harmony of the evening, but it was of no avail, and very soon after the guests separated and went their ways. A great deal of sympathy was expressed, a considerable amount of advice was volunteered. Ivan Petrovich expressed his opinion that the young man was a slevophile, or something of that sort, but that it was not a dangerous development. The old dignitary said nothing. True enough, most of the guests, next day and the day after, were not in very good humor. Ivan Petrovich was a little offended, but not seriously so. General Apanchin's chief was rather cool towards him for some while after the occurrence. The old dignitary, as patron of the family, took the opportunity of murmuring some kind of admonition to the general, and added, in flattering terms, that he was most interested in Aglaia's future. He was a man who really did possess a kind heart, although his interest in the prince, in the earlier part of the evening, was due, among other reasons, to the letter's connection with Nastasia Filipovna, according to popular report. He had heard a good deal of this story here and there, and was greatly interested in it, so much so that he longed to ask further questions about it. Princess Bilikonsky, as she drove away on this eventful evening, took occasion to say to Lizabatha Prokofievna, well, that's a good match and a bad one, and if you want my opinion, more bad than good. You can see for yourself the man is an invalid. Lizabatha therefore decided that the prince was impossible as a husband for Aglaia, and during the ensuing night she made a vow that never while she lived should he marry Aglaia. With this resolve firmly impressed upon her mind, she awoke next day, but during the morning, after her early lunch, she fell into a condition of remarkable inconsistency. In reply to a very guarded question of her sister's, Aglaia had answered coldly, but exceedingly haughtily, I have never given him my word at all, nor have I ever counted him as my future husband Eva in my life. He is just as little to me as all the rest. Lizabatha Prokofievna suddenly flared up. I did not expect that of you, Aglaia, she said. He is an impossible husband for you. I know it, and thank God that we agree upon that point, but I did not expect to hear such words from you. I thought I should hear a very different tone from you. I would have turned out everyone who was in the room last night and capped him. That's the sort of man he is, in my opinion. Here she suddenly paused, afraid of what she had just said. But she little knew how unfair she was to her daughter at that moment. It was all settled in Aglaia's mind. She was only waiting for the hour that would bring the matter to a final climax, and every hint, every careless probing of her wound, did but further lacerate her heart. This same morning dawned for the prince pregnant with no less painful presentiments, which fact his physical state was, of course, quite enough to account for, but he was so indefinably melancholy, his sadness could not attach itself to anything in particular, and this tormented him more than anything else. Of course certain facts stood before him, clear and painful, but his sadness went beyond all that he could remember or imagine. He realized that he was powerless to console himself unaided. Little by little he began to develop the expectation that this day something important, something decisive, was to happen to him. His attack of yesterday had been a slight one, accepting some little heaviness in the head and pain in the limbs. He did not feel any particular effects. His brain worked all right, though his soul was heavy within him. He rose late, and immediately upon waking remembered all about the previous evening. He also remembered, though not quite so clearly, how, half an hour after his fit, he had been carried home. He soon heard that a messenger from the Apanchins had already been to inquire after him. At half past eleven another arrived, and this pleased him. Vera Labadev was one of the first to come to see him and offer her services. No sooner did she catch sight of him than she burst into tears, but when he tried to soothe her she began to laugh. He was quite struck by the girl's deep sympathy for him. He seized her hand and kissed it. Vera flushed crimson. Oh, don't, don't, she exclaimed in alarm, snatching her hand away. She went hastily out of the room in a state of strange confusion. Labadev also came to see the prince, in a great hurry to get away to the deceased, as he called General Ivolgin, who was alive still, but very ill. Kolya also turned up, and begged the prince for pity's sake to tell him all he knew about his father which had been concealed from him till now. 
He said he had found out nearly everything since yesterday. The poor boy was in a state of deep affliction. With all the sympathy which he could bring into play, the prince told Collier the whole story without reserve, detailing the facts as clearly as he could. The tale struck Collier like a thunderbolt. He could not speak. He listened silently and cried softly to himself the while. The prince perceived that this was an impression which would last for the whole of the boy's life. He made haste to explain his view of the matter and pointed out that the old man's approaching death was probably brought on by horror at the thought of his action and that it was not everyone who was capable of such a feeling. Collier's eyes flashed as he listened. Gonia and Varia and Titsin are a worthless lot. I shall not quarrel with them, but from this moment our feet shall not travel the same road. Oh, Prince, I have felt much that is quite new to me since yesterday. It is a lesson for me. I shall now consider my mother as entirely my responsibility, though she may be safe enough with Varia. Still, meat and drink is not everything. He jumped up and hurried off, remembering suddenly that he was wanted at his father's bedside. But before he went out of the room, he inquired hastily after the prince's health, and receiving the latter's reply, added, Isn't there something else, prince? I heard yesterday, but I've no right to talk about this. If you ever want a true friend and servant, neither you nor I are so very happy, are we? Come to me. I won't ask you questions, though. He ran off and left the prince more dejected than ever. Everyone seemed to be speaking prophetically, hinting at some misfortune or sorrow to come. They had all looked at him as though they knew something which he did not know. Labadif had asked questions, Collier had hinted, and Vara had shed tears. What was it? At last, with a sigh of annoyance, he said to himself that it was nothing but his own cursed sickly suspicion. His face lighted up with joy when, at about two o'clock, he asked the Appenchins coming along to pay him a short visit, just for a minute. They really had only come for a minute. Lizabatha Prokofievna had announced, directly after lunch, that they would all take a walk together. The information was given in the form of a command, without explanation, dryly and abruptly. All had issued forth in obedience to the mandate, that is, the girls, Mama, and Princess. Lizabatha Prokofievna went off in a direction exactly contrary to the usual one, and all understood very well what she was driving at, but held their peace, fearing to irritate the good lady. She, as though anxious to avoid any conversation, walked ahead, silent and alone. At last Adelaida remarked that it was no use racing along at such a pace, and that she could not keep up with her mother. Look here, said Lizabetha Prokofievna, turning round suddenly, we are passing his house. Whatever Aglaia may think, and in spite of anything that may happen, he is not a stranger to us, besides which, he is ill and in misfortune. I, for one, shall call in and see him. Let anyone follow me who cares to. Of course every one of them followed her. The prince hastened to apologize, very properly, for yesterday's mishap with the vase, and for the scene generally. Oh, that's nothing, replied Lizabetha. I'm not sorry for the vase, I'm sorry for you. Hm? So you can see that there was a scene, can you? Well, it doesn't matter much, for everyone must realize now that it is impossible to be hard on you. Well, au revoir, I advise you to have a walk, and then go to sleep again if you can. Come in as usual, if you feel inclined, and be assured, once for all, whatever happens, and whatever may have happened, you shall always remain the friend of the family mine, at all events. I can answer for myself. In response to this challenge, all the others chimed in and re-echoed Mama's sentiments. And so they took their departure, but in this hasty and kindly designed visit there was hidden a fund of cruelty which Lizabetha Prokofievna never dreamed of. In the words, as usual, and again in her added, mine, at all events, there seemed an ominous knell of some evil to come. The prince began to think of Aglaia. She had certainly given him a wonderful smile, both at coming and again at leave-taking but had not said a word, not even when the others all professed their friendship for him. She had looked very intently at him, but that was all. Her face had been paler than usual, she looked as though she had slapped badly. The prince made up his mind that he would make a point of going there as usual, tonight, and looked feverishly at his watch. Vera came in three minutes after the Appenchins had left. 
Lef Nikolaevich, she said, Aglaya Ivanovna has just given me a message for you. The prince trembled. Is it a note? No, a verbal message. She had hardly time even for that. She begs you earnestly not to go out of the house for a single moment all today until seven o'clock in the evening. It may have been nine. I didn't quite hear. But, but, why is this? What does it mean? I don't know at all, but she said I was to tell you particularly. Did she say that? Not those very words. She only just had time to whisper as she went by, but by the way she looked at me I knew it was important. She looked at me in a way that made my heart stop beating. The prince asked a few more questions, and though he learned nothing else, he became more and more agitated. Laughed alone, he laid down on the sofa and began to think. Perhaps, he thought, someone is to be with them until nine tonight and she is afraid that I may come and make a fool of myself again, in public. So he spent his time longing for the evening and looking at his watch. But the clearing up of the mystery came long before the evening, and came in the form of a new and agonizing riddle. Half an hour after the Appenchins had gone, Hippolyte arrived, so tired that, almost unconscious, he sank into a chair and broke into such a fit of coughing that he could not stop. He coughed till the blood came. His eyes glittered, and to red spots on his cheeks grew brighter and brighter. The prince murmured something to him, but Hippolyte only signed that he must be left alone for a while and sat silent. At last he came to himself. I am off, he said, hoarsely and with difficulty. Shall I see you home? Asked the prince, rising from his seat, but suddenly stopping short as he remembered Aglaia's prohibition against leaving the house. Hippolyte laughed. I don't mean that I'm going to leave your house, he continued, still gasping and coughing. On the contrary, I thought it absolutely necessary to come and see you, otherwise I should not have troubled you. I am off there, you know, and this time I believe, seriously, that I am off. It's all over. I did not come here for sympathy, believe me. I lay down this morning at ten o'clock with the intention of not rising again before that time, but I thought it over and rose just once more in order to come here, from which you may deduce that I had some reason for wishing to come. It grieves me to see you so, Hippolyte. Why didn't you send me a message? I would have come up and saved you this trouble. Well, well, enough. You've pitied me, and that's all that good manners exact. I forgot. How are you? I'm all right. Yesterday I was a little I know. I heard. The china vase caught it. I'm sorry I wasn't there. I've come about something important. In the first place I had the pleasure of seeing Gavrila Dalianovich and Aglaya Ivanovna enjoying a rendezvous on the green bench in the park. I was astonished to see what a fool a man can look. I remarked upon the fact to Aglaya Ivanovna when he had gone. I don't think anything ever surprises you, prince, added Hippolyte, gazing incredulously at the prince's calm demeanor. To be astonished by nothing is a sign, they say, of a great intellect. In my opinion it would serve equally well as a sign of great foolishness. I am not hinting about you, pardon me. I am very unfortunate today in my expressions. I knew yesterday that Gavrila Ardalianovich began the prince and paused in evident confusion, though Hippolyte had shown annoyance at his betraying no surprise. You knew it, come, that's news, but no perhaps better not tell me. And were you a witness of the meeting? If you were there yourself you must have known that I was not there. Oh, but you may have been sitting behind the bushes somewhere. However, I am very glad, on your account, of course. I was beginning to be afraid that Mr. Genia might have the preference. May I ask you, Hippolyte, not to talk of this subject, and not to use such expressions, especially as you know all. Uh, you are wrong. I know scarcely anything, and Aglaya Ivanovna is aware that I know nothing. I knew nothing whatever about this meeting. You say there was a meeting. Very well. Let's leave it so why. What do you mean? You said you knew, and now suddenly you know nothing. You say very well. Let's leave it so. But I say, don't be so confiding, especially as you know nothing. You are confiding simply because you know nothing. But do you know what these good people have in their minds, Igania and his sister? Perhaps you are suspicious. Well, well, you'll drop the subject, he added, hastily, observing the prince's impatient gesture. But I've come to you on my own business. I wish to make you a clear explanation. 
What a nuisance it is that one cannot die without explanations. I have made such a quantity of them already. Do you wish to hear what I have to say? Speak away. I am listening. Very well, but I'll change my mind and begin about Gonia. Just fancy to begin with, if you can, that I, too, was given an appointment at the green bench today. However, I won't deceive you. I asked for the appointment. I said I had a secret to disclose. I don't know whether I came there too early. I think I must have, but scarcely had I sat down beside Aglaya Ivanovna than I saw Gavrila Ardalianovich and his sister Varya coming along, arm in arm, just as though they were enjoying a morning walk together. Both of them seemed very much astonished, not to say disturbed, at seeing me. They evidently had not expected the pleasure. Aglaya Ivanovna blushed up and was actually a little confused. I don't know whether it was merely because I was there, or whether Gania's beauty was too much for her. But anyway, she turned crimson and then finished up the business in a very funny manner. She jumped up from her seat, bowed back to Gonia, smiled to Varya, and suddenly observed, I only came here to express my gratitude for all your kind wishes on my behalf, and to say that if I find I need your services, believe me. Here she bowed them away, as it were, and they both marched off again, looking very foolish. Gonia evidently could not make a nor tale of the matter, and turned as red as a lobster, but Varya understood at once that they must get away as quickly as they could, so she dragged Gonia away. She is a great deal cleverer than he is. As for myself, I went there to arrange a meeting to be held between Aglaya Ivanovna and Nastasia Filipovna. Nastasia Filipovna, cried the prince, aha. I think you are growing less cool, my friend, and are beginning to be a trifle surprised, aren't you? I'm glad that you are not above ordinary human feelings, for once. I'll console you a little now, after your consternation. See what I get for serving a young and high-souled maiden. This morning I received a slap in the face from the lady. A a moral one, asked the prince involuntarily. Yes, not a physical one. I don't suppose anyone even a woman would raise a hand against me now. Even Gonia would hesitate. I did think at one time yesterday that he would fly at me, though. I bet anything that I know what you are thinking of now. You are thinking, of course, one can't strike the little wretch, but one could suffocate him with a pillow or a wet towel when he is asleep. One ought to get rid of him somehow. I can see in your face that you are thinking that at this very second. I never thought of such a thing for a moment, said the prince with disgust. I don't know he dreamed last night that I was being suffocated with the wet cloth by some abody. I'll tell you who it was, Rogojin. What do you think? Can a man be suffocated with a wet cloth? I don't know. I've heard so. Well, well, leave that question just now. Why am I a scandalmonger? Why did she call me a scandalmonger? And mind, after she had heard every word I had to tell her, and had asked all sorts of questions besides but such is the way of women. For her sake I entered into relations with Rogojin, an interesting man. At her request I arranged a personal interview between herself and Nastasia Filipovna. Could she have been angry because I hinted that she was enjoying Nastasia Filipovna's leavings? Why, I have been impressing it upon her all this while for her own good. To letters have I written her in that strain, and I began straight off today about its being humiliating for her. Besides, the word leavings is not my invention. At all events, they all used it at Gania's, and she used it herself. So why am I a scandalmonger? I see see you are tremendously amused at this moment. Probably you are laughing at me and fitting those silly lines to my case may be said love upon his setting smiles, and with vain hopes his farewell are beguiles. Ha, ha, ha. Hippolyte suddenly burst into a fit of hysterical laughter, which turned into a choking cough. Observe, he gasped, through his coughing, what a fellow Gonia is. He talks about Nastasia's leavings, but what does he want to take himself? The prince sat silent for a long while. His mind was filled with dread and horror. You spoke of a meeting with Nastasia Filipovna, he said at last, in a low voice. Oh, Comb. Surely you must know that there is to be a meeting today between Nastasia and Aglaya Ivanovna, and that Nastasia has been sent for on purpose, through Rogojin from St. Petersburg. It has been brought about by invitation of Aglaya Ivanovna and my own efforts. And Nastasia is at this moment with Rogojin. 
Not far from her eat Dana Alexeyevna's curious friend of hers, and to this questionable house Aglaya Ivanovna is to proceed for a friendly chat with Nastasia Filipovna, and for the settlement of several problems. They're going to play at arithmetic, didn't you know about it? Word of honor. It's a most improbable story. Oh, very well. If it's improbably tis, that's all. And yet where should you have heard it? Though I must say, if a fly crosses the room, it's known all over the place here. However, I've warned you, and you may be grateful to me. Well, au revoir probably in the next world. One more thing didn't think that I'm telling you all this for your sake. Oh, dear, no. Do you know that I dedicated my confession to Aglaya Ivanovna? I did though, and how she took it, ha ha. Oh, no, I am not acting from any high, exalted motives. But though I may have behaved like a kid to you, I have not done her any harm. I don't apologize for my words about leavings and all that. I am atoning for that, you see, by telling you the place and time of the meeting. Goodbye. You had better take your measures, if you are worthy the name of a man. The meeting is fixed for this evening, that's certain. Hippolyte walked towards the door, but the prince called him back and he stopped. Then you think Aglaya Ivanovna herself intends to go to Nastasia Filipovna's tonight? He asked, and bright hectic spots came out on his cheeks and forehead. I don't know absolutely for certain, but in all probability it is so, replied Hippolyte, looking round. Nastasia would hardly go to her, and they can't meet at Ganius with a man nearly dead in the house. It's impossible, for that very reason, said the prince. How would she get out if she wished to? You don't know the habits of that house -ish could not get away alone to Nastasia Filipovna's. It's all nonsense. Look here, my dear prince, no one jumps out of the window if they can help it, but when there's a fire, the dandiest gentleman or the finest lady in the world will skip out. When the moment comes, and there's nothing else to be done or young lady will go to Nastasia Filipovna's. Don't they let the young ladies out of the house alone, then? I didn't mean that exactly. If you didn't mean that, then she has only to go down the steps and walk off, and she need never come back unless she chooses. Ships are burned behind one sometimes, and one doesn't care to return whence one came. Life need not consist only of lunches, and dinners, and prince ass. It strikes me you take Aglaya Ivanovna for some conventional boarding school girl. I said so to her and she quite agreed with me. Wait till seven or eight o'clock. In your place I would send someone there to keep watch, so as to seize the exact moment when she steps out of the house. Send Kolya. He'll play the spy with pleasure for you at least. Ha, ha, ha. Hippolyte went out. There was no reason for the prince to set anyone to watch, even if he had been capable of such a thing. Aglaya's command that he should stay at home all day seemed almost explained now. Perhaps she meant to call for him, herself, or it might be, of course, that she was anxious to make sure of his not coming there, and therefore bade him remain at home. His head whirled, the whole room seemed to be turning round. He lay down on the sofa and closed his eyes. One way or the other the question was to be decided at last finally. Oh, no, he did not think of Aglaya as a boarding school miss or a young lady of the conventional type. He had long since feared that she might take some such step as this. But why did she wish to see Nastasia? He shivered all over as he lay. He was in high fever again. No, he did not account her a child. Certain of her looks, certain of her words, of late, had filled him with apprehension. At times it had struck him that she was putting to greater restraint upon herself, and he remembered that he had been alarmed to observe this. He had tried, all these days, to drive away the heavy thoughts that oppressed him, but what was the hidden mystery of that soul? The question had long tormented him, although he implicitly trusted that soul, and now it was all to be cleared up. It was a dreadful thought, and that woman again. Why did he always feel as though that woman were fated to appear at each critical moment of his life, and tear the thread of his destiny like a bit of rotten string? That he always had felt this he was ready to swear, although he was half delirious at the moment. If he had tried to forget her, all this time, it was simply because he was afraid of her. Did he love the woman or hate her? This question he did not once ask himself today. His heart was quite pure. He knew whom he loved. He was not so much afraid of this meeting, nor of its strangeness, nor of any reasons there might be for it, unknown to himself. 
he was afraid of the woman herself, Nastasia Filipovna. He remembered, some days afterwards, how during all those fevered hours he had seen but her eyes, her look, had heard her voice, strange words of hers. He remembered that this was so, although he could not recollect the details of his thoughts. He could remember that Vera brought him some dinner, and that he took it, but whether he slept after dinner, or no, he could not recollect. He only knew that he began to distinguish things clearly from the moment when Aglaia suddenly appeared, and he jumped up from the sofa and went to meet her. It was just a quarter past seven then. Aglaia was quite alone, and dressed, apparently hastily, in a light mantle. Her face was pale, as it had been in the morning, and her eyes were ablaze with bright but subdued fire. He had never seen that expression in her eyes before. She gazed attentively at him. You are quite ready, I observe, she said, with absolute composure, dressed, and your hat in your hand. I see somebody has thought fit to warn you, and I know who. Hippolyte. Yes, he told me, said the prince, feeling only half alive. Come then, you know, I suppose, that you must escort me there. You are well enough to go out, aren't you? I am well enough, but is it really possible? He broke off abruptly, and could not add another word. This was his one attempt to stop the mad child, and, after he had made it, he followed her as though he had no will of his own. Confused as his thoughts were, he was, nevertheless, capable of realizing the fact that if he did not go with her, she would go alone, and so he must go with her at all hazards. He guessed the strength of her determination. It was beyond him to check it. They walked silently, and said scarcely a word all the way. He only noticed that she seemed to know the road very well. And once, when he thought it better to go by a certain lane, and remarked to her that it would be quieter and less public, she only said, it's all the same, and went on. When they were almost arrived at Daria Alexiana's house, it was a large wooden structure of ancient date, a gorgeously dressed lady and a young girl came out of it. Both these ladies took their seats in a carriage, which was waiting at the door, talking and laughing loudly the while and drove away without appearing to notice the approaching couple. No sooner had the carriage driven off than the door opened once more, and Rogojin, who had apparently been awaiting them, let them in and closed it after them. There is not another soul in the house now excepting ourselves, he said aloud, looking at the prince in a strange way. Nastasia Filipovna was waiting for them in the first room they went into. She was dressed very simply, in black. She rose at their entrance, but did not smile or give her hand, even to the prince. Her anxious eyes were fixed upon Aglaia. Both sat down, at a little distance from one another Aglaia on the sofa, in the corner of the room, Nastasia by the window. The prince and Rogojin remained standing, and were not invited to sit. Mushkin glanced at Rogojin in perplexity, but the latter only smiled disagreeably, and said nothing. The silence continued for some few moments. An ominous expression passed over Nastasia Filipovna's face, of a sudden. It became obstinate-looking, hard, and full of hatred, but she did not take her eyes off her visitors for a moment. Aglaia was clearly confused, but not frightened. On entering she had merely glanced momentarily at her rival, and then had sat still, with her eyes on the ground, apparently in thought. Once or twice she glanced casually round the room. A shade of disgust was visible in her expression. She looked as though she were afraid of contamination in this place. She mechanically arranged her dress and fidgeted uncomfortably, eventually changing her seat to the other end of the sofa. Probably she was unconscious of her own movements, but this very unconsciousness added to the offensiveness of their suggested meaning. At length she looked straight into Nastasia's eyes and instantly read all there was to read in her rival's expression. Woman understood woman. Aglaia shuddered. You know of course why I requested this meeting. She said at last, quietly, and pausing twice in the delivery of this very short sentence. No, I know nothing about it, said Nastasia, dryly and abruptly. Aglaia blushed. Perhaps it struck her as very strange and impossible that she should really be sitting here and waiting for that woman's reply to her question. At the first sound of Nastasia's voice a shudder ran through her frame. Of course that woman observed and took in all this. You know quite well, but you are pretending to be ignorant, said Aglaia, very low, with her eyes on the ground. Why should I? 
asked Nastasia Filipovna, smiling slightly. You want to take advantage of my position, now that I am in your house, continued Aglaia, awkwardly. For that position you are to blame, and not I, said Nastasia, flaring up suddenly. I did not invite you, but you me, and to this moment I am quite ignorant as to why I am thus honored. Aglaia raised her head haughtily. Restrain your tongue, she said. I did not come here to fight you with your own weapons. Oh, then you did come to fight, I may conclude. Dear me, and I thought you were cleverer they looked at one another with undisguised malice. One of these women had written to the other, so lately, such letters as we have seen, and it all was dispersed at their first meeting. Yet it appeared that not one of the four persons in the room considered this in any degree strange. The prince who, up to yesterday, would not have believed that he could even dream of such an impossible scene as this, stood and listened and looked on and felt as though he had long foreseen it all. The most fantastic dream seemed suddenly to have been metamorphosed into the most vivid reality. One of these women so despised the other, and so longed to express her contempt for her. Perhaps she had only come for that very purpose. As Rogojin said next day, that howsoever fantastical was the other woman, howsoever afflicted her spirit and disturbed her understanding, no preconceived idea of hers could possibly stand up against that deadly feminine contempt of her rival. The prince felt sure that Nastasia would say nothing about the letters herself, but he could judge by her flashing eyes and the expression of her face what the thought of those letters must be costing her at this moment. He would have given half his life to prevent Aglaia from speaking of them. But Aglaia suddenly braced herself up and seemed to master herself fully, all in an instant. You have not quite understood, she said. I did not come to quarrel with you, though I do not like you. I came to speak to you as, as one human being to another. I came with my mind made up as to what I had to say to you, and I shall not change my intention, although you may misunderstand me. So much the worse for you, not for myself. I wish to reply to all you have written to me and to reply personally, because I think that is the more convenient way. Listen to my reply to all your letters. I began to be sorry for Prince Lev Nikolaevich on the very day I made his acquaintance, and when I heard afterwards of all that took place at your house in the evening, I was sorry for him because he was such a simple-minded man, and because he, in the simplicity of his soul, believed that he could be happy with a woman of your character. What I feared actually took place, you could not love him, you tortured him, and threw him over. You could not love him because you are too proud, no, not proud, that is an error, because you are to vain, no, not quite that either, to self-loving, you are self-loving to madness. Your letters to me are a proof of it. You could not love so simple a soul as his, and perhaps in your heart you despised him and laughed at him. All you could love was your shame and the perpetual thought that you were disgraced and insulted. If you were less shameful, or had no cause at all for shame, you would be still more unhappy than you are now. Aglaia brought out these thronging words with great satisfaction. They came from her lips hurriedly and impetuously, and had been prepared and thought out long ago, even before she had ever dreamed of the present meeting. She watched with eagerness the effect of her speech, as shown in Nastasia's face, which was distorted with agitation. You remember, she continued, he wrote me a letter at that time. He says you know all about that letter and that you even read it. I understand all by means of this letter, and understand it correctly. He has since confirmed it all to me that I now say to you, word for word. After receiving his letter I waited. I guessed that you would soon come back here because you could never do without Petersburg. You are still too young and lovely for the provinces. However, this is not my own idea, she added, blushing dreadfully, and from this moment the color never left her cheeks to the end of her speech. When I next saw the prince I began to feel terribly pained and hurt on his account. Do not laugh, if you laugh you are unworthy of understanding what I say. Surely you see that I am not laughing, said Nastasia, sadly and sternly. However, it's all the same to me, laugh or not, just as you please. When I asked him about you, he told me that he had long since ceased to love you, that the very recollection of you was a torture to him, but that he was sorry for you, and that when he thought of you his heart was pierced. I ought to tell you that I never in my life met a man anything like him for noble simplicity of mind, and for boundless trustfulness. I guessed that anyone who liked could deceive him. 
and that he would immediately forgive anyone who did deceive him. And it was for this that I grew to love him. Maglea paused for a moment, as though suddenly brought up in astonishment that she could have said these words. But at the same time a great pride shone in her eyes, like a defiant assertion that it would not matter to her if this woman laughed in her face for the admission just made. I have told you all now, and of course you understand what I wish of you. Perhaps I do, but tell me yourself, said Nastasia Filipovna, quietly. Aglaya flushed up angrily. I wish to find out from you, she said, firmly, by what right you dare to meddle with his feelings for me. By what right you dared send me those letters? By what right do you continually remind both me and him that you love him, after you yourself threw him over and ran away from him in so insulting and shameful a way? I never told either him or you that I loved him, replied Nastasia Filipovna with an effort. And and I did run away from him, you are right there, she added, scarcely audibly. Never told either him or me, cried Aglaia. How about your letters? Who asked you to try to persuade me to marry him? Was not that a declaration from you? Why do you force yourself upon us in this way? I confess I thought at first that you were anxious to arouse an aversion for him in my heart by your meddling, in order that I might give him up, and it was only afterwards that I guessed the truth. You imagined that you were doing an heroic action. How could you spare any love for him, when you love your own vanity to such an extent? Why could you not simply go away from here? Instead of writing me those absurd letters, why do you not now marry that generous man who loves you and has done you the honor of offering you his hand? It is plain enough why, if you marry Rogojin you lose your grievance, you will have nothing more to complain of. You will be receiving too much honor. Evgeny Pavlovich was saying the other day that you had read too many poems and are too well educated for your position, and that you live in idleness. Add to this your vanity, and there you have reason enough, and do you not live in idleness? Things had come to this unexpected point too quickly. Unexpected because Nastasia Filipovna, on her way to Pavlovsk, had thought and considered a good deal, and had expected something different, though perhaps not altogether good, from this interview. But Aglaia had been carried away by her own outburst, just as a rolling stone gathers impetus as it careers downhill and could not restrain herself in the satisfaction of revenge. It was strange, Nastasia Filipovna felt, to see Aglaia like this. She gazed at her, and could hardly believe her eyes and ears for a moment or two, whether she were a woman who had read too many poems, as Evgeny Pavlovich supposed, or whether she were mad, as the prince had assured Aglaia. At all events, this was a woman who, in spite of her occasionally cynical and audacious manner, was far more refined and trustful and sensitive than appeared. There was a certain amount of romantic dreaminess and caprice in her, but with the fantastic was mingled much that was strong and deep. The prince realized this, and great suffering expressed itself in his face. Aglaia observed it, and trembled with anger. How dare you speak so to me, she said, with a haughtiness which was quite indescribable, replying to Nastasia's last remark. You must have misunderstood what I said, said Nastasia, in some surprise. If you wish to preserve your good name, why did you not give up Yuri a guardian, Totsky, without all that theatrical posturing, said Aglaia, suddenly a propos of nothing. What do you know of my position, that you dare to judge me, cried Nastasia, quivering with rage, and growing terribly white. I know this much, that you did not go out to honest work, but went away with a rich man, Rogojin, in order to pose as a fallen angel. I don't wonder that Totsky was nearly driven to suicide by such a fallen angel. Silence, cried Nastasia Filipovna. You are about as fit to understand me as the housemaid here, who bore witness against her lover in court the other day. She would understand me better than you do. Probably an honest girl living by her own toil. Why do you speak of a housemaid so contemptuously? I do not despise toil. I despise you when you speak of toil. If you had cared to be an honest woman, you would have gone out as a laundress. Both had risen and were gazing at one another with pallid faces. Aglaia, don't. This isn't fair, cried the prince, deeply distressed. Rogojin was not smiling now. He sat and listened with folded arms and lips tight compressed. There, look at her, cried Nastasia, trembling with passion. Look at this young lady. And I imagined her an angel. 
Did you come to me without your governess, Aglaya Ivanovna? Oh, fie, now shall I just tell you why you came here today? Shall I tell you without any embellishments? You came because you were afraid of me. Afraid of you? Asked Aglaya, beside herself with naive amazement that the other should dare talk to her like this. Yes, me, of course. Of course you were afraid of me, or you would not have decided to come. You cannot despise one you fear, and to think that I have actually esteemed you up to this very moment. Do you know why you are afraid of me, and what is your object now? You wish to satisfy yourself with your own eyes as to which he loves best, myself or you, because you are fearfully jealous. He has told me already that he hates you, murmured Aglaia, scarcely audibly. Perhaps, perhaps, I am not worthy of him, I know, but I think you are lying, all the same. He cannot hate me, and he cannot have said so. I am ready to forgive you, in consideration of your position, but I confess I thought better of you. I thought you were wiser, and more beautiful, too. I did, indeed. Well, take your treasure. See, he is gazing at you, he can't recollect himself. Take him, but on one condition, go away at once, this instant. She fell back into a chair, and burst into tears, but suddenly some new expression blazed in her eyes. She stared fixedly at Aglaia, and rose from her seat. Or would you like me to bid him? Bid him, do you hear? Commend him, now, at once, to throw you up, and remain mine forever. Shall I? He will stay, and he will marry me too, and you shall trot home all alone. Shall I? Shall I say the word? She screamed like a madwoman, scarcely believing herself that she could really pronounce such wild words. Aglaia had made for the door in terror, but she stopped at the threshold and listened. Shall I turn Rogojin off? Ha, ha, you thought I would marry him for your benefit, did you? Why, you'll call out now, if you like, in your presence. Rogojin, get out, and say to the prince, do you remember what you promised me? Heavens, what a fool I have been to humiliate myself before them. Why, prince, you yourself gave me your word that you would marry me whatever happened and would never abandon me. You said you loved me and would forgive me all, and in recipes you even said that. I only ran away from you in order to set you free, and now I don't care to let you go again. Why does she treat me so so shamefully? I am not a loose woman as Grogojin there. Hell tell you, will you go again now that she has insulted me, before your eyes, too, turn away from me and led her away? Arm and arm, may you be a curse too, for you were the only one I trusted among them all. Go away, Rogojin, I don't want you, she continued, blind with fury, and forcing the words out with dry lips and distorted features, evidently not believing a single word of her own tirade, but, at the same time, doing her utmost to prolong the moment of self-deception, the outburst was so terribly violent that the prince thought it would have killed her. There he is, she shrieked again, pointing to the prince and addressing Aglaia, there he is and if he does not approach me at once and take me and throw you over, then have him for your only give him up to you. I don't want him. Both she and Aglaeus stood and waited as though in expectation, and both looked at the prince like madwoman. But he, perhaps, did not understand the full force of this challenge. In fact, it is certain he did not. All he could see was the poor despairing face which, as he had said to Aglaia, had pierced his heart forever. He could bear it no longer and with a look of entreaty, mingled with reproach, he addressed Aglaia, pointing to Nastasia the while. How can you? He murmured, she is so unhappy. But he had no time to say another word before Aglaia's terrible look bereft him of speech. In that look was embodied so dreadful a suffering and so deadly a hatred that he gave a cry and flew to her. But it was too late. She could not hold out long enough even to witness his movement in her direction. She had hidden her face in her hands, cried once, oh, my God, and rushed out of the room. Rogojin followed her to undo the bolts of the door and let her out into the street. The prince made a rush after her, but he was caught and held back. The distorted, livid face of Nastasia gazed at him reproachfully, and her blue lips whispered, what? Would you go to her to her? She fell senseless into his arms. He raised her, carried her into the room, placed her in an armchair, and stood over her, stupefied. On the table stood a tumbler of water. Rogojin, who now returned, took this and sprinkled a little in her face. She opened her eyes, 
but for a moment she understood nothing. Suddenly she looked around, shuddered, gave a loud cry, and threw herself in the prince's arms. Mine, mine, she cried. Has the proud young lady gone? Ha, 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 she laughed hysterically. And I had given him up to her. Why we did I? Mad, mad, get away. Rogojin, ha, ha, ha. Rogojin stared intently at them. Then he took his hat and without a word, left the room. A few moments later, the prince was seated by Nastasia on the sofa, gazing into her eyes and stroking her face and hair, as he would a little child's. He laughed when she laughed, and was ready to cry when she cried. He did not speak, but listened to her excited, disconnected chatter, hardly understanding a word of it the while. No sooner did he detect the slightest appearance of complaining, or weeping, or reproaching, then he would smile at her kindly, and begin stroking her hair and her cheeks, soothing and consoling her once more, as if she were a child. A fortnight had passed since the events recorded in the last chapter, and the position of the actors in our story had become so changed that it is almost impossible for us to continue the tale without some few explanations. Yet we feel that we ought to limit ourselves to the simple record of facts, without much attempt at explanation, for a very patent reason, because we ourselves have the greatest possible difficulty in accounting for the facts to be recorded. Such a statement on our part may appear strange to the reader. How is anyone to tell a story which he cannot understand himself? In order to keep clear of a false position, we had perhaps better give an example of what we mean and probably the intelligent reader will soon understand the difficulty. More especially are we inclined to take this course since the example will constitute a distinct march forward of our story, and will not hinder the progress of the events remaining to be recorded. During the next fortnight artists, through the early part of July the history of our hero was circulated in the form of strange, diverting, most unlikely sounding stories, which passed from mouth to mouth through the streets and villas adjoining those inhabited by Labadov, Titsin, Nastasia Filipovna and the Apanchins, in fact, pretty well through the whole town and its environs. All society both the inhabitants of the place and those who came down of an evening for the music had got hold of one and the same story, in a thousand varieties of detail as to how a certain young prince had raised a terrible scandal in a most respectable household had thrown over a daughter of the family, to whom he was engaged, and had been captured by a woman of shady reputation whom he was determined to marry at once breaking off all old ties for the satisfaction of his insane idea. And, in spite of the public indignation roused by his action, the marriage was to take place in Pavlovsk openly and publicly, and the prince had announced his intention of going through with it with head erect and looking the whole world in the face. The story was so artfully adorned with scandalous details, and persons of so great eminence and importance were apparently mixed up in it, while, at the same time, the evidence was so circumstantial that it was no wonder the matter gave food for plenty of curiosity and gossip. According to the reports of the most talented gossip mongustos who, in every class of society, are always in haste to explain every event to their neighbors young gentleman concerned was of good familiar prince fairly rich weak of intellect, but a democrat and a dabbler in the nihilism of the period, as exposed by Mr. Turgenev. He could hardly talk Russian, but had fallen in love with one of the Miss Apanchins, and his suit met with so much encouragement that he had been received in the house as the recognized bridegroom-to-be of the young lady but like the Frenchman of whom the story is told that he studied for holy orders, took all the oaths, was ordained priest, and next morning wrote to his bishop informing him that, as he did not believe in God and considered it wrong to deceive the people and live upon their pockets, he begged to surrender the orders conferred upon him the day before, and to inform his lordship that he was sending this letter to the public press. Like this Frenchman, the prince played a false game. It was rumored that he had purposely waited for the solemn occasion of a large evening party at the house of his future bride, at which he was introduced to several eminent persons, in order publicly to make known his ideas and opinions, and thereby insult the bigwigs, and to throw over his bride as offensively as possible, and that, resisting the servants who were told off to turn him out of the house, he had seized and thrown down a magnificent china vase, 
As a characteristic addition to the above, it was currently reported that the young prince really loved the lady to whom he was engaged and had thrown her over out of purely nihilistic motives with the intention of giving himself the satisfaction of marrying a fallen woman in the face of all the world, thereby publishing his opinion that there is no distinction between virtuous and disreputable women, but that all women are alike, free, and a fallen woman, indeed, somewhat superior to a virtuous one. It was declared that he believed in no classes or anything else, accepting the woman question. All this looked likely enough, and was accepted as fact by most of the inhabitants of the place, especially as it was borne out, more or less, by daily occurrences. Of course, much was said that could not be determined, absolutely. For instance, it was reported that the poor girl had so loved her future husband that she had followed him to the house of the other woman. The day after she had been thrown over, others said that he had insisted on her coming, himself, in order to shame and insult her by his taunts and nihilistic confessions when she reached the house. However all these things might be, the public interest in the matter grew daily, especially as it became clear that the scandalous wedding was undoubtedly to take place, so that if our readers were to ask an explanation, not of the wild reports about the prince's nihilistic opinions, but simply as to how such a marriage could possibly satisfy his real aspirations, or as to the spiritual condition of our hero at this time, we confess that we should have great difficulty in giving the required information. All we know is that the marriage really was arranged, and that the prince had commissioned Labadif and Keller to look after all the necessary business connected with it, that he had requested them to spare no expense, that Nastasia herself was hurrying on the wedding, that Keller was to be the prince's best man, at his own earnest request, and that Badovsky was to give Nastasia away, to his great delight. The wedding was to take place before the middle of July, but, besides the above, we are cognizant of certain other undoubted facts, which puzzle us a good deal because they seem flatly to contradict the foregoing. We suspect, for instance, that having commissioned Labadif and the others, as above, the prince immediately forgot all about masters of ceremonies and even the ceremony itself, and we feel quite certain that in making these arrangements he did so in order that he might absolutely escape all thought of the wedding, and even forget its approach if he could, by detailing all business concerning it to others. What did he think of all this time, then? What did he wish for? There is no doubt that he was a perfectly free agent all through, and that as far as Nastasia was concerned, there was no force of any kind brought to bear on him. Nastasia wished for a speedy marriage, true, but the prince agreed at once to her proposals. He agreed, in fact, so casually that anyone might suppose he was but acceding to the most simple and ordinary suggestion. There are many strange circumstances such as this before us, but in our opinion they do but deepen the mystery, and do not in the smallest degree help us to understand the case. However, let us take one more example. Thus, we know for a fact that during the whole of this fortnight the prince spent all his days and evenings with Nastasia. He walked with her, drove with her. He began to be restless whenever he passed an hour without seeing her in fact. To all appearances, he sincerely loved her. He would listen to her for hours at a time with a quiet smile on his face, scarcely saying a word himself. And yet we know, Equally certainly, that during this period he several times set off, suddenly, to the Apanchins, not concealing the fact from Nastasia Filipovna, and driving the latter to absolute despair. We know also that he was not received at the Apanchins so long as they remained at Pavlovsk, and that he was not allowed an interview with Aglaya, but next day he would set off once more on the same errand, apparently quite oblivious of the fact of yesterday's visit having been a failure and, of course, meeting with another refusal. We know, too, that exactly an hour after Aglaya had fled from Nastasia Filipovna's house on that fateful evening, the prince was at the Apanchins, and that his appearance there had been the cause of the greatest consternation and dismay, for Aglaya had not been home, and the family only discovered then, for the first time, that the two of them had been to Nastasia's house together. It was said that Elizabeth Prokofievna and her daughters had there and then denounced the prince in the strongest terms, and had refused any further acquaintance and friendship with him. 
their rage and denunciations being redoubled when Varya Ardolyanovna suddenly arrived and stated that Aglaya had been at her house in a terrible state of mind for the last hour and that she refused to come home. This last item of news, which disturbed Lizabetha Prokofievna more than anything else, was perfectly true. On leaving Nastasia's, Aglaya had felt that she would rather die than face her people and had therefore gone straight to Nina Alexandrovna's. On receiving the news, Lizabetha and her daughters and the general all rushed off to Aglaya, followed by Prince Lafnekolaivachundita by his recent dismissal, but through Varya he was refused a sight of Aglaya here also. The end of the episode was that when Aglaya saw her mother and sisters crying over her and not uttering a word of reproach, she had flung herself into their arms and gone straight home with them. It was said that Gonia managed to make a fool of himself even on this occasion. For, finding himself alone with Aglaya for a minute or two when Varya had gone to the Apanchins, he had thought it a fitting opportunity to make a declaration of his love. And on hearing this Aglaya, in spite of her state of mind at the time, had suddenly burst out laughing and had put a strange question to him. She asked him whether he would consent to hold his finger to a lighted candle in proof of his devotion. Geniate was said looked so comically bewildered that Aglaya had almost laughed herself into hysterics and had rushed out of the room and upstairs, where her parents had found her. Hippolyte told the prince this last story, sending for him on purpose. When Mushkin heard about the candle and Gania's finger he had left so that he had quite astonished Hippolyte, and then shuddered and burst into tears. The prince's condition during those days was strange and perturbed. Hippolyte plainly declared that he thought he was out of his mind. This, however, was hardly to be relied upon. Offering all these facts to our readers and refusing to explain them, we do not for a moment desire to justify our hero's conduct. On the contrary, we are quite prepared to feel our share of the indignation which his behavior aroused in the hearts of his friends. Even Vera Labadev was angry with him for a while, so was Kolia, so was Keller, until he was selected for best man, so was Labadev himself, who began to intrigue against him out of pure irritation, but of this Anan. In fact, we are in full accord with certain forcible words spoken to the prince by Evgeny Pavlovich, quite unceremoniously, during the course of a friendly conversation, six or seven days after the events at Nastasia Filipovna's house. We may remark here that not only the Apanchins themselves, but all who had anything to do with them, thought it right to break with the prince in consequence of his conduct. Prince Ass even went so far as to turn away and cut him dead in the street. But Evgeny Pavlovich was not afraid to compromise himself by paying the prince a visit, and did so, in spite of the fact that he had recommenced to visit at the Apanchins, where he was received with redoubled hospitality and kindness after the temporary estrangement. Evgeny called upon the prince the day after that on which the Apanchins left Pavlovsk. He knew of all the current rumors, in fact, he had probably contributed to them himself. The prince was delighted to see him, and immediately began to speak of the Apanchins, which simple and straightforward opening quite took Evgeny's fancy, so that he melted at once and plunged in medias rays without ceremony. The prince did not know, up to this, that the Apanchins had left the place. He grew very pale on hearing the news, but a moment later he nodded his head and said thoughtfully, I knew it was bound to be so. Then he added quickly, where have they gone to? Evgeny meanwhile observed him attentively, and the rapidity of the questions, their simplicity, the prince's candor, and at the same time, his evident perplexity and mental agitation surprised him considerably. However, he told Mushkin all he could, kindly and in detail. The prince hardly knew anything, for this was the first informant from the household whom he had met since the estrangement. Evgeny reported that Aglaya had been really ill, and that for tonight she had not slept at all, owing to high fever, that now she was better and out of serious danger, but still in a nervous, hysterical state. It's a good thing that there is peace in the house, at all events, he continued. They never utter a hint about the past, not only in Aglaya's presence, but even among themselves. The old people are talking of a trip abroad in the autumn, Immediately after Adelaide's wedding, Aglaya received the news in silence. Evgeny himself was very likely going abroad also, so were Prince Ass. 
and his wife, if affairs allowed of it, the general was to stay at home. They were all at their estate of Kolmina now, about twenty miles or so from Ste. Petersburg. Princess Bilikonsky had not returned to Moscow yet, and was apparently staying on for reasons of her own. Lizabetha Prokofievna had insisted that it was quite impossible to remain in Pevlovsk after what had happened. Evgeny had told her of all the rumors current in town about the affair, so that there could be no talk of their going to their house on the Yelagin as yet. And in point of fact, Prince, added Evgeny Pavlovich, you must allow that they could hardly have stayed here, considering that they knew of all that went on at your place, and in the face of your daily visits to their house, visits which you insisted upon making in spite of their refusal to see you. Yes, yes, quite so, you are quite right. I wish to see Aglaya Ivanovna, you know, said the prince, nodding his head. Oh, my dear fellow, cried Evgeny, warmly, with real sorrow in his voice, how could you permit all that to come about as it has? Of course, of course, I know it was all so unexpected. I admit that you, only naturally, lost your head, and and could not stop the foolish girl that was not in your power. I quite see so much, but you really should have understood how seriously she cared for you. She could not bear to share you with another, and you could bring yourself to throw away and shatter such a treasure. Oh, prince, prince. Yes, yes, you are quite right again, said the poor prince, in anguish of mind. I was wrong, I know, but it was only Aglaya who looked on Nastasia Filipovna so. No one else did, you know. But that's just the worst of it all. Don't you see that there was absolutely nothing serious about the matter in reality? Cried Evgeny, beside himself. Excuse me, prince, but I have thought over all this. I have thought a great deal over it. I know all that had happened before. I know all that took place six months since. And I know there was nothing serious about the matter. It was but fancy, smoke, fantasy distorted by agitation, and only the alarmed jealousy of an absolutely inexperienced girl could possibly have mistaken it for serious reality. Here Evgeny Pavlovich quite let himself go, and gave the reins to his indignation. Clearly and reasonably, and with great psychological insight, he drew a picture of the prince's past relations with Nastasia Filipovna. Evgeny Pavlovich always had a ready tongue, but on this occasion his eloquence surprised himself. From the very beginning, he said, you began with a lie, what began with a lie was bound to end with a lie, such is the law of nature. I do not agree, in fact I am angry, when I hear you called an idiot. You are far too intelligent to deserve such an apathet, but you are so far strange as to be unlike others, that you must allow yourself. Now, I have come to the conclusion that the basis of all that has happened, has been first of all your innate inexperience. Remark the expression innate. Prince, then follows your unheard of simplicity of heart. Then comes your absolute want of sense of proportion. To this want you have several times confessed. And lastly, a mass, an accumulation of intellectual convictions which you, in your unexampled honesty of soul, accept unquestionably as also innate and natural and true. Admit, Prince, that in your relations with Nastasia Filipovna there has existed, from the very first, something democratic, and the fascination, so to speak, of the woman question. I know all about that scandalous scene at Nastasia Filipovna's house when Rogojin brought the money, six months ago. I'll show you yourself as in a looking glass, if you like. I know exactly all that went on, in every detail, and why things have turned out as they have. You thirsted, while in Switzerland, for your home country, for Russia. You read, doubtless, many books about Russia, excellent books, I dare say, but hurtful to you, and you arrived here, as it were, on fire with the longing to be of service. Then, on the very day of your arrival, they tell you a sad story of an ill-used woman, they tell you, a knight, pure and without reproach, this tale of a poor woman, the same day you actually see her. You are attracted by her beauty, her fantastic, almost demoniacal, beauty. I admit her beauty, of course. Add to all this your nervous nature, your epilepsy, and your sudden arrival in a strange town the day of meetings and of exciting scenes, the day of unexpected acquaintanceships, the day of sudden actions, 
the day of meeting with the three lovely Appenkin girls, and among them Ag Liod your fatigue, your excitement, Adnastasia's evening party, and the tone of that party, and what were you to expect of yourself at such a moment as that? Yes, 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 said the prince once more, nodding his head and blushing slightly. Yes, it was so, or nearly so I know it, and besides, you see, I had not slept the night before, in the train, or the night before that, either, and I was very tired. Of course, of course, quite so, that's what I'm driving at, continued Evgeny, excitedly. It is as clear as possible, and most comprehensible, that you, in your enthusiasm, should plunge headlong into the first chance that came of publicly airing your great idea that you, a prince, and a pure living man, did not consider a woman disgraced if the sin were not her own, but that of a disgusting social libertine. Oh, heavens, it's comprehensible enough, my dear prince, but that is not the question, unfortunately. The question is, was there any reality and truth in your feelings? Was it nature, or nothing but intellectual enthusiasm? What do you think yourself? We are told, of course, that a far worse woman was forgiven, but we don't find that she was told that she had done well, or that she was worthy of honor and respect. Did not your common sense show you what was the real state of the case a few months later? The question is now, not whether she is an innocent woman. I do not insist one way, or the Othery do not wish to, but can her whole career justify such intolerable pride, such insolent, rapacious egotism as she has shown? Forgive me, I am too violent, perhaps, but... Yes, he dare say it is all as you say. I dare say you are quite right, muttered the prince once more. She is very sensitive and easily put out, of course, but still, she... She is worthy of sympathy. Is that what you wish to say, my good fellow? But then, for the mere sake of vindicating her worthiness of sympathy, you should not have insulted and offended a noble and generous girl in her presence. This is a terrible exaggeration of sympathy. How can you love a girl, and yet so humiliate her as to throw her over for the sake of another woman, before the very eyes of that other woman, when you have already made her a formal proposal of marriage? And you did propose to her, you know, you did so before her parents and sisters. Can you be an honest man, prince, if you act so? I ask you, and did you not deceive that beautiful girl when you assured her of your love? Yes, you are quite right. Oh, I feel that I am very guilty, said Mushkin in deepest distress. But as if that is enough, cried Evgeny, indignantly. As if it is enough simply to say, I know I am very guilty. You are to blame, and yet you persevere in evil doing. Where was your heart? I should like to know, your Christian heart, all that time. Did she look as though she was suffering less, at that moment? You saw her face was she suffering less than the other woman. How could you see her suffering and allow it to continue? How could you? But I did not allow it, murmured the wretched prince. How it do you mean you didn't allow? Upon my word, I didn't. To this moment, I don't know how it all happened. He ran after Aglaya Ivanovna, but Nastasia Filipovna fell down in a faint, and since that day they won't let me see Aglaya, that's all I know. It's all the same. You ought to have run after Aglaya, though the other was fainting. Yes, yes, I ought, but I couldn't. She would have deed, she would have killed herself. You don't know her, and I should have told Aglaya everything afterwards, but I see, Evgeny Pavlovich, you don't know all. Tell me now, why am I not allowed to see Aglaya? I should have cleared it all up, you know. Neither of them kept to the real point, you see. I could never explain what I mean to you, but I think I could to Aglaya. Oh, my God, my God. You spoke just now of Aglaya's face at the moment when she ran away. Oh, my God, I remember it. Come along, come along quick. He pulled at Evgeny's coat sleeve nervously and excitedly and rose from his chair. Where to? Come to Aglaya quick, quick. But I told you she is not at Pavlovsk. And what would be the use if she were? Oh, shall understand, shall understand, cried the prince, clasping his hands. She would understand that all this is not the point not a bit the real point it is quite foreign to the real question. How can it be foreign? You are going to be married, are you not? Very well, then you are persisting in your course. Are you going to marry her or not? Yes, I shall marry Harry's. Then why is it not the point? 
Oh, no, it is not the point, not a bit. It makes no difference. My marrying Harriet means nothing. How means nothing? You are talking nonsense, my friend. You are marrying the woman you love in order to secure her happiness, and Aglaia sees and knows it. How can you say that it's not the point? Her happiness. Oh, no. I am only marrying her well, because she wished it. It means nothing, it's all the same. She would certainly have died. I see now that that marriage with Rogojin was an insane idea. I understand all now that I did not understand before. And, do you know, when those two stood opposite to one another, I could not bear Nastasia Filipovna's face. You must know, Evgeny Pavlovich, I have never told anyone before or not even a glaive that I cannot bear Nastasia Filipovna's face. He lowered his voice mysteriously as he said this. You described that evening at Nastasia Filipovna's, six months since, very accurately just now, but there is one thing which you did not mention, and of which you took no account, because you do not know. I mean her face looked at her face, you see. Even in the morning when I saw her portrait, I felt that I could not bear to look at it. Now, there's Vera Labadev, for instance, her eyes are quite different, you know. I'm afraid of her face, he added, with real alarm. You are afraid of it. Yes, yeah, is mad. He whispered, growing pale. Do you know this for certain? Asked Evgeny, with the greatest curiosity. Yes, for certain, quite for certain. Now, I have discovered it absolutely for certain, these last few days. What are you doing, then? Cried Evgeny, in horror. You must be marrying her solely out of fear, then. I can't make head or tail of it, prince. Perhaps you don't even love her. Oh, no, I love her with all my soul. Why, she is a child. Shas a child now, a real child. Oh, you know nothing about it at all, I see. And are you assured, at the same time, that you love Aglaia too? Yes, yes, oh, yes. How so? Do you want to make out that you love them both? Yes, yes, both. I do. Excuse me, prince, but think what you are saying. Recollect yourself. Without Aglaia, I must see Aglaia. I shall die in my sleep very soon he thought I was dying in my sleep last night. Oh, if Aglaia only knew Ellie mean really, really all, because she must know all that's the first condition towards understanding. Why cannot we ever know all about another, especially when that other has been guilty? But I don't know what I'm talking about him so confused. You pained me so dreadfully. Saul surely Aglaia has not the same expression now as she had at the moment when she ran away. Oh, yes. I am guilty and I know E.T. know it. Probably I am in fault all round E. Don't quite know how but I am in fault, no doubt. There is something else, but I cannot explain it to you, Evgeny Pavlovich. I have no words, but Aglaia will understand. I have always believed Aglaia will understand E. am assured she will. No, Prince, she will not. Aglaia loved like a woman, like a human being, not like an abstract spirit. Do you know what, my poor Prince? The most probable explanation of the matter is that you never loved either the one or the other in reality. I don't know perhaps you are right in much that you have said, Evgeny Pavlovich. You are very wise, Evgeny Pavlovich. Oh, how my head is beginning to ache again. Come to her, quick for God's sake, come. But I tell you she is not in Pavlovsk. Shas in Kolmina. Oh, come to Kolmina, then. Come let us go at once. No, no, impossible said Evgeny, rising. Look here, I'll write a letter, take a letter for me. No, no, prince, you must forgive me, but I can't undertake any such commissions. I really can't. And so they parted. Evgeny Pavlovich left the house with strange convictions. He, too, felt that the prince must be out of his mind. And what did he mean by that face here, face which he so fears, and yet so loves? And meanwhile he really may die, as he says, without seeing a glare and she will never know how devotedly he loves her. Ha, ha, ha. How does the fellow manage to love two of them? Two different kinds of love, I suppose. This is very interesting, poor idiot. What on earth will become of him now? The prince did not die before his wedding either by day or night, as he had foretold that he might. Very probably he passed disturbed nights and was afflicted with bad dreams, but during the daytime among his fellow men, he seemed as kind as ever and even contented, only a little thoughtful when alone. The wedding was hurried on. The day was fixed for exactly a week after Evgeny's visit to the prince. In the face of such haste as this, 
Even the prince's best friends, if he had had any, would have felt the hopelessness of any attempt to save the poor medman. Rumor said that in the visit of Evgeny Pavlovich was to be discerned the influence of Lizabetha Prokofievna and her husband. But if those good souls, in the boundless kindness of their hearts, were desirous of saving the eccentric young fellow from ruin, they were unable to take any stronger measures to attain that end. Neither their position, nor their private inclination, perhaps, and only naturally, would allow them to use any more pronounced means. We have observed before that even some of the prince's nearest neighbors had begun to oppose him. Vera Labadev's passive disagreement was limited to the shedding of a few solitary tears, to more frequent sitting alone at home, and to a diminished frequency in her visits to the prince's apartments. Kolya was occupied with his father at this time. The old man died during a second stroke, which took place just eight days after the first. The prince showed great sympathy in the grief of the family, and during the first days of their mourning he was at the house a great deal with Nina Alexandrovna. He went to the funeral, and it was observable that the public assembled in church greeted his arrival and departure with whisperings, and watched him closely. The same thing happened in the park, and in the street, wherever he went. He was pointed out when he drove by, and he often overheard the name of Nastasia Filipovna coupled with his own as he passed. People looked out for her at the funeral, too, but she was not there, and another conspicuous absentee was the captain's widow, whom Labadev had prevented from coming. The funeral service produced a great effect on the prince. He whispered to Labadev that this was the first time he had ever heard a Russian funeral service since he was a little boy. Observing that he was looking about him uneasily, Labadev asked him whom he was seeking. Nothing. I only thought I is it Rogojin. Why is he here? Yes, has in church. I thought I caught sight of his eyes, muttered the prince in confusion. But what of it? Why is he here? Was he asked. Oh, dear, no. Why, they don't even know him. Anyone can come in, you know. Why do you look so amazed? I often meet him. I've seen him at least for times, here at Pavlovsk, within the last week. I haven't seen him on since that day, the prince murmured. As Nastasia Filipovna had not said a word about having met Rogojin since that day, the prince concluded that the letter had his own reasons for wishing to keep out of sight. All the day of the funeral our hero was in a deeply thoughtful state, while Nastasia Filipovna was particularly merry, both in the daytime and in the evening. Kolya had made it up with the prince before his father's death, and it was he who urged him to make use of Kala and Badovsky, promising to answer himself for the former's behavior. Nina Alexandrovna and Labadev tried to persuade him to have the wedding in Ste. Petersburg, instead of in the public fashion contemplated, down here at Pavlovsk in the height of the season. But the prince only said that Nastasia Filipovna desired to have it so, though he saw well enough what prompted their arguments. The next day Kala came to visit the prince. He was in a high state of delight with the post of honor assigned to him at the wedding. Before entering he stopped on the threshold, raised his hand as if making a solemn vow, and cried, I won't drink. Then he went up to the prince, seized both his hands, shook them warmly, and declared that he had at first felt hostile towards the project of this marriage, and had openly said so in the billiard rooms, but that the reason simply was that, with the impatience of a friend, he had hoped to see the prince marry at least a princess de Rowan or de Chabot, but that now he saw that the prince's way of thinking was ten times more noble than that of all the rest put together, for he desired neither pomp nor wealth nor honor, but only the truth. The sympathies of exalted personages were well known, and the prince was too highly placed by his education, and so on, not to be in some sense an exalted personage. But all the common heard judge differently, in the town, at the meetings, in the villas, at the band, in the inns and the billiard rooms, the coming event has only to be mentioned and there are shouts and cries from everybody. I have even heard talk of getting up a curry under the windows on the wedding night. So if you have need of the pistol of an honest man, prince, I am ready to fire half a dozen shots even before you rise from your nuptial couch. Keller also advised, in anticipation of the crowd making a rush after the ceremony, that a fire hose should be placed at the entrance to the house, 
but Labadif was opposed to this measure, which he said might result in the place being pulled down. I assure you, Prince, that Labadif is intriguing against you. He wants to put you under control. Imagine that. To take from you the use of your free will and your money that is to say, the two things that distinguish us from the animals. I have heard it said positively. It is the sober truth. The prince recollected that somebody had told him something of the kind before, and he had, of course, scoffed at it. He only laughed now, and forgot the hint at once. Labadif really had been busy for some little while, but, as usual, his plans had become too complex to succeed, through sheer excess of ardor. When he came to the princess the very day before the wedding to confess, for he always confessed to the persons against whom he intrigued, especially when the plan failed, he informed our hero that he himself was a born Tellurand, but for some unknown reason had become simple Labadif. He then proceeded to explain his whole game to the prince, interesting the latter exceedingly. According to Labadif's account, he had first tried what he could do with General Appenkin. The latter informed him that he wished well to the unfortunate young man, and would gladly do what he could to save him, but that he did not think it would be seemly for him to interfere in this matter. Lizabatha Prokofievna would neither hear nor see him. Prince Ass and Evgeny Pavlovich only shrugged their shoulders, and implied that it was no business of theirs. However, Labadev had not lost heart, and went off to a clever lawyer, a worthy and respectable man, whom he knew well. This old gentleman informed him that the thing was perfectly feasible if he could get hold of competent witnesses as to Mushkin's mental incapacity. Then, with the assistance of a few influential persons, he would soon see the matter arranged. Labadev immediately procured the services of an old doctor and carried the latter away to Pavlovsk to see the prince by way of viewing the ground, as it were, and to give him, Labadev, counsel as to whether the thing was to be done or not. The visit was not to be official, but merely friendly. Mushkin remembered the doctor's visit quite well. He remembered that Labadev had said that he looked ill and had better see a doctor, and although the prince scouted the idea, Labadev had turned up almost immediately with his old friend, explaining that they had just met at the bad side of Hippolyte, who was very ill, and that the doctor had something to tell the prince about the sick man. The prince had, of course, at once received him and had plunged into a conversation about Hippolyte. He had given the doctor an account of Hippolyte's attempted suicide and had proceeded thereafter to talk of his own malady, of Switzerland, of Schneider, and so on. And so deeply was the old man interested by the prince's conversation and his description of Schneider's system that he sat on for two hours. Mushkin gave him excellent cigars to smoke, and Labadev, for his part, regaled him with liqueurs, brought in by Vera, to whom the doctor a married man and the father of a family addressed such compliments that she was filled with indignation. They parted friends, and, after leaving the prince, the doctor said to Labadev, if all such people were put under restraint, there would be no one left for keepers. Labadev then, in tragic tones, told of the approaching marriage, whereupon the other nodded his head and replied that, after all, marriages like that were not so rare, that he had heard that the lady was very fascinating and of extraordinary beauty, which was enough to explain the infatuation of a wealthy man, that, further, Thanks to the liberality of Totsky and of Rogojin, she possessed so he had hard not only money, but pearls, diamonds, shawls, and furniture, and consequently she could not be considered a bad match. In brief, it seemed to the doctor that the prince's choice, far from being a sign of foolishness, denoted, on the contrary, a shrewd, calculating, and practical mind. Labadev had been much struck by this point of view and he terminated his confession by assuring the prince that he was ready, if need be, to shed his very life's blood for him. Hippolyte, too, was a source of some distraction to the prince at this time. He would send for him at any and every hour of the day. They lived, Hippolyte and his mother and the children, in a small house not far off, and the little ones were happy, if only because they were able to escape from the invalid into the garden. The prince had enough to do in keeping the peace between the irritable Hippolyte and his mother, and eventually the former became so malicious and sarcastic on the subject of the approaching wedding, that Mushkin took offense at last, and refused to continue his visits. A couple of days later, however, 
Hippolyte's mother came with tears in her eyes and begged the prince to come back, or he would eat her up bodily. She added that Hippolyte had a great secret to disclose. Of course the prince went. There was no secret, however, unless we reckon certain pentings and agitated glances around, probably all put on, as the invalid begged his visitor to beware of Rogojin. He is the sort of man, he continued, who won't give up his object. You know, he is not like you and me, Prince. he belongs to quite a different order of beings. If he sets his heart on a thing he won't be afraid of anything and so on. Hippolyte was very ill and looked as though he could not long survive. He was tearful at first, but grew more and more sarcastic and malicious as the interview proceeded. The prince questioned him in detail as to his hints about Rogojin. He was anxious to seize upon some facts which might confirm Hippolyte's vague warnings, but there were none, only Hippolyte's own private impressions and feelings. However, the invalid to his immense satisfaction did by seriously alarming the prince. At first Mushkin had not cared to make any reply to his sundry questions, and only smiled in response to Hippolyte's advice to run for his life abroad, if necessary. There are Russian priests everywhere, and one can get married all over the world. But it was Hippolyte's last idea which upset him. What I am really alarmed about, though, he said, is Aglaya Ivanovna. Rogojin knows how you love her. Love for love. You took Nastasia Filipovna from him. He will murder Aglaya Ivanovna, for though she is not yours, of course, now, still such an act would pain you, wouldn't it? He had attained his end. The prince laughed the house beside himself with terror. These warnings about Rogojin were expressed on the day before the wedding. That evening the prince saw Nastasia Filipovna for the last time before they were to meet at the altar, but Nastasia was not in a position to give him any comfort or consolation. On the contrary, she only added to his mental perturbation as the evening went on. Up to this time she had invariably done her best to cheer him. She was afraid of his looking melancholy. She would try singing to him and telling him every sort of funny story or reminiscence that she could recall. The prince nearly always pretended to be amused, whether he was so actually or no, but often enough he left sincerely, delighted by the brilliancy of her wit when she was carried away by her narrative, as she very often was. Anastasia would be wild with joy to see the impression she had made and to hear his laugh of real amusement, and she would remain the whole evening in a state of pride and happiness. But this evening her melancholy and thoughtfulness grew with every hour. The prince had told Evgeny Pavlovich with perfect sincerity that he loved Nastasia Filipovna with all his soul. In his love for her there was the sort of tenderness one feels for a sick, unhappy child which cannot be left alone. He never spoke of his feelings for Nastasia to anyone, not even to herself. When they were together they never discussed their feelings, and there was nothing in their cheerful, animated conversation which an outsider could not have heard. Daria Alexeyevna, with whom Nastasia was staying, told afterwards how she had been filled with joy and delight only to look at them all this time. Thanks to the manner in which he regarded Nastasia's mental and moral condition, the prince was to some extent freed from other perplexities. She was now quite different from the woman he had known three months before. He was not astonished, for instance, to see her now so impatient to marry him she who formerly had wept with rage and hurled curses and reproaches at him if he mentioned marriage. It shows that she no longer fears, as she did then, that she would make me unhappy by marrying me, he thought, and he felt sure that so sudden a change could not be a natural one. This rapid growth of self-confidence could not be due only to her hatred for Aglaia. To suppose that would be to suspect the depth of her feelings. Nor could it arise from dread of the fate that awaited her if she married Rogojin. These causes, indeed, as well as others, might have played a part in it. But the true reason, Mushkin decided, was the one he had long suspected that the poor sick soul had come to the end of its forces. Yet this was an explanation that did not procure him any peace of mind. At times he seemed to be making violent efforts to think of nothing and one would have said that he looked on his marriage as an unimportant formality, and on his future happiness as a thing not worth considering. As to conversations such as the one held with Evgeny Pavlovich, he avoided them as far as possible, 
feeling that there were certain objections to which he could make no answer. The prince had observed that Nastasia knew well enough what Aglaia was to him. He never spoke of it, but he had seen her face when she had caught him starting off for the Apanchin's house on several occasions. When the Apanchins left Pavlovsk, she had beamed with radiance and happiness. Unsuspicious and unobservant as he was, he had feared at that time that Nastasia might have some scheme in her mind for a scene or scandal which would drive Aglaia out of Pavlovsk. She had encouraged the rumors and excitement among the inhabitants of the place as to her marriage with the prince in order to annoy her rival, and, finding it difficult to meet the Apanchins anywhere, she had, on one occasion, taken him for a drive past their house. He did not observe what was happening until they were almost passing the windows, when it was too late to do anything. He said nothing, but for two days afterwards he was ill. Anastasia did not try that particular experiment again. A few days before that fixed for the wedding, she grew grave and thoughtful. She always ended by getting the better of her melancholy and becoming merry and cheerful again, but not quite so unaffectedly happy as she had been some days earlier. The prince redoubled his attentive study of her symptoms. It was a most curious circumstance, in his opinion, that she never spoke of Rogojin. But once, about five days before the wedding, when the prince was at home, a messenger arrived begging him to come at once, as Nastasia Filipovna was very ill. He had found her in a condition approaching to absolute madness. She screamed and trembled and cried out that Rogojin was hiding out there in the garden thought she had seen him herself and that he would murder her in the night that he would cut her throat. She was terribly agitated all day. But it so happened that the prince called at Hippolyte's house later on and heard from his mother that she had been in town all day and had there received a visit from Rogojin who had made inquiries about Pavlovsk. On inquiry, it turned out that Rogojin visited the old lady in town at almost the same moment when Nastasia declared that she had seen him in the garden, so that the whole thing turned out to be an illusion on her part. Nastasia immediately went across to Hippolyte's to inquire more accurately, and returned immensely relieved and comforted. On the day before the wedding, the prince left Nastasia in a state of great animation. Her wedding dress and all sorts of finery had just arrived from town. Mushkin had not imagined that she would be so excited over it, but he praised everything, and his praise rendered her doubly happy. But Nastasia could not hide the cause of her intense interest in her wedding splendor. She had heard of the indignation in the town, and knew that some of the populace was getting up a sort of corrivory with music, that verses had been composed for the occasion, and that the rest of Pavlovsk society more or less encouraged these preparations. So, since attempts were being made to humiliate her, she wanted to hold her head even higher than usual, and to overwhelm them all with the beauty and taste of her toilet. Let them shout and whistle, if they dare. Her eyes flashed at the thought, but, underneath this, she had another motive, of which she did not speak. She thought that possibly a glare, or at any rate someone sent by her, would be present incognito at the ceremony, or in the crowd and she wished to be prepared for this eventuality. The prince laughed her at eleven, full of these thoughts, and went home. But it was not twelve o'clock when a messenger came to say that Nastasia was very bad, and he must come at once. On hurrying back he found his bride locked up in her own room and could hear her hysterical cries and sobs. It was some time before she could be made to hear that the prince had come, and then she opened the door only just sufficiently to let him in, and immediately locked it behind him. She then fell on her knees at his feet, so at least Dana Alexeyevna reported. What am I doing? What am I doing to you? She sobbed convulsively, embracing his knees. The prince was a whole hour soothing and comforting her, and laughed her, at length, pacified and composed. He sent another messenger during the night to inquire after her, and to more next morning. The last brought back a message that Nastasia was surrounded by a whole army of dressmakers and maids, and was as happy and as busy as such a beauty should be on her wedding morning, and that there was not a vestige of yesterday's agitation remaining. The message concluded with the news that at the moment of the bearer's departure there was a great confabulation in progress as to which diamonds were to be worn, and how. This message entirely calmed the prince's mind. The following report of the proceedings on the wedding day may be depended upon as coming from eyewitnesses.
The wedding was fixed for eight o'clock in the evening. Nastasia Filipovna was ready at seven. From six o'clock groups of people began to gather at Nastasia's house, at the prince's, and at the church door, but more especially at the former place. The church began to fill at seven. Kolya and Vera Labadev were very anxious on the prince's account, but they were so busy over the arrangements for receiving the guests after the wedding that they had not much time for the indulgence of personal feelings. There were to be very few guests besides the best man and so on. Only Dana Alexeyevna, the Titsins, Gonia, and the doctor. When the prince asked Labadev why he had invited the doctor, who was almost a stranger, Labadev replied, why, he wears an order, and it looks so well. This idea amused the prince. Keller and Bodovsky looked wonderfully correct in their dress coats and white kid gloves, although Keller caused the bridegroom some alarm by his undisguisedly hostile glances at the gathering crowd of sightseers outside. At about half past seven the prince started for the church in his carriage. We may remark here that he seemed anxious not to omit a single one of the recognized customs and traditions observed at weddings. He wished all to be done as openly as possible, and in due order. Arrived at the church, Mushkin, under Kala's guidance, passed through the crowd of spectators, amid continuous whispering and excited exclamations. The prince stayed near the altar, while Kala made off once more to fatch the bride. On reaching the gate of Doria Alexiana's house, Keller found a far denser crowd than he had encountered at the prince's. The remarks and exclamations of the spectators here were of so irritating in nature that Keller was very near making them a speech on the impropriety of their conduct, but was luckily caught by Podovsky in the act of turning to address them, and hurried indoors. Nastasia Filipovna was ready. She rose from her seat, looked into the glass, and remarked, as Keller told the tale afterwards, that she was as pale as a corpse. She then bent her head reverently before the icon in the corner and left the room. A torrent of voices greeted her appearance at the front door. The crowd whistled, clapped its hands, and laughed and shouted, but in a moment all too isolated voices were distinguishable. What a beauty, cried one. Well, she isn't the first in the world, nor the last, said another. Marriage covers everything observed a third. I defy you to find another beauty like that, said a fourth. Shas a real princess. It sell my soul for such a princess as that. Anastasia came out of the house looking as white as any handkerchief, but her large dark eyes shone upon the vulgar crowd like blazing coals. The spectators' cries were redoubled, and became more exultant and triumphant every moment. The door of the carriage was open, and Kala had given his hand to the bride to help her in, when suddenly with a loud cry she rushed from him, straight into the surging crowd. Her friends about her were stupefied with amazement, the crowd parted as she rushed through it, and suddenly, at a distance of five or six yards from the carriage, appeared Rogojin. It was his look that had caught her eyes. Anastasia rushed to him like a madwoman, and seized both his hands. Save me, she cried, take me away. Any way you like, quick. Rogojin seized her in his arms and almost carried her to the carriage. Then, in a flash, he tore a hundred-ruble note out of his pocket and held it to the coachman. To the station, quick. If you catch the train you shall have another, quick. He leapt into the carriage after Nastasia and banged the door. The coachman did not hesitate a moment. He whipped up the horses and they were off. One more second and I should have stopped him, said Kala afterwards. In fact, he and Bardovsky jumped into another carriage and set off in pursuit, but it struck them as they drove along that it was not much use trying to bring Nastasia back by force. Besides, said Bardovsky, the prince would not like it, would he? So they gave up the pursuit. Rogojin and Nastasia Filipovna reached the station just in time for the train. As he jumped out of the carriage and was almost on the point of entering the train, Rogojin accosted a young girl standing on the platform and wearing an old-fashioned, but respectable-looking, black cloak and a silk handkerchief over her head. Take fifty rubles for your cloak, he shouted, holding the money out to the girl. Before the astonished young woman could collect her scattered senses, he pushed the money into her hand, seized the mantle, and threw it and the handkerchief over Nastasia's head and shoulders. 
The latter's wedding array would have attracted too much attention, and it was not until some time later that the girl understood why her old cloak and kerchief had been bought at such a price. The news of what had happened reached the church with extraordinary rapidity. When Keller arrived, a host of people whom he did not know thronged around to ask him questions. There was much excited talking and shaking of heads, even some laughter, but no one left the church, all being anxious to observe how the now celebrated bridegroom would take the news. He grew very pale upon hearing it, but took it quite quietly. I was afraid, he muttered, scarcely audibly, but I hardly thought it would come to this. Then, after a short silence, he added, however, in her state, it is quite consistent with the natural order of things. Even Keller admitted afterwards that this was extraordinarily philosophical on the prince's part. He left the church quite calm, to all appearances, as many witnesses were found to declare afterwards. He seemed anxious to reach home and be left alone as quickly as possible, but this was not to be. He was accompanied by nearly all the invited guests, and besides this, the house was almost besieged by excited bands of people, who insisted upon being allowed to enter the veranda. The prince heard Kala and Labadif remonstrating and quarreling with these unknown individuals, and soon went out himself. He approached the disturbers of his peace, requested courteously to be told what was desired, then politely putting Labadif and Kala aside. He addressed an old gentleman who was standing on the veranda steps at the head of the band of would-be guests, and courteously requested him to honor him with a visit. The old fellow was quite taken aback by this, but entered, followed by a few more, who tried to appear at their ease. The rest remained outside, and presently the whole crowd was censuring those who had accepted the invitation. The prince offered seats to his strange visitors, tea was served, and a general conversation sprang up. Everything was done most decorously, to the considerable surprise of the intruders. A few tentative attempts were made to turn the conversation to the events of the day, and a few indiscreet questions were asked. But Mushkin replied to everybody with such simplicity and good humor, and at the same time with so much dignity, and showed such confidence in the good breeding of his guests that the indiscreet talkers were quickly silenced. By degrees the conversation became almost serious. One gentleman suddenly exclaimed, with great vehemence, whatever happens, I shall not sell my property, I shall wait. Enterprise is better than money, and there, sir, you have my whole system of economy, if you wish. He addressed the prince, who warmly commanded his sentiments, though Labadif whispered in his ear that this gentleman, who talked so much of his property, had never had either house or home. Nearly an hour passed thus, and when tea was over the visitors seemed to think that it was time to go. As they went out, the doctor and the old gentleman bade Mushkin a warm farewell, and all the rest took their leave with hearty protestations of goodwill, dropping remarks to the effect that it was no use worrying, and that perhaps all would turn out for the best, and so on. Some of the younger intruders would have asked for champagne, but they were checked by the older ones. When all had departed, Kala leaned over to Labadif and said, With you and me there would have been a scene. We should have shouted and fought and called in the police. But he has simply made some new friends and such friends, too. I know them. Labadif, who was slightly intoxicated, answered with a sigh, Things are hidden from the wise and prudent and revealed unto babes. I have applied those words to him before, but now I add that God has preserved the babe himself from the abyss he and all his saints. At last, about half past ten, the prince was left alone. His head ached. Kolya was the last to go, after having helped him to change his wedding clothes. They parted on affectionate terms, and, without speaking of what had happened, Kolya promised to come very early the next day. He said later that the prince had given no hint of his intentions when they said goodbye, but had hidden them even from him. Soon there was hardly anyone laughed in the house. Badovsky had gone to see Hippolyte, Kala and Labadif had wandered off together somewhere. Only Vera Labadif remained hurriedly rearranging the furniture in the rooms. As she laughed at the veranda, she glanced at the prince. He was seated at the table, with both elbows upon it, and his head resting on his hands. She approached him, and touched his shoulder gently. The prince started and looked at her in perplexity. He seemed to be collecting his senses for a minute or so 
before he could remember where he was. As recollection dawned upon him, he became violently agitated. All he did, however, was to ask Vera very earnestly to knock at his door and awake him in time for the first train to Petersburg next morning. Vera promised, and the prince entreated her not to tell anyone of his intention. She promised this, too, and at last, when she had half closed the door, he called her back a third time, took her hands in his, kissed them, then kissed her forehead, and in a rather peculiar manner said to her, until tomorrow. Such was Vera's story afterwards. She went away in great anxiety about him, but when she saw him in the morning, he seemed to be quite himself again, greeted her with a smile, and told her that he would very likely be back by the evening. It appears that he did not consider it necessary to inform anyone accepting Vera of his departure for town. An hour later he was in Ste. Petersburg, and by ten o'clock he had rung the bell at Rogojin's. He had gone to the front door, and was kept waiting a long while before anyone came. At last the door of old Mrs. Rogojin's flat was opened, and an aged servant appeared. Parfin Semyonovich is not at home, she announced from the doorway. Whom do you want? Parfin Semyonovich. He is not in. The old woman examined the prince from head to foot with great curiosity. At all events tell me whether he slept at home last night, and whether he came alone. The old woman continued to stare at him, but said nothing. Was not Nastasia Filipovna here with him, yesterday evening? And, pray, who are you yourself? Prince Lev Nikolaevich Mushkin, he knows me well. He is not at home. The woman lowered her eyes. And Nastasia Filipovna, I know nothing about it. Stop a minute. When will he come back? I don't know that either. The door was shut with these words, and the old woman disappeared. The prince decided to come back within an hour. Passing out of the house, he met the porter. Is Parfin Semyonovich at home? He asked. Yes. Why did they tell me he was not at home, then? Where did they tell you so? At his door. No, at his mother's flat. I rang at Parfin Semyonovich's door and nobody came. Well, he may have gone out. I can't tell. Sometimes he takes the keys with him and leaves the rooms empty for two or three days. Do you know for certain that he was at home last night? Yes, he was. Was Nastasia Filipovna with him? I don't know. She doesn't come often. I think I should have known if she had come. The prince went out deep in thought and walked up and down the pavement for some time. The windows of all the rooms occupied by Rogojin were closed. Those of his mother's apartments were open. It was a hot, bright day. The prince crossed the road in order to have a good look at the windows again. Not only were Rogojin's closed, but the white blinds were all down as well. He stood there for a minute and then, suddenly and strangely enough, it seemed to him that a little corner of one of the blinds was lifted, and Rogojin's face appeared for an instant and then vanished. He waited another minute and decided to go and ring the bell once more. However, he thought better of it again and put it off for an hour. The chief object in his mind at this moment was to get as quickly as he could to Nastasia Filipovna's lodging. He remembered that, not long since, when she had left Pavlovsk at his request, he had begged her to put up in town at the house of a respectable widow, who had well-furnished rooms to let, near the Ismailovsky barracks. Probably Nastasia had kept the rooms when she came down to Pavlovsk this last time, and most likely she would have spent the night in them, Rogojin having taken her straight there from the station. The prince took a droshky. It struck him as he drove on that he ought to have begun by coming here, since it was most improbable that Rogojin should have taken Nastasia to his own house last night. He remembered that the porter said she very rarely came at all, so that it was still less likely that she would have gone there so late at night. Vainly trying to comfort himself with these reflections, the prince reached the Ismailovsky barracks more dead than alive. To his consternation the good people at the lodgings had not only heard nothing of Nastasia, but all came out to look at him as if he were a marvel of some sort. The whole family, of all ages, surrounded him, and he was begged to enter. He guessed at once that they knew perfectly well who he was and that yesterday ought to have been his wedding day, and further that they were dying to ask about the wedding, and especially about why he should be here now, inquiring for the woman who in all reasonable human probability might have been expected to be with him in Pavlovsk. 
He satisfied their curiosity in as few words as possible with regard to the wedding, but their exclamations and sighs were so numerous and sincere that he was obliged to tell the whole story in a short form, of course. The advice of all these agitated ladies was that the prince should go at once and knock at Rogojin's until he was let in, and when let in insist upon a substantial explanation of everything. If Rogojin was really not at home, the prince was advised to go to a certain house, the address of which was given, where lived a German lady, a friend of Nastasia Filipovna's. It was possible that she might have spent the night there in her anxiety to conceal herself. The prince rose from his seat in a condition of mental collapse. The good ladies reported afterwards that his pallor was terrible to see, and his legs seemed to give way underneath him. With difficulty he was made to understand that his new friends would be glad of his address, in order to act with him if possible. After a moment's thought he gave the address of the small hotel, on the stairs of which he had had a fit some five weeks since. He then set off once more for Rogojin's. This time they neither opened the door at Rogojin's flat nor at the one opposite. The prince found the porter with difficulty, but when found, the man would hardly look at him or answer his questions, pretending to be busy. Eventually, however, he was persuaded to reply so far as to state that Rogojin had left the house early in the morning and gone to Pevlovsk, and that he would not return today at all. I shall wait, he may come back this evening. He may not be home for a week. Then, at all events, he did sleep here, did he? Well, who did sleep here? Yes. All this was suspicious and unsatisfactory. Very likely the porter had received new instructions during the interval of the prince's absence. His manner was so different now. He had been obliging though he was as obstinate and silent as a mule. However, the prince decided to call again in a couple of hours, and after that to watch the house, in case of need. His hope was that he might yet find Nastasia at the address which he had just received. To that address he now set off at full speed. But alas, at the German lady's house they did not even appear to understand what he wanted. After a while, by means of certain hints, he was able to gather that Nastasia must have had a quarrel with her friend two or three weeks ago, since which date the latter had neither heard nor seen anything of her. He was given to understand that the subject of Nastasia's present whereabouts was not of the slightest interest to her, and that Nastasia might marry all the princes in the world for all she cared. So Mushkin took his leave hurriedly. It struck him now that she might have gone away to Moscow just as she had done the last time, and that Rogojin had perhaps gone after her, or even with her, if only he could find some trace. However, he must take his room at the hotel and he started off in that direction. Having engaged his room, he was asked by the waiter whether he would take dinner, replying mechanically in the affirmative. He sat down and waited, but it was not long before it struck him that dining would delay him. Enraged at this idea, he started up, crossed the dark passage, which filled him with horrible impressions and gloomy forebodings, and set out once more for Rogojin's. Rogojin had not returned, and no one came to the door. He rang at the old lady's door opposite and was informed that Parfen Semyonovich would not return for three days. The curiosity with which the old servant stared at him again impressed the prince disagreeably. He could not find the porter this time at all. As before, he crossed the street and watched the windows from the other side, walking up and down in anguish of soul for half an hour or so in the stifling heat. Nothing stirred, the blinds were motionless, indeed, the prince began to think that the apparition of Rogojin's face could have been nothing but fancy. Soothed by this thought, he drove off once more to his friends at the Ismailovsky barracks. He was expected there. The mother had already been to three or four places to look for Nastasia, but had not found a trace of any kind. The prince said nothing, but entered the room, sat down silently, and stared at them one after the other, with the air of a man who cannot understand what is being said to him. It was strange only moment he seemed to be so observant, the next so absent, his behavior struck all the family as most remarkable. At length he rose from his seat and begged to be shown Nastasia's rooms. The ladies reported afterwards how he had examined everything in the apartments. He observed an open book on the table, Madame Bovary, and requested the leave of the lady of the house to take it with him. 
He had turned down the leaf at the open page and pocketed it before they could explain that it was a library book. He had then seated himself by the open window and seeing a card table, he asked who played cards. He was informed that Nastasia used to play with Rogojin every evening, either at preference or little fool, or whist, that this had been their practice since her last return from Pavlovsk that she had taken to this amusement because she did not like to see Rogojin sitting silent and dull for whole evenings at a time, that the day after Nastasia had made a remark to this effect, Rogojin had whipped a pack of cards out of his pocket. Nastasia had laughed, but soon they began playing. The prince asked where were the cards, but was told that Rogojin used to bring a new pack every day and always carried it away in his pocket. The good ladies recommended the prince to try knocking at Rogojin's once more or not at once, but in the evening. Meanwhile, the mother would go to Pavlovsk to inquire at Dana Alexeyevna's whether anything had been heard of Nastasia there. The prince was to come back at ten o'clock and meet her, to hear her news and arrange plans for the morrow. In spite of the kindly meant consolations of his new friends, the prince walked to his hotel in inexpressible anguish of spirit, through the hot dusty streets aimlessly staring at the faces of those who passed him. Arrived at his destination, he determined to rest a while in his room before he started for Rogojin's once more. He sat down, rested his elbows on the table and his head on his hands, and fell to thinking. Heaven knows how long and upon what subjects he thought. He thought of many things of Vera Labadev, and of her father, of Hippolyte, of Rogojin himself, first at the funeral. Then, as he had met him in the park, then, suddenly, as they had met in this very passage, outside, when Rogojin had watched in the darkness and awaited him with uplifted knife, the prince remembered his enemy's eyes as they had glared at him in the darkness. He shuddered as a sudden idea struck him. This idea was that if Rogojin were in Petersburg, though he might hide for a time, yet he was quite sure to come to him prince before long, with either good or evil intentions but probably with the same intention as on that other occasion. At all events, if Rogojin were to come at all, he would be sure to seek the Prince Harry he had no other town address perhaps in this same corridor. He might well seek him here if he needed him. And perhaps he did need him. This idea seemed quite natural to the Prince, though he could not have explained why he should so suddenly have become necessary to Rogojin. Rogojin would not come if all were well with him. That was part of the thought. He would come if all were not well, and certainly, undoubtedly, all would not be well with him. The prince could not bear this new idea. He took his hat and rushed out towards the street. It was almost dark in the passage. What if he were to come out of that corner as I go by end and stop me? Thought the prince as he approached the familiar spot. But no one came out. He passed under the gateway and into the street. The crowds of people walking abutas is always the case at sunset in Petersburg. During the summer surpassed him, but he walked on in the direction of Rogojin's house, about fifty yards from the hotel, at the first crossroad. As he passed through the crowd of foot passengers sauntering along, someone touched his shoulder and said in a whisper into his ear, Lev Nikolaevich, my friend, come along with me. It was Rogojin. The prince immediately began to tell him, eagerly and joyfully, how he had but the moment before expected to see him in the dark passage of the hotel. I was there, said Rogojin, unexpectedly. Come along. The prince was surprised at this answer, but his astonishment increased a couple of minutes afterwards when he began to consider it. Having thought it over, he glanced at Rogojin in alarm. The latter was striding along a yard or so ahead, looking straight in front of him and mechanically making way for anyone he met. Why did you not ask for me at my room if you were in the hotel? Asked the prince suddenly. Rogojin stopped and looked at him, then reflected, and replied as though he had not heard the question. Look here, Lev Nikolaevich, you go straight on to the house. I shall walk on the other side. See that we keep together. So saying, Rogojin crossed the road, arrived on the opposite pavement. He looked back to see whether the prince were moving, waved his hand in the direction of the Gorohovaya, and strode on, looking across every moment to see whether Mushkin understood his instructions. The prince supposed that Rogojin desired to look out for someone whom he was afraid to miss, but if so, why had he not told him whom to look out for? So the two proceeded for half a mile or so, 
Suddenly the prince began to tremble from some unknown cause. He could not bear it and signaled to Rogojin across the road. The latter came at once. Is Nastasia Filipovna at your house? Yes. And was it you looked out of the window under the blind this morning? Yes. Then why did but the prince could not finish his question? He did not know what to say. Besides this, his heart was beating so that he found it difficult to speak at all. Rogojin was silent also and looked at him as before, with an expression of deep thoughtfulness. Well, in going, he said, at last, preparing to recross the road. You go along here as before, we will keep to different sides of the road. It's better so, you'll see. When they reached the Gorohovaya and came near the house, the prince's legs were trembling so that he could hardly walk. It was about ten o'clock. The old lady's windows were open, as before. Rogojin's were all shut, and in the darkness the white blinds showed whiter than ever. Rogojin and the prince each approached the house on his respective side of the road. Rogojin, who was on the near side, beckoned the prince across. He went over to the doorway. Even the porter does not know that I have come home now. I told him, and told them at my mother's too, that I was off to Pevovsk said Rogojin, with a cunning and almost satisfied smile. We'll go in quietly and nobody will hear us. He had the key in his hand. Mounting the staircase he turned and signaled to the prince to go more softly. He opened the door very quietly, let the prince in, followed him, locked the door behind him, and put the key in his pocket. Come along, he whispered. He had spoken in a whisper all the way, in spite of his apparent outward composure. He was evidently in a state of great mental agitation. Arrived in a large salon, next to the study, he went to the window and cautiously beckoned the prince up to him. When you rang the bell this morning, I thought it must be you. I went to the door on tiptoe and heard you talking to the servant opposite. I had told her before that if anyone came and ranged especially you, and I gave her your name, she was not to tell about me. Then I thought, what if he goes and stands opposite and looks up? or waits about to watch the house. So I came to this very window, looked out, and there you were staring straight at me. That's how it came about. Where is Nastasia Filipovna? Asked the prince, breathlessly. She's here, replied Rogojin, slowly, after a slight pause. Where? Rogojin raised his eyes and gazed intently at the prince. Come, he said. He continued to speak in a whisper, very deliberately as before, and looked strangely thoughtful and dreamy. Even while he told the story of how he had peeped through the blind, he gave the impression of wishing to say something else. They entered the study. In this room some changes had taken place since the prince last saw it. It was now divided into two equal parts by a heavy green silk curtain stretched across it, separating the alcove beyond, where stood Rogojin's bed, from the rest of the room. The heavy curtain was drawn now, and it was very dark. The bright Petersburg summer nights were already beginning to close in, and but for the full moon, it would have been difficult to distinguish anything in Rogojin's dismal room with the drawn blinds. They could just see one another's faces, however, though not in detail. Rogojin's face was white, as usual. His glittering eyes watched the prince with an intense stare. Had you not better light a candle? said Mushkin. No, I needn't, replied Rogojin, and taking the other by the hand he drew him down to a chair. He himself took a chair opposite and drew it up so close that he almost pressed against the prince's knees. At their side was a little round table. Sit down, said Rogojin, let's rest a bit. There was silence for a moment. I knew you would be at that hotel, he continued. Just as man sometimes commence a serious conversation by discussing any outside subject before leading up to the main point. As I entered the passage it struck me that perhaps you were sitting and waiting for me, just as I was waiting for you. Have you been to the old lady at Ismailovsky barracks? Yes, said the prince, squeezing the word out with difficulty owing to the dreadful beating of his heart. I thought you would. They'll talk about it. I thought, so I determined to go and fetch you to spend the night Heru will be together. I thought, for this one night Rogojin, where is Nastasia Filipovna? said the prince, suddenly rising from his seat. He was quaking in all his limbs, and his words came in a scarcely audible whisper. Rogojin rose also. There, he whispered, nodding his head towards the curtain. 
asleep, whispered the prince. Rogojin looked intently at him again, as before. Let's go in, but you mustn't well, it's go in. He lifted the curtain, passed and turned to the prince. Go in, he said, motioning him to pass behind the curtain. Mushkin went in. It's so dark, he said. You can see quite enough, muttered Rogojin. I can just see there's a bed go nearer, suggested Rogojin, softly. The prince took a step forward than an offer and paused. He stood and stared for a minute or two. Neither of the men spoke a word while at the bedside. The prince's heart beat so loud that its knocking seemed to be distinctly audible in the deathly silence. But now his eyes had become so far accustomed to the darkness that he could distinguish the whole of the bed. Someone was asleep upon it in an absolutely motionless sleep. Not the slightest movement was perceptible, not the faintest breathing could be heard. The sleeper was covered with a white sheet, the outline of the limbs was hardly distinguishable. He could only just make out that a human being lay outstretched there. All around, on the bed, on a chair beside it, on the floor, were scattered the different portions of a magnificent white silk dress, bits of lace, ribbons and flowers. On a small table at the bedside glittered a mass of diamonds, torn off and thrown down anyhow. From under a heap of lace at the end of the bed peeped a small white foot, which looked as though it had been chiselled out of marble. It was terribly still. The prince gazed and gazed, and felt that the more he gazed the more death-like became the silence. Suddenly a fly woke somewhere, buzzed across the room, and settled on the pillow. The prince shuddered. Let's go, said Rogojin, touching his shoulder. They left the alcove and sat down in the two chairs they had occupied before, opposite to one another. The prince trembled more and more violently, and never took his questioning eyes off Rogojin's face. I see you are shuddering, Lev Nikolaevich, said the latter, at length, almost as you did once in Moscow, before your fit, don't you remember? I don't know what I shall do with you, the prince bent forward to listen, putting all the strain he could muster upon his understanding in order to take in what Rogojin said, and continuing to gaze at the latter's face. Was it you? He muttered, at last, motioning with his head towards the curtain. Yes, it was I, whispered Rogojin, looking down. Neither spoke for five minutes, because, you know, Rogojin recommenced, as though continuing a former sentence. If you were ill now, or had a fit, or screamed, or anything, they might hear it in the yard, or even in the street, and guess that someone was passing the night in the house. They would all come and knock and want to come in, because they know I am not at home. I didn't light a candle for the same reason. When I am not Herifer to or three days at a time, now and then no one comes in to tidy the house or anything, those are my orders. So that I want them to not know we are spending the night here, wait, interrupted the prince. I asked both the porter and the woman whether Nastasia Filipovna had spent last night in the house, so they knew I know you asked. I told them that she had called in for ten minutes, and then gone straight back to Pavlovsk. No one knows she slept here. Last night we came in just as carefully as you and I did today. I thought as I came along with her that she would not like to creep in so secretly. But I was quite wrong. She whispered and walked on tiptoe. She carried her skirt over her arm so that it shouldn't rustle and she held up her finger at me on the stairs so that I shouldn't make a noise it was you she was afraid of. She was mad with terror in the train and she begged me to bring her to this house. I thought of taking her to her rooms at the Ismailovsky barracks first but she wouldn't hear of it. She said, none it there, hell find me out at once there. Take me to your own house, where you can hide me, and tomorrow we'll set off for Moscow. Then she would go to Oral, she said. When she went to bed, she was still talking about going to Oral. Wait, what do you intend to do now, Parfen? Well, I'm afraid of you. You shudder and tremble so. We'll pass the night here together. There are no other beds besides that one, but I've thought how we'll manage. It'll take the cushions off all the sofas and lay them down on the floor, up against the curtain here for you and me so that we shall be together. For if they come in and look about now, you know, they'll find her and carry her away, and they'll be asking me questions, and I shall say I did it, and then they'll take me away, too, don't you see? So let her lie close to you, closely to you and me. Yes, yes, agreed the prince warmly. So we will not say anything about it, or let them take her away. Not for anything, cried the other. No, no, no. 
So I had decided, my friend, not to give her up to anyone, continued Rogojin. Well, be very quiet. I have only been out of the house one hour all day, all the rest of the time I have been with her. I dare say the air is very bad here. It is so hot. Do you find it bad? I don't now perhaps be morning it will be. I've covered her with oilcloth, best American oilcloth, and put the sheet over that, and for jars of disinfectant, on account of the smell as they did at Moscow you remember. And shares lying so still, you shall see, in the morning, when it's light. What? Can't you get up? Asked Rogojin, seeing the other was trembling so that he could not rise from his seat. My legs won't move, said the prince, it's fear. I know. When my fear is over, it'll get up, wait a bit, it'll make the bed, and you can lie down. I'll lie down, too, and well listen and watch, for I don't know yet what I shall do. I tell you beforehand, so that you may be ready in case I'm uttering these disconnected words, Rogojin began to make up the beds. It was clear that he had devised these beds long before. Last night he slept on the sofa, but there was no room for it on the sofa and he seemed anxious that he and the prince should be close to one another. Therefore, he now dragged cushions of all sizes and shapes from the sofas, and made a sort of bed of them close by the curtain. He then approached the prince, and gently helped him to rise, and led him towards the bed. But the prince could now walk by himself, so that his fear must have passed, for all that. However, he continued to shudder. It's hot weather, you see, continued Rogojin as he lay down on the cushions beside Mushkin, and, naturally, there will be a smell. I daren't open the window. My mother has some beautiful flowers in pots. They have a delicious scent. I thought of fetching them in, but that old servant will find out. Shas very inquisitive. Yes, she is inquisitive, assented the prince. I thought of buying flowers and putting them all round her, but I was afraid it would make us sad to see her with flowers round her. Look here, said the prince. He was bewildered, and his brain wandered. He seemed to be continually groping for the questions he wished to ask, and then losing them. List until Mao did you with a knife. That same one. Yes, that same one. Wait a minute. I want to ask you something else. Parfum. All sorts of things. But tell me first, did you intend to kill her before my wedding at the church door with your knife? I don't know whether I did or not, said Rogojin, dryly, seeming to be a little astonished at the question, and not quite taking it in. Did you never take your knife to Pavlovsk with you? No. As to the knife, he added, this is all I can tell you about it. He was silent for a moment, and then said, I took it out of the locked drawer this morning about three, for it was in the early morning all thishapant. It has been inside the book ever since seen, and this is what is such a marvel to me. The knife only went in a couple of inches at most, just under her left breast, and there wasn't more than half a tablespoonful of blood altogether, not more. Yes, yes, he's the prince jumped up in extraordinary agitation. I know, I know, I've read of that sort of thing, it's internal hemorrhage, you know. Sometimes there isn't a drop of the blow goes straight to the heart, wait, listen, cried Rogojin, suddenly, starting up. Somebody's walking about, do you hear, in the hall? Both set up to listen. I hear, said the prince in a whisper, his eyes fixed on Rogojin. Footsteps. Yes. Shall we shut the door and lock it, or not? Yes, lock it. They locked the door, and both lay down again. There was a long silence. Yes, by the by, whispered the prince, hurriedly and excitedly as before, as though he had just seized hold of an idea and was afraid of losing it again. He wanted those cards. They say you played cards with her. Yes, I played with her, said Rogojin, after a short silence. Where are the cards? Here they are, said Rogojin, after a still longer pause. He pulled out a pack of cards, wrapped in a bit of paper, from his pocket, and handed them to the prince. The latter took them with a sort of perplexity. A new, sad, helpless feeling weighed on his heart. He had suddenly realized that not only at this moment, but for a long while, he had not been saying what he wanted to say, had not been acting as he wanted to act, and that these cards which he held in his hand, and which he had been so delighted to have at first, were now of no use say no use. He rose and wrung his hands. Rogojin lay motionless and seemed neither to hear nor see his movements, but his eyes blazed in the darkness, 
and were fixed in a wild stare. The prince sat down on a chair and watched him in alarm. Half an hour went by. Suddenly Rogojin burst into a loud abrupt laugh, as though he had quite forgotten that they must speak in whispers. That officer, uh, that young officer, didn't you remember that fellow at the bend? Eh? Ha, ha, ha. Didn't she whip him smartly? Eh? The prince jumped up from his seat in renewed terror. When Rogojin quieted down, which he did at once, the prince bent over him, sat down beside him, and with painfully beating heart and still more painful breath, watched his face intently. Rogojin never turned his head and seemed to have forgotten all about him. The prince watched and waited. Time went on it began to grow light. Rogojin began to wander muttering disconnectedly, then he took to shouting and laughing. The prince stretched out a trembling hand and gently stroked his hair and his cheeks he could do nothing more. His legs trembled again and he seemed to have lost the use of them. A new sensation came over him, filling his heart and soul with infinite anguish. Meanwhile the daylight grew full and strong, and at last the prince lay down, as though overcome by despair, and laid his face against the white, motionless face of Rogojin. His tears flowed onto Rogojin's cheek, though he was perhaps not aware of them himself. At all events when, after many hours, the door was opened and people thronged in, they found the murderer unconscious and in a raging fever. The prince was sitting by him, motionless, and each time that the sick man gave a laugh or a shout, he hastened to pass his own trembling hand over his companion's hair and cheeks, as though trying to soothe and quiet him. But alas, he understood nothing of what was said to him and recognized none of those who surrounded him. If Schneider himself had arrived then and seen his former pupil and patient, remembering the prince's condition during the first year in Switzerland, he would have flung up his hands, despairingly, and cried, as he did then, an idiot. When the widow hurried away to Pavlovsk, she went straight to Daria Alexeyevna's house, and telling all she knew, threw her into a state of great alarm. Both ladies decided to communicate at once with Labadev, who, as the friend and landlord of the prince, was also much agitated. Vera Labadev told all she knew, and by Labadev's advice it was decided that all three should go to Petersburg as quickly as possible, in order to avert what might so easily happen. This is how it came about that at eleven o'clock next morning Rogojin's flat was opened by the police in the presence of Labadev, the two ladies, and Rogojin's own brother, who lived in the wing. The evidence of the porter went further than anything else towards the success of Labadev in gaining the assistance of the police. He declared that he had seen Rogojin return to the house last night, accompanied by a friend, and that both had gone upstairs very secretly and cautiously. After this there was no hesitation about breaking open the door, since it could not be got open in any other way. Rogojin suffered from brain fever for two months. When he recovered from the attack he was at once brought up on trial for murder. He gave full, satisfactory, and direct evidence on every point, and the prince's name was, thanks to this, not brought into the proceedings. Rogojin was very quiet during the progress of the trial. He did not contradict his clever and eloquent counsel, who argued that the brain fever, or inflammation of the brain, was the cause of the crime clearly proving that this malady had existed long before the murder was perpetrated and had been brought on by the sufferings of the accused. But Rogojin added no words of his own in confirmation of this view, and as before, he recounted with marvellous exactness the details of his crime. He was convicted, but with extenuating circumstances, and condemned to hard labour in Siberia for fifteen years. He heard his sentence grimly, silently, and thoughtfully. His colossal fortune, with the exception of the comparatively small portion wasted in the first wanton period of his inheritance, went to his brother to the great satisfaction of the latter. The old lady, Rogojin's mother, is still alive and remembers her favorite son Parfen sometimes, but not clearly. God spared her the knowledge of this dreadful calamity which had overtaken her house. Labadev, Kala, Gonia, Titsin, and many other friends of ours continue to live as before. There is scarcely any change in them, so that there is no need to tell of their subsequent doings. Hippolyte died in great agitation, and rather sooner than he expected, about a fortnight after Nastasia Filipovna's death. 
Collier was much affected by these events and drew nearer to his mother in heart and sympathy. Nina Alexandrovna is anxious because he is thoughtful beyond his years, but he will, we think, make a useful and active man. The prince's further fate was more or less decided by Collier, who selected, out of all the persons he had met during the last six or seven months, Evgeny Pavlovich as friend and confidant. To him he made over all that he knew as to the events above recorded and as to the present condition of the prince. He was not far wrong in his choice. Evgeny Pavlovich took the deepest interest in the fate of the unfortunate idiot, and, thanks to his influence, the prince found himself once more with drive. Schneider, in Switzerland, Evgeny Pavlovich, who went abroad at this time, intending to live a long while on the continent, being, as he often said, quite superfluous in Russia, visits his sick friend at Schneider's every few months. But drive. Schneider frowns ever more and more and shakes his head. He hints that the brain is fatally injured. He does not as yet declare that his patient is incurable, but he allows himself to express the gravest fears. Evgeny takes this much to heart, and he has a heart, as is proved by the fact that he receives and even answers letters from Kolya. But besides this, another trait in his character has become apparent, and as it is a good trait we will make haste to reveal it. After each visit to Schneider's establishment, Evgeny Pavlovich writes another letter, besides that to Kolya, giving the most minute particulars concerning the invalid's condition. In these letters is to be detected, and in each one more than the last, a growing feeling of friendship and sympathy. The individual who corresponds thus with Evgeny Pavlovich, and who engages so much of his attention and respect, is Vera Labadev. We have never been able to discover clearly how such relations sprang up. Of course the root of them was in the events which we have already recorded, and which so filled Vera with grief on the prince's account that she fell seriously ill. But exactly how the acquaintance and friendship came about, we cannot say. We have spoken of these letters chiefly because in them is often to be found some news of the Apenkin family, and of Aglaya in particular. Evgeny Pavlovich wrote of her from Paris that after a short and sudden attachment to a certain Polish count, an exile, she had suddenly married him, quite against the wishes of her parents, though they had eventually given their consent through fear of a terrible scandal. Then, after a six-month silence, Evgeny Pavlovich informed his correspondent, in a long letter, full of detail, that while paying his last visit to drive, Schneider's establishment, he had there come across the whole Appenkin family, excepting the general, who had remained in St. Petersburg, and Prince Ass. The meeting was a strange one. They all received Evgeny Pavlovich with effusive delight. Adelaida and Alexandra were deeply grateful to him for his angelic kindness to the unhappy prince. Lizabatha Prokofievna, when she saw poor Mushkin, in his enfeebled and humiliated condition, had wept bitterly. Apparently all was forgiven him. Prince Ass had made a few just and sensible remarks. It seemed to Evgeny Pavlovich that there was not yet perfect harmony between Adelaida and her fiancé but he thought that in time the impulsive young girl would let herself be guided by his reason and experience. Besides, the recent events that had befallen her family had given Adelaida much to think about, especially the said experiences of her younger sister. Within six months, everything that the family had dreaded from the marriage with the Polish count had come to pass. He turned out to be neither count nor exili at least, in the political sense of the word, but had had to leave his native land owing to some rather dubious affair of the past. It was his noble patriotism, of which he made a great display, that had rendered him so interesting in Aglaia's eyes. She was so fascinated that, even before marrying him, she joined a committee that had been organized abroad to work for the restoration of Poland. And further, she visited the confessional of a celebrated Jesuit priest who made an absolute fanatic of her. The supposed fortune of the Count had dwindled to a mere nothing, although he had given almost irrefutable evidence of its existence to Lizabetha Prokofievna and Prince Ass. Besides this, before they had been married half a year, the Count and his friend the priest managed to bring about a quarrel between Aglaia and her family so that it was now several months since they had seen her. In a word, 
There was a great deal to say, but Mrs. Appenkin and her daughters, and even Prince Ass, were still so much distressed by Glay's latest infatuations and adventures that they did not care to talk of them, though they must have known that Evgeny knew much of the story already. Poor Elizabetha Prokofievna was most anxious to get home, and, according to Evgeny's account, she criticized everything foreign with much hostility. They can't bake bread anywhere, decently, and they all freeze in their houses, during winter, like a lot of mice in a cellar. At all events, I've had a good Russian cry over this poor fellow, she added, pointing to the prince, who had not recognized her in the slightest degree. So enough of this nonsense, it's time we faced the truth. All this continental life, all this Europe of yours, and all the trash about going abroad is simply foolery, and it is mere foolery on our part to come. Remember what I say, my friend, you'll live to agree with me yourself. So spoke the good lady, almost angrily, as she took leave of Evgeny Pavlovich.